Okay, good morning everyone. It's 9.30 and time for me to open this session of the Places for Everyone Joint Plan Examination. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Very good. Um, I'm Stephen Lee, one of the inspectors appointed by the Secretary of State to examine the plan. Uh, Louise Gibbons, who isn't with us this morning, and William Fieldhouse and I are examining the plan together. Um, are, is there anyone here who's not been here before? There is one, at least one. So I will go, a couple. So I will go through my uh, full blurb. But as it's the first day of the week, why not? We'll, uh, for those who've heard it all before, but uh, I will do that. So, housekeeping, uh, a reminder please for everyone to switch off mobile phones, laptops and other devices to silent mode. Uh, water is provided and will be replenished during adjournments. Uh, we've always asked that people don't bring in hot food or drink into the room. Toilets are located in the reception area where you've entered the building. Um, as far as I'm aware, there are no fire alarm tests this morning or today. So if the fire alarm does sound, then please vacate the building in an orderly fashion, either, uh, following the green arrow signs. And there's one to the rear of the room and one to my right. Uh, the program officers, Helen and Yvonne, well, sorry, I think just Yvonne today will be around uh, should anyone need any assistance. Um, and please go to them in the first, uh, first instance. Um, a reminder that the purpose of the examination is to help us decide if the plan submitted in February 2022 is legally compliant and sound, and if not, how it could be modified to ensure that it is sound. This session, like the others, will take the form of a structured discussion on the matters set out in the agenda that was published last week. Um, this more, well, today, we're dealing with matter six, which relates to the sustainable and resilient places policies. Uh, I will generally start each agenda item or significant issue with some questions to GMCA to the, to the GMCA team and when I've heard the responses to those I'll invite contributions from others. Uh, when you wish to speak turn your nameplate on its end and I'll bring you in at an appropriate time. Uh, when I invite you to speak please say you are and if appropriate who you represent. Please focus your comments on our questions or the specific points made by others. Each contribution should normally be no longer than a minute or two to ensure they are focused and to allow everyone a chance to speak if they wish to on a particular issue. Uh, please remember there's no need to repeat or summarise what you wrote in your representations or written statements as we've read those. Um, similarly, there's no need to repeat anything that anyone has said around the table or tell me that you agree with them or anything like that. Um, a good point, as I say, I say every time, a good point is a good point. It's not made better by repetition. Uh, we will normally give the GMCA the chance to sum up their position at the end of each item on the agenda uh, before moving on. Um, as with other sessions, if we identify that main modifications are required or that further work needs, to be work needs to be carried out by the GMCA and or others, we should try to make that clear. Uh, the GMCA should and I think are keeping a note of all such matters. Uh, we may clarify action points from the previous day during opening or on the following morning or maybe as we talked about last week in, in sessions like this we may that may be saved until the end of the two two weeks. Um, and we'll probably say, we'll probably issue an action point note at the end of this week, um, covering the last two weeks. It is also likely there were some matters that we'll need long to think about, and which we may set out our interim thoughts on in a separate note or notes at a later date. The Germans will probably try and have a comfort break at around 11, um, and then break for lunch around one, um, and then this afternoon, uh, a comfort break about half past three and try and finish around five. There's quite a lot to get through today, so we'll do what we can. It may mean a slightly curtailed lunch or a slightly longer session into the evening, but we're not too long, hopefully. Um, before I move on, is there anything from GMC you want to raise with us before I ask for introductions? Well, only to say this, uh, and, and bearing in mind what you've just said about, you know, we might be here for a longer session or shorter breaks or whatever it might be, so it would be very, very helpful indeed if when we get to each policy in turn, and I think we're dealing with seven today, um, and a number of the policies have several questions, understandably have several questions that have been asked by you and your colleagues, that when we get to each policy in turn, I wonder if I could just have a few moments to just explain where we have got to in terms of considering points made by various people who have made representations about the policies, because there are some um, there are some changes that we ourselves think would help the plan. Is this in addition to what was in your statement? Yes, it is. Okay. It is, that's right. And when, um, just to be clear, you've not made... This is news to us as well. It's so, news yeah. to you, that's why I'm, that's why I'm announcing okay. it now, sir. Okay. Um, so, um, um, so um, 
I think best do each policy as we come to each policy, frankly. Otherwise, okay. I'll get confused. And if I get confused, you know, that's the end of that, basically. So, so we'll do it each, each policy, one policy at a time. So that's that's fine with me, I think, in principle. Um, and I think that some of the thoughts that we've had should take a number of the... Um, a number of the issues out, so it will make, mean that we need less time for some of these points. Okay, well, well famous last words, but we'll see. Fair, well, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I know you'll still ask the same question, we'll so it, well, regardless of the fact that we say yes, we're fine. Well, it might well be, because obviously <laughs> we have to start from the premise that what you've submitted is sound and determine whether it's not sound and obviously give people the opportunity oh, to, they might, might all, they might all disagree with your changes. Absolutely, that's right, sir, so um, indeed. And of course you're expecting me to think on my feet too much as well if I'm changing my questions at this stage. No? Um, at all, so don't worry. Okay. Right, thank you for that. Okay, so we'll start then, as we normally do, by going around the table and asking for introductions. Um, if you could say <coughs> who you are and who you're representing, and uh, for those who haven't been here before, um, we're asking if people could uh, introduce themselves quite slowly in order for the stream to catch up with them and to make sure you speak clearly into your microphone as you go around. So, uh, starting with the GMCA, thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning. I'm Chris Katkowski, KC, and I'm here for the nine authorities. Hi, good morning. I'm, I'm Helen Telfer, representing the GMCA, supporting on policies JPS 2, 3, 5 and 7. Good morning. Cathy Bibby, Tameside Council, representing the GMCA. Good morning, sir. It's Graham Holland from Townside Council, representing the GMCA. Jackie Copley, representing CPRE. Marge Powner, representing Friends of Carrington Moss. Matthew Brabant, representing Save Greater Manchester Greenbelt. Mark Burton, representing City State Manchester. Uh, Ross Harding, representing the Wildlife Trusts. Ali Abbas from Manchester Friends of the Earth. Christopher Russell, representing the Friends of Very Folk. Peter Thompson, rep representing myself, lifelong residents of Greater Manchester. James Stevens, Home Builders Federation. Conor Valley from Avis Young, representing the Northern Gateway Development Vehicle. Philip Robson, representing Colliers. One is uh, Ian Gilbert from Barton Wilmore, representing Red Row Homes. Good morning, John Coxon from Emery Planning, representing Wayne Estates, Wayne Homes and Hollins Strategic Land. Good morning, uh, Brian O'Connor from Litchfields, representing Taylor Wimpey. Christopher Young. King's Council representing Peel. Paul Forshaw, Turley representing Peel. I have my colleague uh, Colin Morrison behind me who will talk with me at various points in the day. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I promise I will start to get names right by the, by the time we get there to March, but I'm still probably going to be talking to companies and organisations and groups first. Um, apologies for that. Um, okay, so we'll make a start then. Um, and obviously, I will turn turn over to uh, GMCA based on what we've just heard. But I will just make a few points before we start about what I'm expecting from today. Um, I want to be quite clear that this session is not about whether or not the strategy or allocations in the plan are consistent with policies S1 to S7. You know, we, we've had people have had the opportunity to tell us that through the session we've on distribution and strategy, and they'll have the opportunity to tell us that when we come onto the allocations themselves. Um, the point of this session and all those relating, I think, to thematic policies in general, there might be one or two exceptions, is whether the policies themselves are sound. So on that basis, we're concentrating on the words um, of the policy and what they're seeking to achieve and whether they're justified, effective and consistent with national policy. So we'd ask people to focus on that when they're making their contributions. Um, I was going to start with some blurb about policy S1, um, but it might be as well to to hand over to um, the GMCA first. Tell me if there's anything you wish to, to raise about policy S1 first. Thank you, sir, that's very helpful. Um, well, as you'll know, S1, Sustainable Development, page 16 of the published plan <coughs> um, in our 
pre-hearing sessions um, changes by way of main mods and additional modifications. Um, there was nothing of any substance proposed to this policy or its supporting text. We made a small tweak to make sure that the reference the NPPF didn't become out of date, if you like, once there was a new, if ever there's a new MPPF. So, so basically we come into this part of the session with, with the plan as published. Now you'll know, so in one of your questions, um, question 6.1 um, is very much related to this. You'll know that a good deal of controversy has been caused by the reference in policy S1 in the second paragraph to uh, preference being given to using previously developed brownfield land and vacant buildings to meet development needs. And um, a number of those who have made representations have suggested that, for example, when it comes to determining planning applications, this might inappropriately introduce some form of sequential test that if you're a greenfield site, you might potentially be refused because you're not a brownfield site, for example. I'm summarising the argument very, very briefly indeed. Um, we've thought about this. Um, and as you'll know, so from various sessions last week, we've discussed various policies in another chapter of the plan that have a similar point, but which relate to plan making. Um, and we sort of parked the question, well, what about development management for this session this morning? And our further thoughts on this are that we, uh, the GMCA, CA, the nine authorities, do not intend this policy to set some form of sequential test for planning applications um, in the way in which a number of those who have made representations are concerned that this policy might be read or misread to suggest that. And what we suggest, and as far as we're concerned, in order to make in order to make the plan sound, so necessary to make the plan sound, we would propose changing this second paragraph so that it's, it's explicit to refer simply to preparing local plans. So we would suggest that the text be changed to begin with the words, in preparing plans, preference will be given to, etc., etc., etc. So some wording to make it clear, it's not for development management, it's for preparing local plans. Now as for whether it's appropriate to have such an approach for preparing local plans, we went round this two or three times last week, and as you'll know, it is certainly um, our position, others disagree, but it's our position that under paragraph 119 of the framework, um, it's, it's, um, which refers to making as much use as possible of PTL, previously de developed land, it's an, it's an appropriate strategy, an appropriate strategy for this plan in terms of setting the scene for future local plans to express this preference. Uh, we should also bear in mind a point I didn't make last week, but I make it this morning, that both this plan and future local plans, in our case, grapple with, and in the case of future local plans, we'll have to grapple again with whether or not Greenbelt should be released to meet development needs. And under paragraph 141 of the framework, as you know, one is to examine fully all other reasonable options for meeting development needs. And the first thing that is to be assessed through the examination of strategic policies at paragraph 141A is making as much use of, as possible of suitable brownfield sites, et cetera, et cetera. So as a local plan making criterion, aspiration, guiding hand, however one wants to describe it, as far as we're concerned, it is perfectly appropriate. Um, but we recognize that um, there is scope for confusion as to its role in terms of development management and in order to circumvent that, the position which we've reached is that the criterion, the paragraph, should be changed so that it refers simply and solely to plan making. So, so that's what I wanted to say. Well, thank you. So, from a from a development management perspective, then, as these policies, my understanding, these policies generally they're set out to do. So, you would be relying then on national policy for anything relating to PDL. Uh, Yes, in, in yes is the short answer to that question. That's right, yes. Okay. Throwing me slightly then, because obviously my uh, question... <laughs> apologies, but, but rather than, you know, go yeah. all around the room, people saying, well, this criterion, you know, setting a sequential test for development management, et cetera, et cetera, better to, to say up front that we've thought about this. Okay. Um, so 
some of the question still stands though and I think we did talk about it last week so but whether or not there is any practical difference to your mind between preference and prioritise not in terms of plan making others disagree and you know doubtless the point would be made again that point would be made again and my response would be as last week I think we have two or three people here today who weren't here last week so and perhaps might not have spent their evenings watching the YouTube playbacks um, so I'll perfectly happily explain it again but I've already touched on the point that certainly our position that it, it is an appropriate strategy in terms of setting the scene for future local plans to express this preference and that in our book is consistent with the framework remembering that in order to be consistent with the framework one doesn't have to write the exact same words as in the framework because if that was the position there'd be no point in having local plan setting policies at all you just say look at the framework um, that might or might not be our future planning system but it isn't the planning system we have at the moment um, and so that's where we are with it so, but but fine there would be a discussion of the point but so, that's not so again just just for those who weren't here last week um, we know paragraph 119 framework says uh, making as much use as possible of previous developed land um, you said last week, as far as you're concerned, that the, the, the policy strat six and nine, I think, talk about prioritising. You, you were happy that there was no, pra again, practical difference between those things. Again, in terms of using the phrase preference, your view would be the same, presumably? It is, well, with knobs on, really, because if one says make as much use as possible, well, that sounds like a preference to me. I mean, and it is a preference, isn't it? Um, and indeed, in a plan which is setting the scene for Greenbelt releases made within this plan, and setting the scene for future local plans to grapple with the issue whether or not there is a need to release more green belt, it must be an appropriate strategy to say, remember paragraph 141A of the framework, um, there's a preference when you make your local plans to um, using PDL, brownfield land, and isn't that what paragraph, it is, forgive me, what paragraph 141A expresses um, that's to say, um, you've got to examine fully all other reasonable options for meeting identified needs for development, and the first of those is to make as much use as possible of suitable brownfield sites. So, as far as we're concerned, with an adjustment which we recognise needs to be made to this element of the policy so that it refers to plan making and not to development management, or can't be read as referring to development management, um, with that adjustment made, it's, it's, it's an appropriate strategy. It's certainly an entirely appropriate strategy, and it's entirely consistent with the framework. Given that we are grappling with the green belt in this plan and future local plans, we'll have to grapple again with the green belt. Okay, thanks. Um, a few of my questions uh, were about the criticism um, that was levelled. So you've, you've addressed those points, I suppose. The, I suppose one potential litmus test, and if there any, you know, notwithstanding, I don't know what people are going to think about your suggestion. Um, well, I hope some of them will like it, sir. You, you never know. Um, but, you know, in terms of consistency, taking the point what you've said about it doesn't have to be verbatim in national policy, but if if you were to use the verbatim wording of the, of the framework, would that make any difference at all to the implementation of the, or interpretation of the policy, and in that respect, would it actually be problematic to use that phrasing? Um, well, if the test of soundness was whether it would be problematic to, to parrot the exact words of the framework, then my answer to that would be no, it wouldn't be problematic. But obviously, as, as we know, that's not the test of soundness. Um, and as I've said, and I'm I, sorry, I, given that this is setting the scene for local plans dealing with the green belt again, um, when one says, as one does, when one finds as one does, because it isn't just the generic paragraph on brownfield in green belt cases, it's also paragraph 141, where one is to examine fully all other reasonable options for meeting identified needs for development, and in doing that, you're to make as much use as possible of suitable brownfield sites. That sounds to me very much like a preference um, to be given to using brownfield land. Um, so that's the top and bottom of it. But no, I mean, if, if in due course you and your colleagues consider that it's necessary in order to make the plan sound for the plan not to use words like preference, but rather to say, you know, quote unquote, cut and paste the framework into the policy, well, so be it. I mean, there you are, sir. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, 
One question I was going to ask, but now am I again in the con in, Don't worry, it, sir. it may be that in the context of your change, which may may or may not accept. Mm. Um, this is a moot point. But in terms of the plan as submitted, mm. um, obviously paragraph four, uh, sorry, footnote forty-seven, the framework talks about there being, and I'll I'll get it myself, so I'll, <laughs> I'll quote it. Paragraph um, forty-seven. So paragraph so forty-seven, which is under, uh, sorry, footnote forty-seven, which is on page thirty-five under para one one nine. So you have the um, para one one nine talks about as make as much use as possible of previously developed land or brownfield land, and then. Footnote 47, except where this would conflict with other policies in this framework, including causing harm to designated sites of importance and biodiversity. Now, a comment that was raised is that, uh, the, the, if you like, the, the, the opposite to what a lot of people have been saying, the, the danger is if, of going too far in, in requiring this preference for brownfield land, and you end up um, forcing development on sites which were unacceptable. Uh, does, uh, maybe in your, your change, that, that takes that out of the equation. Well, obviously, as we no longer wish to um, wish to promote, if ever we did, this preference as a development management point. I mean, obviously, it would take the, it would remove that element of the debate. If the point still arises in relation to plan making, as I suppose, could you know, it could do. Someone might say, well, if you express a preference for brownfield land when you're making local plans, does that raise the possibility, I don't think I'd go as far as to say prospect, but the possibility that in making a local plan, some hapless plan making authority would try to force development on sites which have got, for example, important biodiversity designations. And I think I'd just throw my hands up and make a plea for some common sense. I mean, these policies are meant to be read together. <laughs> and um, obviously, if one expresses a preference for X, a preference isn't a mandatory requirement. And in working out whether your preference can be satisfied in any given case, you obviously need to take into account all other considerations which are relevant to the debate. And if one finds a you know, piece of brownfield land which has got some, I don't know, heritage designation, for example, that might or might not make it more important to use it for redevelopment or a very bad idea to use it for redevelopment. I mean, all these things will have to be looked at in the round when it comes to making plans. But in doing so, we do have a general um, preference for utilisation of brownfield land, which seems entirely appropriate given the references in the framework that I've drawn your attention to. I'm sure a wise man once said common sense isn't always common practice, but um, I take the point. Um, well, I mean, I know, but there you are. Right. Um, Okay, I think on that, I I haven't, didn't have any questions about the first and third paragraph unless anybody wishes to raise. The second paragraph, which has drawn the fire, yeah. if you like. Um, yeah. So I will open it up then to any points about, um, well, the first instance, we'll talk about the, the second paragraph and then if there are any other points about the policy as a whole, take those up first. So uh, CPRE. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Um, obviously, we've not had time to get our heads around exactly the implication but I think it's important to point out the preference um, for brownfield sites is a key win for the 23,000 people who responded to the um, consultation the last consultation well it was the 2006 the uh, strategic that the, the um, revised draft plan want you know very much opposed to Greenbelt and wanting a brownfield preference and Andy Burnham, elected mayor, has talked about this brownfield preference and it has given a lot of reassurance. And at the national level, we've got a government who insists it wants to support brownfield regeneration. It's developed a brownfield fund. It's identified a 35% uplift of housing to cities and towns. And in a region like Greater Manchester, when there are, there are so many brownfield sites, it really is important to have a strategic document that makes the most and in terms of common sense because of the stringent housing uh, delivery test it means that we're actually seeing quite a lot of greenfield sites going forward that probably shouldn't in terms of common sense and it's rendering a lot of brownfield sites redundant and if of course a brownfield site has biodiversity value well then stop calling it a brownfield site and redesignate it for wildlife value um that would be common sense so i think 
from CPRE's point of view, there ought to be a state of brownfield preference and it ought to cut across local plan making and also development management decisions. Because otherwise, how do you support the Greater Manchester Combined Authorities Town Centre Regeneration Fund and progress? There's already been a lot of success when you look at Hume, when you look at Sulphur Keys, Odsall, East Manchester, North Manchester. An awful lot of effort has gone and a lot of public investment in revitalising brownfield areas, and it would seem a shame at this juncture when the Greater Manchester Combined Authority keeps stressing it wants a brownfield preference to weaken it at this particular examination stage. Particularly given it's not been consulted on, so it feels a bit late in the day to be making the change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Turley's. Yeah, um, t two things. I'm sure lots of others are going to talk about the consistency with national policy. So you obviously know what it says in paragraph 119. Why would you not use that wording? Uh, there's no good reason why you wouldn't. But others will have more to say on that. C can I just talk briefly about um, the consequences that arise out of this um, focus on brownfield lands because this is a national problem that affects uh, everywhere and it affects Manchester. Y you will have seen in representations that we've made that in Manchester, the city, 25,000 new homes were delivered between 2012 and 2020. 2000 uh, sorry, eight-year period, 2012 to 2020. 25,000 homes. And does anybody know how many affordable homes were delivered in that period? 125. It is extraordinary. That is less than half a percent. Well, it is exactly half a percent. Now, those figures uh, were the subject of um, an investigation into that by, uh, as I understand it, one of the media outlets, um, We'll come on to that at a later stage, I'm sure. But that is the consequence of this policy. The lady from CPRE raised the fact that um, the government has this preference, 35% more in the cities. Well, the reason they've done that is because uh, they all ran away screaming from the mutant algorithm and they had to somehow get to 300,000 a year because that's government policy. So that isn't based on anything other that 35% uplift, than a desire to um, effectively address the reaction of Tory backbench MPs. And the reality is that brownfield sites just do not deliver affordable housing. Now, some people don't care if there's no affordable housing, um, but many people do. And the consequence of this brownfield focus is just that. Greenfield sites deliver affordable housing. And those who oppose development need to recognise that. Now, Homes England has money to distribute in respect of um, sites. So some sites get planning permission that are market housing and then they're bought en masse uh, and deliver affordable housing. That is very expensive. Um, and public money is getting less and less. So the big sums of money that were spent a decade ago have significantly reduced. But it's not sustainable either when there's so many other demands on the public purse. Greenfield sites deliver development. And let's just be, before anybody thinks, well, you know, what, what does that mean for everybody? We're going to run out of green space. The government's, one of the government's previous housing white papers identified that only 8% of the UK and 11% of England is built upon. And that's even before you discount gardens. Generations I'm, that... I'm just going to... Because yeah. I did ask for response to be like a minute or two. And yeah. <laughs> I think if the if the point is your... I think I think I get the point yeah. that you, you feel the... Poly, you know, you, you've made your point, I think. Is there anything else? No, I, I, simply to come back to the... De all I'm saying is let's look at the delivery consequences. We don't do that enough at the EIPs. We don't look at the consequences of the policies and what it then subsequently means. Because it's easy to say, you know, 
brownfield sites should always be the preference. It's easy to say <coughs> that, but people just do not look at the consequences. Does, does, does the policy, as written, say no greenfield development? No, it doesn't. But if it sticks to what the MPPF says, then it's unarguably the right approach. And right. that is simply saying make as much use as possible. So that's, that's the change you're wanting, basically. It is, yeah. but, but let's understand why, yeah. I suppose. Okay, thank you. Sorry for being more than two minutes. Well, yeah. Um, steady State Manchester, I think we're up first. I'm going cross table. Thank you. Just, just um, briefly, um, when it comes to development management, I'm looking at paragraph 38 of the MPPF, um, which does, of course, refer to brownfield registers and encourages local authorities to, to use them in that. So I don't think the, the idea that um, it doesn't take, the, 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 this policy doesn't take a part or uh, take part in development management is, is perhaps you know, a little unfair. Um, I think it, uh, you know, the use of brownfields clearly comes back in deciding on planning applications or should do. Um, and in response to Turley, very briefly, I think you need to look at other authorities other than Manchester to look at the record on delivering affordability through uh, building on brownfield sites. Manchester is a very strange case to, to cite. Okay, thank you. Um, HBF? Uh, uh, thank you very much, sir. Um, I think the change that's proposed by the GMCA a is uh, a welcome one. Um, I'm mindful of paragraph 16 of the MPPF, uh, um, point D, which says that plans should contain policies that are clearly written and unambiguous, so it is evident how a decision maker should react to development proposals. I think the insertion of those words proposed by the, D the GMCA uh, that um, in preparing local plans preference will be given to using PDL and vacant buildings, I think is right to make it clear that this relates to plan making uh, rather than decision taking. Um, and I wish to reinforce the points that Turley made about affordable housing delivery. Greenfield sites will be very important to the GMCA in driving up the number of affordable homes delivered. Um, house builders, the private sector, is now responsible for 50% of all affordable homes delivered in this country including all homes for social rent. Um, RSLs no longer provide homes for social rent. Uh, house builders, private sector house builders, will do that. Uh, and if you want to have a policy in the places for every one plan, uh, specifying uh, um, affordable housing contributions from former Greenbelt sites, uh, then so be it. They could do that. And I think there are, I think some of the policies do specify the particular levels of affordable housing. Um, I would just draw attention to the dire state of affordable housing supply uh, in Greater Manchester. Very briefly, I refer in my, one of my statements to uh, the Manchester Evening News of the 13th of February 2022, uh, which has documented increasing numbers of homeless families, uh, with the situation, as they say, increasingly out of control, raising deeper questions about the city's future. Uh, evidence suggests that Manchester now has the highest rate of people in emergency accommodation outside of London, apart from Luton. Uh, Luton, interesting, because uh, London boroughs export a lot of their emergency housing need uh, to Luton uh, because it's a cheaper area uh, and uh, uh, a more working class area where opposition uh, to house building is less intense than in other parts of uh, um, uh, 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 Hertfordshire. So, um, yeah, we support the amendment being proposed by the GMCA. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll come down this side of the table. Um, I think we've got the point now about, it's been made twice about affordable housing. We don't need to, unless there's something different, we don't need that again. Uh, so, Colliers. Thank you. Morning, sir. Um, three brief points, but perhaps to start by welcoming the change proposed by GMCA. Uh, that certainly has the support uh, of my clients. Uh, unfortunately, there are still an issue with one word that remains within the policy and an absence of words that perhaps could be added in. Uh, conscious of paragraph 16D, um, as the HBF referred to in the framework, which requires policies to be clear and unambiguous, 
so that it's evidence how a decision maker should react to development proposals. And we need to be conscious that these policies will be applied by nine different authorities and nine different councils reading it in their own separate ways, perhaps. Uh, and the term preference can be interpreted in a multitude of different ways, uh, both when it comes to setting, well, when it comes to setting local plans now and, of course, now not being applied for development management. Uh, and there is then perhaps a reason why the framework at 119 uh, and 120C direct strategic policy makers to give substantial weight to the using to the value of using brownfield land um, that is clear it also goes into a balance where it may address the point sir you raised in your question about how uh, the effect of developing on brownfield land might be counterbalanced if it's not uh, appropriate the second word that's in the framework and not in the policy, and I'm conscious of Mr. Katkowski's point about not just parroting what's in the policy, but the words are important, um, and that is suitable. Uh, the framework at 120C gives substantial weight to the value of using suitable brownfield land. The preference is clear in national policy. It was clear in the allocations in the development of this plan and it's been supported by by my clients throughout but when it comes to local plan development the juice has to be worth the squeeze uh, and it shouldn't be pursuing unsuitable brownfield land and the time it takes to filter out unsuitable brownfield land at the expense of bringing forward more suitable greenfield or green belt land uh, and the final point sir uh, and i won't labor it has been raised by the hbf and turleys um, that there does need to be some recognition that uh, green belt and greenfield sites will be needed uh, and that they will be needed in the development of, of the de district plans as well. Uh, there isn't enough land, brownfield land proposed to meet the requirement uh, in the plan uh, and it's accepted by GMCA uh, and this policy should, should reflect that, uh, sir. Thank you very much. Um, pardon, Momo. Thank you, sir. Um, I mean, I, I was here on Friday, sir, and and in in relation to the southern policies, tackled the um, appropriateness of whether a priority or a preference should be given to brownfield land uh, in the context of it framing um, either allocations or um, future local plans. I, I won't repeat that, sir. But the the conversation with the GMCA got to the point that. The GMCA considered that the Secretary of State wouldn't possibly have a problem with uh, a, the, the reframing of, of his policy to, to state a preference. Um, so I, I, the, one of your colleagues in examining the Liverpool local plan uh, at paragraph 49 of their report uh, sets, tackles a similar point uh, and said, it says, as submitted, the policy contains a principle to give first priority to development to be located in previously developed land. This sequential priority would not be consistent with the national policy at paragraph 17 of the MPPF. Clearly, that, that policy has moved on to 119 of the new MPPF, sir, um, which goes as far as encouraging effective use uh, of brownfield land. Um, so in, in that sense, sir, we do support the council's change to remove this or be clear that this isn't to be a development management policy because it's not appropriate. Um, in moving to whether or not it's an appropriate strategy to, to frame local plans, the second part of paragraph 49 of the Liverpool Local Plan Inspectors Report sets out, that I think tackles that point, sir, and it goes on to say, nor would it, be appropriately, nor would it appropriately recognise that some greenfield sites in the city may perform equally as well, or possibly even better, than some brownfield sites in securing sustainable growth principles. I think that applies to Manchester as well, sir. It's not that we need to preference uh, brownfield land. We need to develop a strategy that makes the most of the brownfield land we've got. It's not a, it's not a sequential approach, which we feel the word preference could lead to, sir. Thank you. Just uh, bear with me, sir. Okay, Emery. Thank you, sir. Um, three brief points. Um, firstly, I'm not sure that I agree with the concept that there can be a difference in the use of this wording in a development management context 
and a plan making context. Either the wording is consistent with national policy or it isn't. And that, of course, is a test of soundness. Secondly, in relation to paragraph 141 of the framework, which has been referred to, of course, that relates to exceptional circumstances, um, which is a specific test, whereas obviously this policy is to apply to future district local plans generally. But of course, that policy 141A of the framework, again, refers to the wording that, that we are advocating, which is make as much use as possible of suitable brownfield sites. And then it, it goes on and says, and underutilised land, which clearly that could include greenfield land as well. And the point I made last week, which I'll just cross-refer to very briefly, which is this plan, it does not, and it cannot, in its actual approach, prefer or prioritise previously developed land, because clearly the evidence on the existing supply in particular is that greenfield sites are needed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Litchfield? Uh, thank you, sir. I was firstly um, a bit disappointed that um, we're here today and we're, we're hearing that there's going to be changes proposed by the GMCA to all seven policies that we're um, here to talk about today. Um, obviously, there's been issues raised at Reg 19 stage. Um, there was issues raised through the matters papers, and we, we arrived here this morning to hear that there's going to be potential wording changes that we haven't had full time to consider um, and, and think about in detail. So, um, I, yeah, I'll leave that point. It's just disappointing that, um, that the tactics just been uh, proceed to be, be played here. Um, uh, sorry, I'm going to object to that. It's not a question of tactics at all. Fine. I don't want to get into your mind. I don't want to get into that. I'll, I'll deal with that. Um, but, uh, yeah, substantive points. OK. Um, I suppose moving on, um, the key point here is I don't feel that there's a need for the second paragraph in this policy. I see the, the MPPF is very clear, and I don't see what, what the second paragraph in this policy is actually seeking to introduce um, or adds to the plan. Um, and I suppose the last point, kind of following on from that, is Two-thirds of this policy relates to previously developed land and, and delivering, um, delivering previously developed land, but there are many strands of sustainable development which have been ignored or overlooked. Um, and you've you got to look at development comprehensively. Um, as, was, as was set out earlier, there's, there's no reason why um, some greenfield sites might, may not be more sustainable um, than brownfield land. Um, so I would, in our opinion, um, it doesn't add anything, um, and it should be deleted in its entirety from this policy. Okay, thank you. Um, is CPR a new point or an old point? It's uh, in response to some of the comments that have been made. <coughs> okay. Well, just on the affordable housing, obviously we'd all like affordable housing, but um, it's the way the NPPF is written uh, and focus on developer viability that enables developers not to come forward with affordable housing. And that's what's happened locally. Um, and basically, the concern is that their CPRE worked with local groups and identified there were a lot of sites missing off the brownfield registers across the nine authorities. In fact, it was ten authorities then, but the nine. So it's quite possible that over the lifetime of the plan new sites will come forward or be newly identified as being suitable. They may have previously been assessed as being unsuitable, but for whatever reasons, they may now be ready for development. So over the life cycle of the plan, it ought to be the case that more brownfield land can come forward and be part of the mix, be part of the five-year housing land supply of the constituent authorities. So... I think it's absolutely crucial that there is a brownfield preference expressed. It's there in national policy, and it ought to be. For a northern town that has the legacy that it does, it, 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 would, seem, um, it would seem unsound not to have a brownfield preference. Thank you. Uh, friends, Carrie Moss. 
I'd just like to come back on a couple of points um, made as well. I'm a bit confused about the affordability uh, discussion, and I know we're going to come back to that later in the week. But it's my understanding, and I, I think there was a CPRE report that suggested that um, the only one in ten houses um, were uh, affordable that are built on greenbelt sites. And in this plan, the greenbelt allocations are not um, building a multitude of affordable houses. We reviewed that and we'll pick up on that evidence <coughs> when we discuss the um, affordable housing uh, session. But for the new Carrington allocation, which is the largest allocation, and I just use it as an example, um, the affordable housing has been reduced from 30% to 15% and delivers a maximum of 650 affordable houses of all types across the whole plan period. So I find it just a little bit astounding that the, we're saying that it would be better to uh, build on Greenbelt because you can deliver affordable housing. I think, I think we're going into a different debate because yeah. obviously the, 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 yeah. that's in the context of the discussion of some people wanting this policy to say I something different. Agree. Um, but I don't want to get into the whole that, that affordability okay. issue. I think it's for a different day or a different okay. topic area. Um, before I go back to the council, some responses on this. I will just say, obviously, the point made about um, new information coming to light on this on the day. Obviously, we did last week say, preferably, we'd like some notice of this. But obviously, if, if there's no point in me saying to the councils, I don't want to hear this today because obviously it's just going to end up with a pointless debate. So I think if the councils have got something to say, then it's only fair and proper that I should let them say it. Obviously, it might mean there's more for me to think, perhaps think about and go away, and whether we need to come back on some stuff once we've had time to think about it. I don't know. We'll have to just see how it goes. But it's it's it happens, doesn't it? So just bear that in mind. So. Um, any, any points yes, just very briefly. So I just want to pick up on that last point. Um, the process otherwise obviously would have been we would have gone round the table with people saying you shouldn't be doing this for development management, sets a sequential test, and we would have got then to us saying we agree. So why not say it at the beginning of the session rather than having gone round with all people spending time making the point. Secondly, don't please don't forget and I say this to both the CPRE and, and Litchfields who raised this point about consultations on and so forth. Please don't forget that in due course, if underlined, you and your colleagues report that in order for this policy to be sound, there would need to be a main modification, which, for example, um, converts this paragraph, this second paragraph, into a paragraph that speaks only about making local plans and doesn't impliedly deal with development management if you, if that is where you get to, as we invite you to, um, then there would be a published main modification and there would be consultation on that and you would consider whether or not in order to consider the points made in the consultation on that main modification you would need to reopen the examination hearings or you feel that you can deal with those matters on the basis of the written submissions made about the point. So there's no consultation deficit here. All that we're doing is ensuring that our position is set out at the beginning of the session rather than at the end when we've been round with people making points that we concede. So, and it isn't at all unusual for those of us who have participated in local plans. It isn't at all on examination hearings. It isn't at all unusual for second and third thoughts to be given to points made by plan making authorities and for a different view to be reached um, when it comes to sessions like this. So I just wanted to say that. So there's no lack of consultation here because there is another round of consultation to come. If you agree with any of these points that we're going to make, that we've made today and that we're going to make today, let alone points made by other people, because for example, were you to say, use the language of the framework, not preference or priority or whatever, word it is, whichever P word it is that we're looking at on whatever the given day of the week it is, if you would say to us, well, in order to make this sound, it needs to be in the language of the framework, there would have to be consultation on that as a main modification. We could all be back here discussing this later on, again, either in person or in writing. So please, let's bear that in mind. So otherwise, um, I just wanted to very briefly say, uh, in response to the points that have been made around the table, 
Um, points about affordable housing, well, the same issue would arise if you did use the language of the framework. Um, it's a generic point. It doesn't particularly turn on the word preference as opposed to as much use as possible. Um, I take my own friend here for Collier's um, point that um, of the two paragraphs I've referred to, one of which is 119, the other is 141, one of those two paragraphs, 141, uses the word suitable, <laughs> paragraph 119 doesn't, um, there you are. Um, we'll leave it to you to consider whether or not the insertion of the word suitable is necessary to make this aspect of the policy sound. Um, there is an underlying, and I would say obvious, implication in all of this that when one expresses a preference for something, one doesn't express a preference for making the most use of unsuitable sites. I mean, one would have thought that is such an obvious point. Um, it doesn't need to be said, and that obviously was a view that the government agreed with in one paragraph in the framework, but not in another paragraph of the framework. So, I'm I'm, I'm content to leave you leave that to you, sir. I mean, it's it's certainly not meant to be a policy here that local plans should make as much use as possible of unsuitable brownfield land. That's obviously not the intention. So, if inserting the word suitable would clarify it and is necessary to make it sound, fair enough. Um, as for the Liverpool Local Plan Inspector's report, well, I've made my points as to the language in this plan, which is preference in this policy. I think if I caught the Barton Wilmore um, gentleman's point correctly, I think in the Liverpool Local Plan it was first priority, I think was the language. Yes. Yep. So there you are. We've got preference, um, you know. Uh, moving on to Emery's point, um, that um, if what I've said is, is a fair enough point about plan making, it's also a fair enough point about, um, or rather if what I've said is a fair enough point about development management, it's a fair enough point about plan making as well, so that they stand or fall together was basically um, Mr Coxon's point. Um, there is a difference, isn't there, between development management and plan making in terms of development management. The vice, if you like, the issue which many of the people around this table raised in their representations and which we've conceded um, is that come development management, if one promotes a greenfield site, um, if a policy expresses a general preference for brownfield, that policy might be applied, I would say misapplied, but it might be applied as a potential reason for refusal on the basis of saying we well, are greenfield, not brownfield, and the change that we've promoted this morning is meant to deal with that point. That is different to plan making where of course you have this various you have the various sieves that we've discussed previously and where obviously as we recognise in this plan some greenfield land is required to make up the numbers so to speak. Um, but they are different processes. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any points about parts of the policy we haven't talked about? or points you wish to come back on? Yeah, if I, if I may, um, I accept the fact there's a main modifications consultation, but because of the length of the time we're at, there is a bit of consultation fatigue. The plan has had an awful lot of consultation. People have... Um, so whilst there is an opportunity for consultation, I would be concerned that people already feel it's too far in the process, if you like, to okay. make a... We don't want to see the plan not happen. We just want to make sure it's... But obviously, if I, if I, irrespective of what the council said, yeah. if me and my colleagues decided that policy needed to change, the policy would be changing. So it wouldn't make... And there'd still be consultation. So, so the, the, I guess the timing of when the council have put this change to us doesn't alter any of that. It could still be changed. There could still be consultation. And it'd still be something that true. hasn't been, hasn't it's been discussed. It's true, but I, I'm making the point that I think uh, the public has been expected to consult quite a lot on this document and uh, any fundamental changes. And I think it is a fundamental change. Bearing in mind, this is a sustainable development policy and locations of sites, urban brownfield are more centrally located. So in terms of car dependency and a whole load of issues relating to affordability of living in spaces, um, arguably, and the per capita consequence of developing a brownfield site for housing vis-a-vis -a, -vis a greenfield site, you know, it doesn't yeah. need I, to... I take the point. Know, yeah, yeah. Okay. We're going back into your, your original point um, that you, you think it should stay as it is, effectively. Yeah, thank you. Um, friends in Carrington Moss. Yeah, I just wanted to make a point that 
perhaps this policy could be more comprehensive. Sustainable development is quite a big issue in the NPPF and we seem to have it focused on, um, uh, on some very specific issues. And if we're looking at, at, at perhaps what might constitute the needs of future generations, if we're looking at the wording in the NPPF, that could include their ability to breathe clean air. So we're not talking in this policy about um, any aspects there. I know we come on to that later. I would say, I mean, the yeah. point, it's actually a point Litchfield's raised as well, I think, isn't it? But um, I suppose the point I'd say to, the, to any, to, to raise that, is are the points you would like to see covered by the policies in this plan? Not necessarily how you how you would like to see. I'm sure you might have such yeah, a, but, you know, um, the issues you know. that you're yeah. talking about there, are they covered by the plan as a whole? Does it does it need does this I mean it might maybe it's the title says you know you want to put everything yeah. in there, but there are quite a few policies aren't they relating to so is is does it need to be access in there to, access to to healthy food sources from our uh, rural economy perhaps um, you know the rural and economy not is not, by any policy. not covered in the plan at all. Mm. Um, I mean you could go through obviously along so, the all I'm saying is that I feel that for a sustainable development policy, it doesn't feel very comprehensive. Okay. Um, it, it focuses but, but on... But do you recognise there might be a danger that if you made it comprehensive, yeah. it ends up just repeating stuff that's in every other policy? We're well, coming on to a policy soon. I okay. don't know when. Yeah. Uh, JPS 4, yeah. where I suspect my question is going to be along the lines of it's just a list of things which are covered elsewhere and is there okay. a danger that you end up with that under s1 if you just put everything in there because it's under the heading of sustainable event you just end up with a very long policy which just repeats what's in the rest of the plan yeah I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we do that um, but i do feel that it's perhaps not covering the things that you would expect if we're talking about the needs of future generations given okay. it's a s sustainable development policy Okay, just if the council have anything to say about, again, picking up on Litchfield's point as well, I think was a similar similar issue that there's more to sustainable development than the three th the, th the things that are mentioned in this policy. Any any response? Well, so I think the government's position on sustainable development is as a broad concept, everything covered in the framework relates to sustainable development. There is separately and differently from that general point a very specific presumption in relation to sustainable development, which is defined in terms in paragraph 11, but the whole framework is meant to be addressing sustainable development as a general concept. Um, I mean, we remember this, was this at the very beginning of the very first session, at the, in the very first week of this hearings, of these hearings, remember this plan is not doing everything. Um, some would say it's doing far from everything. We would say it's doing quite a bit of, <laughs> quite a bit of quite a lot. Um, but we are not covering every, every conceivable aspect of sustainable development in this plan. Um, some of the points made by Friends of Carrington Moss are dealt with later in the chapter, for example, clean air. Um, others, such as food security, for example, aren't, for, to the best of my knowledge. Um, and it would be for future local plans to consider whether they wish to do anything about that themselves, because this plan is not dealing with everything. It's dealing with what it regards some key essentials which really do need to be dealt with. Um, you're going to like later on what I'm going to say about policy S4, by the way. <laughs> you should not infer anything from what I ask. Um, sometimes I am plain devil's advocate and sometimes... Well, um, the devil in you, sir, will like what I'm going to say about <laughs> S4. <laughs> um, OK, I'm going to um, move on then. That's taken an hour to talk about a policy with three paragraphs in it. So... Um, I'm slightly, about, <laughs> I'm slightly concerned about. I'm slightly concerned. Yeah, about one paragraph. So I'm slightly one concerned about what's going to happen now change. with um, JPS two, which I think is the most uh, uh, difficult, shall we say, of the policies in terms of what comments. And so I think, bearing in mind what we've said, I assume you have something you want to, to put to, to put to the examination. So about S two, yes, that's right, sir. So S two. Um, is at page 87 of the published plan. Um, and as avid readers of um, main modifications which have already been proposed, so not new ones, the ones that we've already um, indicated, we have 
suggested that a number of quite substantial changes should be made to the supporting text leading up to the policy, for example, um, in explaining what adequate means in relation to um, EV charging points. That's just an example. And in the policy itself, in the policy itself, S2, already, this is not new, we have already proposed the deletion of um, item 5, for instance, changes to... Um, changes to um, item 8D. Um, so those are in the main mods that we've already already um, publicized. So in addition, so this is the these are the sort of new points if you like, just to be fair about this, uh, points on second and third reflection. Um, policy S2 item 7 refers to one as one of the things which will support delivering a carbon neutral Greater Manchester etc etc one of the things that it's referred to is the development of local area energy plans uh, to develop cost effective pathways etc 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 now this plan places for everyone has taken its time as a number of people have said kindly and unkindly um, during these sessions already and um, in taking its time making its way through the plan making system something has happened and the something that's happened is that all the local area energy plans for the nine authorities in question have now actually all been adopted so there are no new area energy plans yet to come and so item seven is OTOs, um, it seems to us, um, because supporting something through what at the time it was written was a prospective measure, because these energy plans were in the course of being written, etc., etc., has now been overtaken by events. And so the easiest thing to do is just delete number seven, just to avoid confusion. Uh, because if anyone's interested, they can find a local area energy plan for each of the nine authorities. They already exist. Um, so that, one hopes, won't be controversial or cause any great excitement. Um, item eight in the policy, item eight in the policy, um, there are two elements we've thought, thought further about. Um, if we, if I can work backwards at the end of the at the end of the um, item eight a at the end of item eight a there was an interim requirement of meeting a minimum nineteen percent carbon reduction against part L of the twenty thirteen building regulations and a footnote that referred to until such time as this level is superseded well it's all been superseded because there are more recent new in inverted commas building regulations. And so this interim requirement is also OTOs because building regulations of changes to the building regs have caught up with the plan, so to speak. Um, so that's OTOs too and needs to come out. Um, and then finally, for one moment, yes, the final point in relation to second and third thoughts are the opening words of item eight. Um, the expectation, uh, we, we don't propose to change that, but then when we get to item A, the first expectation is that new development will, and item A is B, net zero carbon from 2028. Um, and on reflection, we do agree with those who have suggested this is too emphatic. We understand there are people who welcome these words, but there are many who think they are excessive. Um, and what we've decided to do um, and to say this morning is that we prefer the language used and recently endorsed in the your colleague's report on the Salford local plan, which has a similar policy. And the words there are work toward, work toward. So work toward being net zero carbon from 2028. So just being less... I suppose some would say less prescriptive, if you like. Um, so that language has been through the Salford local plan process and we think it's an appropriate and been endorsed by your colleague and is about to be adopted in the Salford local plan. Um, 
January, I think, is when it's slated to be adopted. So um, those are the changes that we, su we suggest. Two are because passages have been in this policy have been overtaken by events, and one is to make um, the opening words of 8A, um, I think to use the language of some of those who have made representations criticising the language, to make that less prescriptive and to better capture the aspiration which is to work toward, rather than to say, in what might be read as mandatory terms, B. So that's where we are, sir. No others to that policy. OK, thanks for that. Um, obviously, I, uh, I still need to consider, as we know, and re uh, whether or not the policy is, is, requires that kind of modification. Um, of course, of course. I'm going to go, I've got quite a lot of questions about this. Um, because of timing and everything else, I'm going to go through all of my questions on this policy um, and cover a lot of ground. Some of it may be uh, picked up, you know, obviously some of my questions might end up, you've, you've made a change in response to some of this. Or, so we'll, 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 we'll get there. Um, as I said, um, I'm going to go through it roughly in the order set by my MIQs, um, which roughly corresponds to the order the policy is written. But I'm going to leave issues about viability to the end of my questioning because obviously go through a lot and then talk about viability because it... That would be helpful, sir, because yeah. we probably need to do some seat shuffling, if you like, or okay. person shuffling. Yeah. Right, OK. So, yeah. um, and then I'll open it up at the end. So, so this policy includes quite a lot, uh, but it all flows back to the main overarching objective, action, aim of delivering a carbon neutral Greater Manchester by 2038 and a dramatic reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I'm going to start with the 2038 target for a carbon neutral Greater Manchester and in line with our questions whether it's justified and consistent with national policy. Um, just to get some context, where does the 2038 date come from? Is that from the Great, Greater Manchester Environmental Strategy? Or? Yes, we already have a Greater Manchester five-year environment plan adopted as long ago as three years ago now, which has 2038 in it. Um, and there is some independent work to support um, to support this this whole approach to underpin both the five-year environment plan for Greater Manchester and also this policy. So this, um, if you like, the, the 2038 is a, if you like, a corporate objective, and the PFV is one of many strands yes. which may be seeking to deliver that corporate objective. Absolutely, yes. And there is underpinning work to support the um, what we would regard as a good sense of this, but yes. Okay. Is there anything that you're aware of in national policy, national guidance, written ministerial statement, statute, which dictates what dates councils can set targets for carbon neutrality in principle? I'm not aware of there being anything which uh, inhibits um, a plan making authority from being, if you like, more ambitious in the field and given the nature of the issues that we're dealing with um, one would have thought that some ambition is to be welcomed. So in that regard obviously uh, it's been pointed out to me or if you want to draw my attention to the Climate Change Act which has a date of 2050 um, again just nothing in the act or is there anything in the act which suggests local authorities kind of adopt a different or as you said a more ambitious approach? No, sir. See, see my previous. I refer yeah. to my previous answers. As I'm, I understand it. I mean, if I've missed something, then hopefully it will be drawn to our attention. Because if there is a prohibition, then obviously we wouldn't want to infringe a prohibition. But as I understand it, there is nothing in law, statute or otherwise, or policy or guidance, which seeks to preclude a local authority in making a plan, a local plan here nine authorities making nine local plans in one from adopting a more ambitious stance, okay. aspiration. Okay, I'll leave that there for now on th that point then. Um, others may wish to come back. Um, as I said, I'm going through my questions as I set them in the MIQ. So um, we didn't ask anything specific about criteria one, two or three. We may well come back to those if people have ra raised issues, or we may come back to them as part of the general discussion. But I'm going to move on to um, criterion four, 
which is about keeping fossil fuels in the ground. So that's, as far as you're concerned, obviously that's one of the eight ways of uh, delivering your, achieving carbon neutrality by 2038 is to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Also noting the reference in paragraph 5.19 to being definitive about the council's position on fracking. Um, reminder, I'm not discussing the merits of fracking or merits of mineral extraction or anything. I'm, I'm just discussing the merit, you know, whether or not the policy is sound. And in particular, in this case, if it's consistent with national policy and other parts of the development plan. Um, so your written statement, well, we obviously asked if, if it was uh, justified to, to talk about this and this plan and whether issues about minerals extraction within the scope of the plan. I think if I'm right in summarising your written statement is acknowledges that the criterion is outside the scope of the plan, is not entirely consistent with national policy and the joint minerals plan will continue to be the decision making tool for relevant applications. So with all this in mind, how do you justify this criterion being part of the plan and what purpose does it serve? Forgive me. As I understand it, I mean, I look to my left in the moment, but as I understand it, this is all part of this wider piece about seeking to deliver our carbon neutral Greater Manchester by no later than 2038. And it's in that context that this makes sense, if you like, um, and is sound as opposed to needing to be deleted, for example, in order for the plan to be sound. Um, I think the tension with the framework and the relevant paragraphs, I think, are 209 and 210, I think, of the framework, page 59. Um, I think it's, it would be easy to, if you like, overstate the tension between this aspect of the policy and the framework. Um, I would say, and I do say, that if, 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 well, the tension that we've identified is if you like, one of implication rather than there being something explicit in the framework, which in some way can be read as inhibiting our places from, for everyone having a, an item saying what item four says. Um, so I don't think this is a sort of head-on sort of collision with the framework um, myself. Um, so I look to my left to see the particular justification for this. I know that this has been a matter of study, if you like, in Greater Manchester. So it's not just, I don't know, a bunch of people getting together and saying, let's write this into the policy. This is supported by, this is supported by work. So I look to my left to, for help on this. Yes, Cathy Bibby, um, GM for the GMCA. Um, yeah, sorry. So I think. Um, there's an acceptance that it's not entirely consistent with those uh, MPPF paragraphs. However, as we set out in paragraph 5.19, um, the continued extraction of fossil fuels isn't compliant with the carbon emissions reduction pathway, so um, that's aligned with the international commitment to the Paris Agreement. So therefore, um, it's not prudent to exploit new sources of hydrocarbons and the PFE therefore doesn't support hy hydraulic fracturing hence the, um, the policy. If, <clears throat> and obviously I'm, I'm thinking mechanics here and everything else. So if an application were to come in for some kind of um, mineral extraction, I'm, and I'm not talking about, because the policy doesn't talk about fracking, it just talks about fossil fuels. So it could be any, um, any mineral extraction, or like any fossil fuel mineral extraction. An application comes in, you've got a minerals plan, which has a set of presumably a, a policy or policies which would be used to determine that. Where does this sit? Because this is this is stating categorically they should be kept in the ground. So is that A, isn't it not just prejudging the outcome of a, an application, but B, how does in terms of the uh, pro, you know the order, if you like, in which the development plan is being looked at, where does that policy sit? So well, there's a part I'll ask for a sort of practical sort of development management view, if you like, in a few moments' time, but as your, your understanding in relation to the legal position where you have a group of plans, a group of development plans, and there's a conflict between them, then another part of Section 38 tells us that the last to be adopted in that sequence prevails. So if there's a straight, direct conflict, if you like, between policy in an earlier plan and a policy in a later plan and the policy in the later plan would prevail over the policy in the earlier plan. Um, I 
does sorry does, does that not cause a bit of an issue then in this in this instance if you it could do because mm. this were plan's not, not the scope of this plan this, this plan is not a minerals plan no we're were it not for what I'm about to say <laughs> this is my my answer to the point but I, I you know I myself am sort of making the point so forgive me I recognize what the what the legal provision says obviously plainly um, and I would suggest that um, I would suggest that one needs to be careful not to overread this because that is to say item s2 because it simply tells us the aim of delivering something will be supported by keeping fossil fuels in the ground um, I personally wouldn't read that as a development management policy saying that um, if you have a proposal to um, extract fossil fuels from the ground um, that um, there's a straightforward plain refusal which arises out of this out of this part of this policy because this is simply a policy which is saying how things will be achieved by supporting supported through a range of measures including and this is one of them um, but you know that's my position. The, the, the language of the, the language of this and the, and the introductory two lines are not emphatic enough, if you like, to give rise to that problem. That would be how I would deal with that. But if I just go to my left to have a to see if there are any other sort of points which are not legal points. But um, is there, was there anything you wanted to add? No. All right. But sir, if you but to be quite straightforward about this, if if you consider that this language is if you like, too emphatic and would give rise to that very issue that you've given, that you've directed me to, then as I very openly said to you, um, because it is just simply stating what the legal position is, um, the later plan would, prefer, would prevail over the earlier plan. So if you think there is that head-on conflict, then, then to be quite frank, something would need to be done about that, to be, to be straightforward about it. Yeah. I'll move on from that then, I've got the, your answer to that. Um, right, quite the next point we, points we raised were about criteria five and seven. Um, I think we put those together because we saw some correlation between them or some um, link between them. They've both gone. And you've suggested, yeah, exactly. <laughs> One you, went a while ago and the other's gone this I've already morning, suggested <laughs> that uh, five should go on the basis that it um, was covered by what seven proposed and now as you've already said, you're proposing that seven goes as well. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Which could be part of the conversations we have about these policies. So we were chatting away about this policy the other day, and then someone just piped up and said, well, wait a minute, all the local energy area energy plans have now been adopted anyway. So, um, mm. so um, yeah. So, so we did think five was covered by seven, and, and now seven has over, been overtaken by events. So why, why say... You know, support through a range of measures and implying these plans are yet to come when they've all already come. Okay. So just as I'm always concerned about, you know, not unintended consequences, if if you were... Cause one of the questions I had about this, this criterion is, um, again, practical application from a development management or a local plan preparation perspective, anything that would flow out of that... You know, prep, I, I, re I read it as... And this is one of the issues I've got with some of these thematic policies. You read some of the criteria, and they're very clearly about a development management. You can you can read into that. Some are quite clearly about local plan. Some are seems to me they are we will, and not necessarily anything flows out of that in terms of development management. And, oh, and I, I read criterion seven yeah. as a we are doing and with the supported text obviously we are doing this in order to help support twenty thirty eight. Absolutely, but it doesn't actually have any implications for dm or local plan absolutely all right so this is this is one of those policies which is a i like mr my own friend mr tucker's word the others over is it portmanteau i think yes. this is one yeah. of those policies that is i would i would have a sort of probably slightly less polite word but there you are um this is one of those policies that is a mix of um various things um and one of the things in the mix are is um is just stating what the great what Greater Manchester will do, if you like, authority wise, not through requiring things from developers, for example, or not even through local plans. 
um, it is a statement here of various things will all together go to support um, the aim of delivering a carbon neutral Greater Manchester. I think the thought process behind this is that were one well not to state the things that are being done um, by the authorities outside planning applications, outside making local plans, um, the question then would arise, well, how on earth are you ever going to get to a carbon neutral Greater Manchester no later than 2038 if all you're doing is asking developers to, mm. you know, think about this and asking local plans to think about that. So that's the thought process which underpins policy of this nature. Um, you might think that's a good thought process or a bad thought process, but that's 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 where we are with it, sir. So. Okay, and this... Um I'm just trying to find, there was a, as part of your modifications to criterion, I think, you know, to, to talk about five, I think you suggested some supporting text changes which related to that, which I... To um, which one was it? To these, yes, obviously, forgive me, I, I should have said, and it's entirely my fault, to the extent that there's any supporting text which speaks about these local area energy plans as if there are things still to come, then obviously that would need to, that would need yes. to be changed Yes, sorry, as well. yes, it was paragraphs 5.9 and 5.10, and I think it was the last sentence of that. Yes. Um, it says, and it is anticipated that local plans will further identify geographical locations. Yeah. Oh, is that, am I looking at the right? Well, yeah, uh, well you are, yes, 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 because the, the paragraph in question which would go in between the five... Started about local area energy plans. Exactly. So are we being funded. Um, they will become, that's the point, they will become a critical evidence base for local yeah. plans in setting out possible, etc. And it has anticipated the local plans will further identify. So my, my point mm. was going to be, if that, is a, if that is an order, if you like, mm. as I see it as a, as a mm. requirement for local mm. plans to do, mm. then it should, should it be in policy? But I guess the, 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 the world's moved on, is your point. The world has moved on. So, I mean, that change that we'd published to insert a paragraph between 5, 9 and 5, 10. I mean, it just goes to show these, these local area energy plans have got a wriggle on, haven't they? Because it says in the opening words, are being developed. Well, they've all been developed. Um, so the new paragraph as it was is, you know, is, is OTOs in that regard because they've all, they've all happened. So they're there. Okay. So if anyone wants to look at them, they can do so. All right, okay. So <laughs> just so they, removing them, Having the, having the reference to it had no mm. practical impact and removing it would have no practical impact on what we're talking about. I don't, I, personally, I don't think so. Um, that's, that's the position I put forward for the nine because they're there, the plans are there. So, yeah, they exist. You know, when future local plans are made, then those future lo local, each authority has its own local area energy plan, so that would be part of the evidence base for each future yeah. local plan. They're not, they're not before me, as far no. as I know. So I don't think don't, they are. No. So in terms of what they include, um, that they have things which require things from development in them? Or is it, again, is it more about actions that the councils are doing? I, we don't, we to don't be quite know. frank, I, as I understand it, they're a broad mix again. Um, some things which you would say, well, that looks like a planning point, some things which are not planning um per se but in any event they're not before you for it to be examined and we're we're suggesting yeah, okay. that reference is taken out <laughs> in the policy um references to them is taken out so um so there you are i think the top and bottom of the point is that the local area energy plans for the nine uh, will be part of the wider evidence base for the subsequent local plans okay thank you nothing else to add on that then so Jump going slightly back to Criterion 6, uh, which Number was about six. Oh. increasing Ooh. the... Sorry, question 6.5, increasing yes. the um, range of nature-based solutions, including carbon sequestration through restoration of peat-based habitats, etc. Mm. In answer to the question, um, you written same makes the point that the plan should be read as a whole, yes, <laughs> and that policies G9 in terms of carbon sequestration, G7 in terms of woodland management and tree planting, and S5 in terms of flood management mm. uh, should all be taken into account when determining planning applications and or preparing local plans. So I guess my point is if, if these policies do the heavy lifting, to use the oft-use phrase... That's my phrase from exactly. the very first, but just, it's um, been adopted by others. So, so. Yeah, so well, yeah. yeah. Uh, when, when, what is this, actually, what is, is this, again, is it doing anything different to those? Is it purely, a, again, a, a signpost to those 
without cross reference, but it's, a, it's just a this is what we're doing policy rather than a this is what we expect people to do. It does, on the face of it, see, I'm, I'm reading the, did you refer to 638, 639 in our statement, I think is what you had in mind. Uh, possibly, so. I haven't got, sorry, I made note of the... Um, yeah. Number. So it is, it is by way of a flagging up or signposting policy uh, or aspects of the policy, that's right, because you look elsewhere in this very plan for more detail about these, about these points. This is drawing them together under this heading of what on earth is Greater Manchester doing to achieve this ambition. Um, and this is... This item has a number of things that are being supported in order to achieve the ambition. If you want more detail, look elsewhere in the plan. Is is a point put shortly. And so possibly. again, it's not aimed at. It's what we've been talking about about seven really. It's not. Is it? It's not really aimed at developers or development or, or through local plans. It's aimed at. This is a, a, one of the things we are doing, or or the out. Or I suppose the outcome of what we're doing will be this. Um, yes, and if you want to understand how any of that bears upon development management, you look elsewhere in the plan to the policies which are referred to in the um, okay. in, our, in our matter statement uh, six point one. I guess paragraph six point nine. We'll come uh, on six point thirty nine. We'll right. come on to those and see whether they do add any. Um, Absolutely, detail. No, that's right. So a lot of this is just putting off the discussion until we get to the policy which has got the nitty gritty in it but yes yeah I mean we have a number of policies like this in the, in this plan don't we and you'll tell us in due course what you think of the approach but a number of the policies and this is one of them is in effect saying under this heading under this banner here it is carbon neutral greater match than the later in 2038 what on earth are all these authorities doing and some of the items are here's a summary of what other parts of this plan seeks to do and some might say, well, you don't have to keep telling us this because when we get to the policy, we're told what we, we need to be told. Yeah. And others would say it's no bad thing to collect them together under this heading. Yeah. Point. And yes, OK. But I suppose, again, just taking your point of that, and I'm not saying this is you know, without prejudice to anything. Of if, if you were to remove that line, that policy, that criterion, it's because it's elsewhere. not doing anything, it's, elsewhere. it's not, it's not going to... It's not. It's not saying we will. I'm just saying, yeah, it's not. It's no, there's no practical consequence other than it wouldn't bring the plan crashing to the ground on these various aspirations that we have because they're covered elsewhere in the plan. This is this dividing line. It seems to me, so many of these points that we discuss at the hearing sessions are the, you know, where does one draw the line between things which are necessary to make the plan sound? On the one hand, this isn't one of those in my book. And on the other side, the line, how would you go about writing a nicer plan, if you like? <laughs> yeah, this I mean, I'll just those. say as a matter of, <laughs> no, 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 I think I could say, as a matter of principle, duplication within the plan isn't, isn't to my mind, a necessarily a matter of soundness. Exactly. Provided that it's, it's not all Absolutely. completely inconsistent and unclear about what you're doing and that one policy says this, one Absolutely. policy says that, and it's opaque. Absolutely. So, yeah, um, I agree. But I just, you know, I need to yeah. investigate this. Um, no, no, of course you do, sir. Um, okay, so that's the, I don't think I've got anything else on Criterion 6. Putting off... Putting off eight. Maybe we should have a break before we go on to Criterion oh, come 8. On, sir, come on, let's, let's, let's crack on. And <laughs> no, no. We'll need a lie down after we've done number eight. No, a great break would be fine, so whatever you want to do. As yeah, you I think uh, Criterion 8's got a lot in it. Um, I think we'll just have 15 minutes. Sure. And come back um, as a bit of a comfort break. So we've done an hour and a half, and that's enough, I think. Um, so we'll come back at quarter past eleven. Thank you very much. And get on with, with that. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Okay, quarter past 11, we'll, we'll start again. Thank you, everyone. Um, I just got to start talking about uh, paragraph, sorry, criterion eight, mm. policy S2. Your colleague doesn't know what she's missing today, does she, so? <laughs> here in a minute. Um, right, so, criterion eight. Um, Obviously, I'm mindful of what you've said about wanting to change that initial um, the, the initial words. phrase, but I'm going to go through it as mm. I would anyway because I think some of the questions are still relevant. Um, of course. And obviously, you can allude back to that if necessary. Um, so the 2028 date was the first thing I wanted to obviously talk about. Is where, Again, in the same way as I talked about 2038 date, is mm. where does that come from? I think my, my understanding is, if you correct me wrong, that that's the date that's been determined would be needed in order to... Uh, deliver the 2038. So yes. it's, 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 that, long, that in a nutshell. Long story short, so yes. yes. And again, anything that you're aware of in national policy guidance, written ministerial statements, um, other acts, which says anything about dates or targets for expecting net zero development, that suggests you can't adopt a date of 2028? As per my earlier answers, if I've missed something, then Mayor Culper, but... Um, not that I'm aware of, so no, that nothing that would seek, nothing that tells us we can't do it, if you like, if we think we've got the evidence to support doing it. Obviously, there's a debate about whether we have and we haven't. Yes, I should say in, prin in yes, principle. Exactly, as a matter of principle. Yeah. I'm not aware of anything which precludes a plan-making authority from, from doing this. Okay. So, in terms of 8A, we have the net zero, or working mm. towards net zero by... Uh, 2028 by following the energy hierarchy and any residual carbon emissions offset I'll come on to the offset issue in a moment mm -hmm. which, in, which in order in point seeks to and then you've got the six, uh, the five mm. um, acts actions and then the interim and then the men about the, talking about the interim measures about the building regulations you've suggested obviously deleting so, deleting the building regulations it's OTOs now yeah, yeah. other than let's say as it's as it's submitted if you like other than the building regs reference does any part of criterion a a t establish a set of standards or on development or or anything which exceeds building you know building regulations when you did you say as published in other words as in sorry as in as in i'm reading it as it's before me exactly yeah. with the word b net zero as opposed to work toward yes, so, yes. Uh, yeah. no that that's my yeah. no so anything about basically is anything in one to five eight a one to five really set, is, is it setting any kind of standard and i'm obviously alluding there to the written ministerial statement about setting standards outside the optional standards is it, yes is it anything I, contrary to that which i think becomes particularly pertinent when we come to a later one of the later policies that we'll be discussing somewhere along the line today um well, as written with B net zero carbon from 2028 by following the various things, there's, there's an argument that we, we acknowledge now, um, as I've indicated, that this could be read as, if you like, setting some form of standard, so to speak, and then there'd be a whole debate about whether it is or it isn't going beyond current government policy. Um, so that's our antidote to that is to say work toward, and that's, as we as I really, as I say, we've we've taken that from a, well, an up-to-date plan that's that's sort of just about to be adopted. Um, so I, I, you know, we do concede, if you like, or recognise that B can be read in that in that way. Um, I know you're, I think, going to come separately to viability, sir, because there are a few words I want to say about viability, but we're parking that, I think. Until yeah, I think we, so. Yeah, because yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I think a lot of obviously what's in eight. Hmm. Well, I was saying the policy all leads to questions of viability. So. Yes, which are um, we're coming to. Just in turn, again, it might maybe the change changes this a little bit. The mechanics, mm. um, just for just to help me a bit, um, the policy as submitted is B net zero mm. carbon from twenty twenty eight, mm. and then in and then it talks about this, and then you've got a footnote um, thirty one after B net zero. Mm. which talks, footnote 31, applied to operational net zero carbon up to 2028 and considered for net zero in construction from 2028. Mm. And then additional words. Uh, minimum carbon reduction target expected to be in line with 
2025 future ohm standard of 80%. Just just in terms of mechanics, this, obviously the policy says from 2020, but then you've got some words which are, are, are applied, seem to be applied to now or up to 2020. Have you just talked me through that and explained to me how that works? Give me one moment. I'm just checking that we haven't done anything to this footnote. I don't think we have, but I'm just double checking. Uh, no, the footnote stays the same, um, so we haven't publicised any changes there. Um, I'm going to turn to my left for <coughs> some help on that one, um, above my pay grade, sir, so I should, um, I should turn to my left. Some help on the footnote, please, and how it's meant to work. Um, yes, so um, I just need to find the paragraph reference number shortly, but that does refer to unregulated emissions as part of the pathway approach. So recognising from 2025 onwards that the application to uh, reduce unregulated emissions applies as part of the policy pathway. Um, and I'll just find the paragraph reference shortly. Yeah, OK. Um, that still might need some explanation, afraid. <laughs> so what that actually means um, in terms of, again, I'll just, I'll just, just be simple and put myself in the shoes of a development management officer who's trying to work out how to deal with an application from now, at least from now until 2028, what are they expected to look for and do? Uh, yes, so I'll refer to paragraphs 510 and 511 of the reason justification. Um, so this explains um, about the, the role of achieving net zero carbon, um, and that's in line with the framework established by the UK Green Building Council, and refers to footnote 22, so there's an existing framework document by the UK Green Building Council which sets out this approach. So in terms of development management, it will sign post to that piece of work. Um, and then further to, to that point, it explains that development um, will need to be applying the net zero carbon approach to operational emissions up until 2028. And again, that, that's signposting back to the UK Green Building Council, which further explains how you would apply that through development management approaches. So these doc, this UK Green Building Council, are they, what status do they have? Yes, yeah, so they're an advisory group. Um, they do a lot of work in this area and provide lots of kind of guidance documents for, for local planning officers, officers. And that document in particular um, provides a bit more detail on the implementation of net zero carbon. Just give us one moment. Okay. Did you refer to that one as well? Yes. Because you mentioned... Yeah. Oh. Yes, apologies. So paragraph 515 in the reason justification, again, refers to the unregulated emissions and the definition of those and how they are expected to be assessed to the requirement to meet net zero carbon in operation from 2025. And it further suggests that the only way that this can be delivered is through the use of on-site electricity generation through renewable energy solutions or through carbon offsetting. So where is this reflected in the policy then? Because the policy doesn't talk anything about 2025 or any of this stuff he just talks about net zero from 2028? Well, I think it would come, as I understand it, it would come in through the footnote, sir, because net zero takes you to footnote 31. That's, that's how I understand the link is made. Hmm. It's not very clear, is it? Because, again, the footnote and the, the sure. piece of reason justification I've been pointed to don't are talking about something completely different to what's happening from 2028. They're talking about what's happening up to 2028. And from. And then from. And from. So no, is I there not a missing I take the point. A missing um, element of policy here, which isn't really it before? Might, it might, um, again, to be straightforward, yes. I mean, it could be said it's a bit of a convoluted route, isn't it, to be frank? So you refer to a footnote, and the footnote then has to be read with the supporting text, and so, yes, it would be clearer if there, if there was more direct, there was something more direct on the point in the policy itself, but, you know, that's the way we've sought to do it. Again, you know, is it necessary to make it sound to, you know, to make it clear in the policy itself rather than this route of going to the footnote? Well, there you are. Well, I would, fair, fair I would say footnote isn't part of the policy. Reason justification isn't part of the policy. Um, the policy, if I'm reading that policy mm. on it in, its, in its most sen yeah. common sense way, mm. I'm, I'm only being expected to do something from 2020. I'm not being expected to do anything up to 2028. I um, would disagree with the first proposition. The footnote is part of the policy because it's ref the footnote okay. is in the policy. I agree with the second proposition, obviously, because that was one of my cases that established it. 
Um, so yes, I certainly, but I do quarrel with the first point. I'm okay. afraid, so with respect, um, where a policy has a footnote in it, the, the footnote and what's said in this is part of the policy. Look at the framework. I mean, it does the same thing. The okay. Framework. Well, we can. But in any event, it is potentially a, a, a sort of. I take the point. Conflict. No, I take or, the point. Yeah. Lack of clarity, I think. Lack of clarity, it could be said, um, because one has to read the footnotes and then that sets a whole chain of thought in, yeah. uh, in mind as to you know what that means. So I, I do take that point, so yes, absolutely. So if we're not talking really about, as I've understood it, 2028, what's the justification for doing things before that date then? Well, we are talking about, we're talking about 2023 and something else. So, because right. you can see that from 2028 is clearly referred to not only in the policy, but also in the footnotes. Well, sorry, yes. Um, so we're doing two things and yeah. it's one of those things that- So I suppose I need, it's the, the, it's the, it's the, if there's two, two limbs, if you like, if, there, yeah. if there'd be, how you might have written it, I suppose, is limb one is what we're doing Absolutely. up to 2020 and what we're doing from 2028. Point taken. The up to, up to 2028. Think. Just perhaps again, just talk me through the justification for that and the background I'll, to that. I'll turn to my left yeah. for that. I think an effort was made just now to seek to explain. Yes, that, I think I, I might no, need. No, no, it's, I it's, might need it again because I was just getting my head around the. For now. Indeed. So, just focusing on the 2025, not the 2028. That's fine. If I may, I may um, bring in colleagues from Curry and Brown, if that's okay. And um, they provided the supporting evidence base for the uh, policy in terms of net zero carbon 2028, and they may be able to explain it a bit more. Are they here? Eloquently than I can. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. You'll need just to introduce yourself. Good morning, Ad Adam McTavish from Curry and Brown. Yeah, so if you could just perhaps just talk me through what all this how it all comes about and how it would work in practice, because I'm a little confused, as it's obvious. So the, uh, the proposed approach is to move as rapidly as, uh, as practicable towards uh, total net zero carbon new development by 2028. And the aim is to uh, address as much as possible uh, in line with, with building regulations, changes, the operational emissions from new uh, development and to do that in a way that's measured and allows the industry to, to adapt to changes as they come into force. So the changes in Part L 2021, the future home standard, and then ultimately in 2028, looking at the construction-related emissions from new, uh, new development. So uh, the approach has been to uh, develop standards for the period up to 2025 that would incorporate all of the operational energy associated with regulated energy use, so that's heating, hot water, ventilation, and lighting. And then subsequent between 2025 and 2028 to include unregulated emissions, which would be those for uh, small power, uh, cooking, and, and other energy loads in the building. Subsequent to 2028, the aspiration is to include the construction emissions associated with uh, embodied carbon in materials, and that would give you in line with the UK Green Building Council definition of zero carbon, a full zero carbon uh, new development. The approach has been structured in a way that the most important long-term uh, carbon reductions are secured first, and that the elements that um, uh, would be needed to in order to, for the 2038 target to be met so that a building could be operational as a, a, a net zero carbon building in 2038 without the need for retrofit to be achieved uh, at a stage before um, the uh, life of the services and systems within the building would, would expire. Okay. So actually then, we have three time periods we have now to 2025, 25, 2025 to 2028, and then 25, 2028 onwards. That's three different approaches that you're expecting developers to adhere to. Is that right? Yes, that's my understanding. Okay. And Confirm, so your point from a few moments ago, yeah. Okay. Okay. 
I'll, I'll leave that for now, and I think because I'm sure people, I need to perk up my knees and think about that and see see if uh, other people come back on it. Um, just general terms, not understanding not everything we've talked about. The the five items that are mentioned in um, the the energy hierarchy. Again, anything in there which would be out with the local, uh, national planetary policy framework, or anything out of the ordinary, or um, anything that doesn't constitute normal good practice. No? I don't. In relation to the order of importance, the, the energy hierarchy. I well, well, I'll wait and hear. Obviously, around the table, but seems to me that's an uncontroversial energy hierarchy to state. Um, I think it's, I think the debate is around the, the words that precede the, uh, precede the reference to the energy hierarchy, I think. Okay. Um, yeah. Good. And um, when, just again, practical terms, talking about Obviously, you've got this requirement under 8A. In terms of assessing that, you know, again, from a development, when you would assess that, is that covered by what you've said in Criterion 2, which is promoting the use of life cycle cost and carbon assessment tools and or Criterion 8F, which is about detailed energy statements? Is that, is that the means, are they, are they the means by which you would determine something's net zero? So it's covered by policy. The, the assessment tool is covered in the policy. It's not that they're not something different. Just that's how I understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want to touch on offsetting. So the policy refers to carbon emissions offsetting, and paragraph five point one six states that where there is no reasonable, where there are no reasonable alternatives to meet the minimum carbon reductions, then payments to offset the remaining emissions will be required. Such payments will be expected to find carbon saving fund carbon saving programmes within Greater Manchester to help meet five-year environmental plan targets. This also states that the mayor is developing an environmental fund, and districts may also develop alternative approaches through local plans. First things first. Anything that you're aware of to suggest that the principle of carbon offsetting is inconsistent with national policy, or not justified? No. Anything to suggest, well, the answer is probably the same. Anything to suggest the potential financial contributions in this regard, it would not be able to meet the statutory tests for planning obligations? Again, in principle? In principle, no. Plainly, when you say the statutory tests, you, I, you have in mind Regulation 122 of the Silver Regs. Um, and in any event, if as and when it came to... Um, someone either suggesting an offset or a local planning authority in a development management case asking for an offset, whether the, it's put forward by the developer or it's, or it's requested by the authority, um, it would all be subject to Regulation 122 in any event. Um, now, in relation to necessity, the first test in Regulation 122, whether it's necessary in order to make the development acceptable, um, one would obviously take support from the reference to carbon emissions in offsetting in S2. Um, but in relation to the other tests, so reasonableness, proportionality, I'm summarising very briefly indeed the language of the Regulation 122, obviously those would be very case specific. Yeah, yeah quite. Thank you. Just. Um Again, from a very purely practical point of view, and I realise the reason justification talks about what it means, a fund, you know, and everything else. Does, is the policy um, sufficiently clear in that regard? Um, both in terms of what is expected from developers, also, I guess, when financial contributions, contributions would be required? Are you, you comfortable? I think this one is fair enough because, you know, in that distinction between policy and, and supporting text, because the policy refers to an offset, and the supporting text here is doing its job as it should do in, in my book, which is explaining, supporting that. Um, so yes, I, I, I'm just hesitating for one moment to think this through a bit more. Um, 
Yes, I think it. I think it. I think it does work actually because the supporting text is explaining what is meant by carbon emissions offset and you know how that's addressed in Greater Manchester. Um, if there's any doubt about it, one should err on the side of bringing something into policy. Obviously, so if when you reflect on this, if you think um, the system that's set up at the moment in places for everyone isn't clear enough on the point, then that would suggest that something more should be brought into policy. Uh, oh yeah, and I suppose the other side to that, again, it's in the supporting text, and my, my philosophy, if you want something to happen, it should be in policy. <laughs> the thing about the... That's what I was grappling with yeah, just now. Yeah. Um, that local, so you've got the, the, the mechanism, if you like, in place mm. now that maybe, you know, some discussion about how the funding might go, but mm. you've also got this thing, well, local plans might do something different. Again, is, is it enough or, to say that in RJ? Or there might be other mechanisms anyway. So... Mm. To me, it is because the, the the concept which is being captured in the policy is a concept of carbon emissions offsetting, um, and to be frank, over the life of this plan, the way in which you offset may well change anyway. And the supporting text is explaining where we are and what's emerging. You know, as well, whenever the supporting text was written a little while ago, um, so it's a bit of a moment in time explanation really as to where we are with offsetting. And that may well change. And so in my book, as long as the policy captures a concept, that's good enough. But as I say, if when you go away and reflect on this, you think that it's not clear enough, then that would suggest importing more into the policy rather than the other way around, obviously. Thank you. Um, anything to add? I was going to ask, obviously, the, the main the suggested modification about removing the uh, Part L reference. Anything to add to that you've already said? I think probably Nothing not. to add to that. I mean, oh. you know, the plan's doing enough. It doesn't really need to take on onto its shoulders doing things which are redundant. I'm not sure if it's in your mod schedule. I didn't spot it, but I might be wrong. But the um, Table 5.1, obviously on uh, page 85... <coughs> Um, Table 5.1, that's, that's, oh, I see, the one on page 85. Yes, that, that's got a column about part L. Um, so first question is, should that then be, is that, is that redundant if you're removing it from the policy? Are we looking at the same table, 5.1? I'm ever so sorry. Sorry, so. Uh, hot, sorry my, my mistake. Middle column, hot water energy demand. Oh, talks about 20% energy demand reduction compared to Part L 2013 and then 2025 upwards. It needs to be changed. So I think, yep. yeah. Absolutely, we missed that one. Yep. Okay, I've got no, some good, other points, points about so the uh, that table coming on, but I think they're more related to some mm. of the other criterion. Yeah. Um, having said that, well, again, it's one of those things where... The policy says the same thing twice. So you've got um, under 8A3, utilise renewable energy. That's part of the energy hierarchy. You've obviously got a target. You're referring paragraph 5.14 and the table is these are targets. Uh, and then, sorry, I'm jumping around, but in paragraph 8D, which we'll come on to, you talk about... Um, delivery of on-site renewable energy generation. I'm assuming these references are supposed to refer back to, or your intention is that they refer back to this this table as, and that these are targets you wish to adhere to under those things. But of course, the policy doesn't make that clear. So it's a similar point to the discussion we had a few moments ago. And um, yes, in this case, I think it probably would help the reader of the policy and make it it would help for, for there to be an explicit cross-reference. But then the table that's cross-referred to needs to be up to date, as I've obviously um, conceded a few moments ago. I'll perhaps leave the question over the justification viability for those targets when we get on to criterion 8D, because I think it's where they probably factor themselves in a bit more. Hopefully it will become clear when I get there. But I want to talk about EV charging next. Yes. All right. So, yes, thank you. Let's... let's uh, which is 8B. Um, so, Criterion 8B refers to um, the incorporation of adequate electrical electric vehicle charging points. Mm, yeah. It's a future-proof for like and long-term demand. Um, obviously, this is now set in the context of the new Part S 
of the building regulations, mm -hmm. which sets out requirements for residential and non-residential EV charging points. Um, got a few things about your to unpick from your written statement. Um, now I know that the councils see the reference to adequate being more than just about the number, but nonetheless I do want to start with the number. Um, so in terms of the number of charging points you're expecting developers to provide, just to be clear, are you necessarily expecting them to provide something different to what's set out in Part S? In terms of numbers, I'll just, who's, who's in charge of this? <laughs> Someone behind us. TFGM, so just give us a few moments, sir. We just need to shuffle someone in and out of the seats. Good, good morning. Richard Clues from Transport for Greater Manchester, representing GMCA. Um, and so the question was new merit. Um, I, I think we're really suggesting that that's a, something that local plans should consider. <coughs> okay. That's not what, again, I'm, I'm going to be quite the pedant about this. It's not what the policy says. The policy says developers, will, you know, with, development will incorporate adequate electric vehicle charges. It doesn't say anything about the numbers to be determined through local plans. Is that, is that the policy that you, you want to adopt? So as, as I understand it at the moment, um, the use of the word, one head upon time again, adequate, what does it mean? We've sought to explain it in this further supplementary supporting text, which we published a little while ago, some while ago, and it's really related to qualitative points as opposed to um, quantitative points so how many and I think the position would be at the moment assuming PFE is adopted with the word adequate in it numerically the building regs would tell you what to do um, and this policy wouldn't tell you to do anything else numerically um, future local plans might have another tilt at this this is the short answer or the point put shortly um, you will then say back to me perfectly sensibly well is it clear enough on the point um, we'll await your report on that, but that's that's the concept. So it would be numerically, in in, in lieu of anything in a local plan, building regs you're down. You're down to the building regs, that's right. And then, um, and as a supporting text, the new, when I say new, this is as published before the hearings, you know, the new supporting text um, seeks to address, having said, building rates are limited in scope to the number of EV charge points. The supporting text, the additional supporting text, goes on to explain the qualitative points that we are seeking to address um, through this word adequate. <clears throat> okay. Because obviously the word adequate is a word which embraces both quantitative and qualitative it, matters. It, it does. Um, yeah. uh, uh, yes, I'll, I'll, we'll have to consider that, whether it's clear or not, obviously, as we know. No, it's certainly, absolutely. That, that's the intention anyway. I mean, the word adequate. So we need an adequate number of people to turn up at a session to discuss this point. We've got 10 people. That's an adequate number. Do they know anything about what we're talking about that day? Well, no, they don't. So qualitatively, we've fallen short. So the word adequate addresses both numbers and qualitative issues. So... Um, that's that's where it's the way it's used. Um, again, okay. You'll Thank tell you. us in due course whether yes, it's okay. necessary to use a different word <laughs> to make it clear. Yeah. So you've looked, and in terms of the quality of factors, you've picked up on a few things like design and highway safety, amongst other things. Um, are they are these not things which are already picked up through through other parts of the plan? And so, and perhaps more clearly, not not specific. I mean, it might be that it doesn't specifically say EV charging points. I mean, it might obviously, in terms of if something is of you know, unacceptable design because the EV charging points are in the wrong place or the wrong type or the wrong height, does that all flow from that main policy? Um, 
I think in some instances you would you could perfectly legitimately say well somewhere else in this plan picks up some of these issues, but as I understand it, and I'll I'll leave those who know about this on the ground so this beats us to 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 help you with this if you need some further help. But as I understand it, in practical terms, the Greater Manchester authorities have encountered all sorts of issues that you would think. Who on earth would ever do something like that? And the answer is they do try and do all sorts of things like that. And so that's why we're making these, you might think some of these points, the statements of the blessed obvious, but that's why we're stating some of these things in this supporting text, because we have encountered real practical issues about what people wish to do with EV charging points, um, some of which defy common sense. But that's why we've got this set out here. Okay. You couldn't, make, you couldn't make it up, to be quite frank. <laughs> right. Just on the point about um, in your written statement, I think at 6.50, you refer to requiring new non-residential development to incorporate charging points beyond the requirements identified in the building regs, as they will future-proof these developments for the likely long term. So does that contradict what you've just told me about deferring to building regs? It uh, was that in 6.50? Yes, yeah. As opposed to the supporting text that we suggest. I think the wording. The answer to your question is a straightforward yes, it, it would. So, we, I, you know, I refer to the supporting text. And if there's something in the supporting text which is unclear, then that would need to be changed. But I've explained the position as I okay. understand it, sir. So, the matter statement. Um, the matter statement seems to go, does seem to go beyond what we've suggested in the supporting text. I think if I've missed something, then it will be drawn to my attention, okay, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, right, OK, so my, so my understanding, just for sake, just so I can go away and think about this, the, the policy is we mean ad adequate means building regulations up until such point as local plans reconsider the issue. Have another two and, but in... in quality to these are the things that we think yeah. are important when, when, when we're considering mm. an application to incorporate these items these are the things we'll be thinking about um yes and that's set out in your revised um supporting text, supporting text. Okay. that's my understanding sir okay I'll tackle um, this with the team adequacy is meant to address these practical issues that greater manchester authorities have encountered on the ground and so it was seen to be sensible to have some explanation of that in the supporting text. Um, if the supporting text isn't, isn't, isn't up to scratch, then you'll tell us in due course, but that's the intention. Okay. Do you have anything to add to that? No. No, okay, that's good. Um, okay, um, I've exhausted myself on EV charging points for now, while it comes up again in another policy. Um, Criterion 8C talks about renewable energy, heating, cooling networks. Um, my again is this a signpost primarily to JPS three? So it doesn't so perhaps if on those issues, we may as well just pick those up under JPS three. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's right. So sorry, yeah. I should have my microphone on. Yes, is the answer to your question. So I'll perhaps come back to that, and obviously, if there's anything comes out of that that relates to S two, we can uh, deal with it. We can refer back. Um, so eight D. Renewable energy, um, so we talk about achieve energy demand reductions for residential development in terms of space, heat, demand, hot water energy demand, and delivery of on-site renewable energy generation. Um, as a statement of intent, that's, I, I don't know, somebody might tell me it was controversial, but it, it doesn't appear to be. Yes. But the, the issue then comes back to what, we were talking, what I was talking about a minute ago, which is about the relationship with Table 5.1 and the targets for... Um, folks, sorry, in this regard, it would be the targets photovoltaic installation of 20% ground floor space and up to 2025 and then 2025 upwards 40%. Is that, that that's what you're, that's there's, a, there's a link there between that's D and That's my understanding, but the link is, needs to be made, I think, explicitly rather than. So I think yeah. inevitably I'm going to just ask the question, obviously, about where those thresholds and targets come from and, and are they justified? The, as in the table, you mean? Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 20 right. and 40%. To my left. Uh, yes, apologies. We'll have to do a bit of uh, seat swapping again. Um, <laughs> so if we bring a colleague in from Corrie and Brown, that's okay. Corrie's back, isn't right. I think these policies cover so many points, so you can see that. You know, I'd happily give up my seat for the rest of the day. 
happily. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, yes. I think someone's got a tag on my ankle, so I can't do that. Okay, yeah, so we're in the business of understanding where those numbers have come from and are they justified in principle? So the, the, the numbers in table 5.1 have come from a study undertaken by Karen Brown where we looked at how the how new new development and I think we looked at six different types of development uh, different housing types and flat types could reduce their energy consumption and associated carbon emissions and what the costs of doing that would be and what the impacts would be on the approach to construction and um, running costs for, for households. And the standards that have been proposed combine what we felt were both practical and achievable standards. Uh, so the standards up until 2025 are based around um, natural ventilation and continuing current construction practices with some uh, improvements on the 2013 Partel regulations which were in place at the time and incorporation of wastewater heat recovery systems to reduce hot water demand and the addition of photovoltaics to reduce carbon emissions and running costs. Now, subsequently, the introduction of the Partel 2021 standard actually incorporates a large proportion of the elements that are in that uh, first set of the table. Um, it's not directly aligned, but substantively equivalent and incorporates wastewater heat recovery and actually incorporates a larger proportion of photovoltaics in the notional building specification for Part L 2021 than we've included here at 40% of the ground floor area rather than 20%. The standards set for 2025 onwards are based around the recommendations that were in place at the time given to government by the Climate Change Committee on the proposed content of the Future Home Standard with the addition of uh, wastewater heat recovery and photovoltaics. And uh, the aim uh, for that element of the standard was to uh, adopt low carbon heating systems, be very energy efficient, reduce costs to residents and overall demand on energy supply within the region and on local transmission grids. Um, and then also to do that both through fabric and reducing hot water demand, which would be the, the, the largest source of energy demand in the homes once you've got a very high performing fabric standard. And then the inclu inclusion of photovoltaics would um, reduce running costs to residents, help provide a, additional energy security and uh, further reduce carbon emissions. So um, those standards were developed based around, as I say, the, the Future Homes Standard recommendations from the Committee on Climate Change and were costed for a range of different housing types uh, to assess uh, the implications on development costs. Thank you. Just to go back to that first bit about, about building regulations. So if, if I understood you correctly, the, the, the new Part L would cover everything that's in this table then? It and would cover for the period 2021 to 2025. Um, I'd say there there might be some slight variations, but they would be very minor. Uh, and the the main difference being that for the the Partel standard gives you a fair amount of flexibility as to how compliance is achieved. The the notional building specification, which is what government specify as being the. Um, uh, not preferred, an illustrative compliance approach is based around an improvement on the energy efficiency of the Partel 20, 20, 2013 standard, which we incorporated, the introduction of wastewater heat recovery, which again was incorporated in that 21 to 25 element of the table, and then 40% of the ground floor area being uh, devoted to PV. Uh, we said 20%, so it's actually that the new regulations are higher in that respect. So in that in that respect, having that in the policy now would be unhelpful. Yeah, the table needs the te the table needs to be updated as mentioned earlier. Yeah, because even in terms of photo photovoltaics, it's um, needs to be updated because where the building regulations have overtaken the table. 
in some instances we've second guessed what's coming sort of quite well and in other instances we've we've undershot in, and in terms of future home standards 2025 you're expecting you would expect so you've got building regulations now which i think has been considered an interim hasn't it an interim position up to sorry the new building regs like to do some of what's expected in future home standard and then yes. future home standards expected i know it's all expected to come in so if <clears throat> development were required to would you need the 2025 onwards targets, I guess, if, if the future home standard is going to be in place anyway? Um, I'd it's a, um, hesitate slightly because um, I've, I've been in a similar position talking about the 2016 building regulation standards, which obviously never actually came into force. And we've no, no, uh, there's nothing to suggest that these changes in the future home standard won't come into force, but until they are in force, then obviously we don't know that that is the case. So if we wanted to, to secure those those changes, then, then they would need to be specified. Um, but the, the proposals are broadly in line with, uh, in terms of the energy efficiency standards, uh, with the Committee on Climate Change as recommendations for the future home standard. Obviously, government needs to review those and determine their own view on whether those are appropriate. And then the wastewater heat recovery and photovoltaics are consistent with those in the current building regulations, as you say, the interim standard. Um, again, there's nothing to s determine specifically those would be retained in any future changes to the future home standard, but they are currently in place. Thank you very much. Um, I think you've proposed, just in terms of um, paragraphs 5.14 and I think criterion D, and you're making it explicit that all these are to do with residential development. Is that right, I think? Um, and so my only question or point, I suppose, for non-residential, are you, you content that all of these factors are picked up through Criterion AT about BRIAM, outstanding equivalent for, and so yeah, BRIAM excellent, um, and rising to BRIAM at standing, so you, you, that's, that covers all eventualities for commercial, that then. So I, I, you're not losing anything by that's referring to residential for AD and table. That's how we've sought to address it through yeah. BRIAM, yes. Thank you. I don't know I'm going to sleep tonight. What to think about. Um, I'm going to talk, move on then. I'm not got anything specific about 8, E and F or the last paragraph at the moment. I think they're, they're what they are at the moment. So we'll talk some about viability about this. Um, the written statement appears to confirm that the full potential costs associated with the policy were not factored into the whole plan viability assessment. Is that is that the case? Yes, yeah, so basically on viability, sir, as I understand it, I mean, sorry, are we back to 8A now or what are we? What are so, we well, yeah. 8A seems to be the main area where yeah, it comes exactly, in, but yeah, yeah. Any, any aspect of the policy really. Oh, well, it's 8A, but there are aspects of 8D as well that come into it, I think. Um, it's going to be some and some, to be yeah. to be honest, across the board. So there's an antidote to this, which I which I'm going to come to in a few moments' time. But as if we take 8A as I don't know a proxy for the wider discussion and an introduction to the point which I'm going to make about viability, um, in relation to 8A, um, what was viability tested and you know published, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the work that's been done was the interim requirement point, which, as you know, has now been overtaken by building regs anyway, um, and the broader net zero carbon from 2028, you know, apart from that interim requirement, is not in the published viability work because it was seen that there were significant uncertainties in relation to, you know, what exactly are you testing and how exactly do you go about it? That's my understanding of the position. And then as you journey your way through the policy, you'll find in some instances, you know, certain aspects have been explicitly viability tested in the work that's been published and some haven't. Um, and there are, um, there's an obvious point which arises really, which is in given those circumstances, you know, what is the, what it, what would be an appropriate way of taking this point forward and it seems it seems to to us on reflection that 
the opening words of item eight, an expectation that new development will, and then we have this whole tranche of points that we've been discussing, um, should have a, um, a subject to viability provision. Um, because, you know, some of, some of the viability matters are known at this stage and they've been tested. Obviously, there are other people who say, well, what you've tested isn't right, etc., etc. You should have tested different costs or whatever it might be. But we've, you know, there are some things that we have tested, whether we, you know, everyone around the room would agree. Well, I, I don't think I've ever come across that in a viability case anyway. But, you know, we've done something, if you like. Um, but there are other aspects that we haven't, which isn't in the published viability work because of uncertainties in the field of what exactly it is that you're testing. And that gives rise to a pretty obvious point, really, which is, well, the, the, the way to address that is to have some subject to viability aspects in those opening words of item 8. So that you are saying to developers, to the extent that these points bear upon your application, um, and you consider that they, they um, present viability challenges, then you would document that and will assess it, or the decision makers will assess it. So I, that's why I wanted to park viability until this little box, if you like, because um, otherwise it would have been, I think, very confusing. So that's, that's how I would suggest this matter is dealt with. Um, do I think this is which side of the line? Do I think this is on? I, I do actually think this is a soundness point myself. Yeah. Thank you. So in terms of, of taking that potential suggested modification yes. on board, yeah. um, Obviously, paragraph 34 um, of the framework talks about mm. policies not undermining the deliverability of the plan. Absolutely. Paragraph 58 talks mm. about, you know, there's assumption development is viable if it's in relation to an update plan. Um, so no expectation of a viability assessment, yeah. other than this, of course, somebody wishes, wishes to say they, it's not viable and, and demonstrate. So yeah. like, taking this approach of, if you like, subject to viability, mm. is there any conflict there or, or tension between that and these paragraphs? I think there, to, be, to be quite straightforward about this, there are, there are real practical issues in terms of, you know, even if you were set, set about viability testing at plan making stage in relation to items like this, you, as I've said earlier on, you get people saying, well, okay, but you've got the wrong costs or you haven't looked at this properly or you've done that the wrong way. So there's a whole debate about, even if you try and do it, there's a whole debate about how you've done it. Um, and in certain areas, it is just, it's in the box marked, I don't know about impossible, but it's certainly in the box marked very difficult at this stage. And so the sensible thing to do, and I would say the sound thing to do, is to have a general subject to viability provision. Um, because these are our expectations, our aspirations, our ambitions, but obviously if they, on any particular development project, they can't viably be achieved, then... Well, it'd be pretty nonsensical, wouldn't it, to say to somebody, we've well, got to do this even though it means that we don't get the homes that we want or we don't get the businesses or whatever it is that we want. So um, that's that's the way, I, in my book, it needs to be addressed. In our book, it needs to be addressed. Um, there's nothing wrong with a plan having ambitions, aspirations and expectations. Um, yes, it tests what it can test. If there are difficulties in testing, then you know, put your cards face up on the table. There are difficulties in testing certain aspects of this. How on earth do you make sense of it all? Will you make sense of it all by having a subject to viability proviso at the outset? Okay, thank you. So that's, I think um, I that short, short cuts a lot of my questions about what we know, what we don't know about the cost. Your, your point is there's some uncertainties and we, therefore we know you a bit. wish to defer. Some, some stuff that we know quite a bit about. There's a lot that we don't know much about. I'm very happy to, you know, have the viability person, if you like, sort of explain what's been done and what hasn't been done. But I mean, we, that's we may well see if that's necessary once we hear what yeah. people have to say. That's the um, top and they might, well, everyone might be very happy with that approach, and we don't have to talk about it. Well, so far, where I've sought to move things on and sort of concede various points, and you know, apart from um, with one or two notable exceptions, it doesn't seem to have been much gracious recognition of, of, <laughs> of the acknowledgements <laughs> on, my, on my part of issues which need to be addressed. But maybe the mood music would change. So. Okay. Right. I have no further questions about this policy at the moment. I'm assuming from what you've all heard over the last hour and a half, everyone's very happy and we can move on. Uh, but otherwise, I will open it up to any any points. Um, 
thus far the only sign that's up is the HBF, so, and it's been up for quite some time. So I'll defer to um, ask, uh, ask for your comments on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Well, we covered a lot of ground uh, in this policy. Um, uh, and and can, I just, can I just get clarification about the status of criteria five, six, and seven? Uh, because I, I was kind of unsure about uh, uh, which way they were facing, whether they faced towards the applicant or whether they faced towards the local authorities producing, supporting local plans. And um, I, I can't remember what uh, um, Chris Kukowski said, whether those would come out of the plan now or whether the plan would be amended to make it clear that those are there to direct plan making. Happy to uh, do what, shall I do that? Uh, well, yeah, fair um, yes, it seems so long ago now, doesn't it? Um, but um, five, five had gone anyway before we got to the hearing session, so that was deleted in a suggested main modification made at an earlier stage. Seven, we now suggest, should be deleted in its entirety as well because it is OTOs. So if in due course the inspectors agree, obviously if they do, then you know if the plan is as we would want it to be, this policy would not have five or seven in it. I think you mentioned six as well. Six is still there and it's a to be to be frank, it's a policy it's an aspect, it's a criterion or an element of the policy which is really just signposting that there are other policies in the plan which deal in detail with each of those items and doubtless will come to each of those policies in due course. So six remains which way is it facing? Well, actually, it's, it's, it's asking you, in effect, to turn the pages to find the policies that deal with the particular points. Thank you. Is there anything you wanted to come back on that? Um, yeah, I, I, I think six, it probably... Um, I mean, the point that I made in my representations and my statement was that it's hard for an applicant to comply with something uh, such as na nature-based networks uh, um, if they haven't actually been identified and made operational in supporting local plans. Um, and it's quite hard for an applicant, therefore, to discharge that policy requirement. Um, and I think the plan needs to be clearer in that respect. Okay, thank you. Can I move on to criteria eight? Yes. And a. Yeah. yeah. So, so dealing with Part A at the moment, uh, very much welcome uh, the changes proposed by the GMCA, uh, the reading of which is, I think, changed to read an expectation that new development will work toward. I work think. towards. Yeah, I was just <laughs> I was looking for the words. Work towards uh, being net zero carbon from 2028. I think that's a, that's a, an important and welcome change. Uh, not least because of the evidence that you've heard from lots of participants, particularly on this side of the table. One third of the housing land supply is currently uh, unviable. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, the fact that the industry is already committing through the building regulations to deliver a 31% improvement on Part L uh, 2013, which is a substantial uh, improvement in uh, energy performance, um, and you've got to view that within the context of how many new homes are actually being built across Greater Manchester compared to uh, uh, the existing uh, leaky uh, building stock, which the Curry and Brown uh, report documents. Uh, you know, they'll be making a very small new house building, be making a very small contribution. So the 31% improvement is is already quite a uh, uh, an important uplift. The HBF uh, through the Future Homes Hub, which we've established has got agreement with three government departments, with the RTPI, with the RSPB and other agencies uh, that we uh, will commit to aiming uh, to deliver uh, net zero carbon homes uh, by the 2050 uh, date. That might seem a long way in the future, but the reason for that, uh, um, uh, that careful, being quite careful about committing to an actual date is because of the need for supply chains to catch up, for skills to be there, all the issues which the Curry and Brown report uh, document, you know, there is a major shortage of uh, heat pump fitters at the moment. I think there are only about 10,000 out, out in the country. 
you would need to increase, increase that sort of something like fourfold if you were to kind of get near to supporting the government's uh, uh, new homes uh, requirement a year, if there is, a, if there is going to be a target. Uh, but what we have committed to is high quality homes that are net zero carbon ready and sustainable by 2025 with early investigation of steps beyond those. That's the stepped programme towards net zero carbon homes, which the government will do in 2025 and again in 2030. But as an industry, we are reasonably confident that we can get to net zero carbon homes uh, by at some point in the 2030s, but we can't do it. Uh, it just physically isn't possible to do it by 2028. And that's why the change to the policy, I think, is so important. Otherwise, the council would have a, sorry, the GMCA would have a policy uh, that would potentially prevent it from imp implementing its own objectives. And that's a number of objectives across a, a, a wide array of areas, not just uh, environmental performance, uh, but also meeting uh, the housing needs of the conurbation. Which leads me on to, so, so we welcome that change, but it does lead me on to, to perhaps argue that, well, not perhaps, but, but argue that footnote 31 is probably redundant now. I think that probably needs to come out. I'm not really sure what the GMCCA is, is driving at with that. I think that was something that, that you kind of, unra um, kind of explored in your conversation. I think that's quite apparent. I think... That footnote is relating to the uh, regulated and unregulated energy use, but that's kind of superseded by the uh, changes to the building regulations. You know, I, I, I can understand why the GMCA might want to have a policy relating to unregulated energy use and whole life costing, but I think that's something to explore in uh, the second iteration of this plan uh, or possibly... Uh, that is something which will be overtaken uh, by the government's own changes uh, to, the build, to the building regulations, which we might see from 2025. Uh, so I'd suggest that paragraph, uh, footnote 31 needs to come out. Um, do you want me to leave electrical vehicle charging points and viability for the moment to allow other participants to come in? But I do want to say something about electrical vehicle charging points. Briefly. I think, first, let's get it all out there. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, so EV charging points. Uh, I, I think, um, I, uh, you know, I think it's. I, I, I don't think we need a policy in the places for everyone plan on this. I think you just default to the building regulations. Part S uh, um, requires, if I might summarise, rather than using the kind of strict building regulations and legal definition. And uh, uh, the GMCA might want to correct me on this, but the HBF's understanding is it requires one dwelling point, uh, um, sorry, one electrical vehicle charging point per dwelling if it has a car parking space. So it's not an electrical vehicle charging point per car parking space, uh, but you're allowed one electrical vehicle charging point if, you, if your dwelling uh, has a car. Uh, and the reason for that is that there are a lot of flats built which don't have um, uh, cars at all. Uh, so we, you'll be familiar, sir, from the London plan. London plan discourages the use of car parking spaces at all, uh, except in the outer uh, um, borough suburbs. So that's why um, part S of the building regulations is structured in such a way. Uh, so the, um, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority has intimated that it would like, uh, uh, it would like flexibility in the places of everyone plan to allow uh, uh, supporting local plans uh, to uh, specify something different. Um, I think that's a matter for you to reflect upon, but um, I, think, I, 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 think, I, I think we need to be adhering to the building regulations, I think is our point. Um, I, I, I would hope, I, I think it would be, wouldn't be constructive for the uh, GMCA to perhaps encourage um, other boroughs to set more demanding requirements for electrical vehicle charging points, particularly given the issues of viability and the issues of viability, especially in the northern um, boroughs. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that. <clears throat> yeah, I think we, the more we get out from it, then obviously the less chance there is of people repeating the point, he says. Uh, Barton Wilmore, please. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I had... Um, many points scribbled down about the um, 
the, the how difficult the policy is to read and and, uh, and what of those elements are meant to be development management policies what are supposed to be local plan policies and and what are designed to, to set out what the council are going to do as well as having detailed policy but sir, from your question I, th I think you've got those points and I, I won't repeat them but I, I don't want my silence on that to silence on that to be misconstrued as not thinking they're important as well sir but I, what I want to do really is boil down our fundamental problem with the the policy um and and, and i will oversimplify this perhaps uh, just to make, to make my point clear what what i can see from the the council's aim of being carbon neutral by 2038 is that it's trying to bring forward the government's target from 2050 uh, by four by 12 years now the government's targets in essence uh, seek to tell us um, how we're going to get our buildings built correctly so they don't waste energy um, and how they're going to be operated correctly so they don't waste energy um, by in, in increments up to 2038 and, and at which point the, the buildings will be um, constructed and operating in a, in a manner that's capable of being carbon neutral. The, the, so we, I don't really have any problem with buildings being ready by 2038 to be, but the, the difference in bringing the, uh, the what well, the council's seeking to do is bring forward the, the overall target of being neutral by 2050, by 12 years. That is achieved only by making the grid um, carbon neutral. And the council's own evidence base, or the GMCA's evidence base, um, makes that clear in the, the Curry Brown uh, report, the 040101 at page uh, 144. 136 and in its points 9.1 and 9.2 boils down that the key to to uh, even if you build the buildings correctly the key to having them carbon neutral is is in decarbonizing the grid um and what we've learned i think through these conversations sir is that there's the building regs are capable of getting the buildings to be built correct by 2038 in fact the, the, the a lot of the conversation today has shown how complicating it is to try and have planning policy preempting building regs and we've seen that building regs often does better than the council expected or, or there or thereabouts but that is a it's a constant that the development industry can rely on it knows when it's coming in knows to, to factor those costs as a brick to mortar cost into its construction by planning policy trying to preempt these things it creates a lot of complication and, and an individual expectation, perhaps, at each of the 10 boroughs that uh, volume house builders for, in particular are going to have to factor into how they build each house differently in a different place, which becomes untenable. So I think my point is that building regs gets us to the buildings being built properly in its own time and, and well enough. The gap that the council identifies of what do we do about the grid not being carbon neutral, um, it proposes to offset by exporting um, uh, carbon neutral energy and by payment and offsetting of, of carbon credits by payment of developers. Now though the cost of those two elements are the things that are entirely missing from the council's evidence base from, from what I can, can return I've, I've had to go through it um, now this uh, uh, it's not to quash the ambition of the council sir we uh, do the best we can by all means but this and, and have that in a corporate strategy but this is a development plan policy and the fundamental point of a development plan policy is that the council has to show that what it says it's trying to do is achievable and and it's sound and by that missing gap that it doesn't know what this offsetting or um or exporting costs the developer and then whether or not that is viable and, and i've got many points on the lack of clarity um in that viability work but i don't think it's necessary to go for it now sir it's just in my view as a whole it's missing uh, and without that i don't see that the council can um with any confidence say that it's a good idea to go for 2038 carbon neutral it, or do what you can to work towards it but it, it can't be it shouldn't be a development plan policy um if it's got no confidence that the industry can achieve it or that when local plans go to then turn that into a requirement that it can be met and and I, I would take you back sir to the, the points of the MPPF you've already referenced that there's an expectation the development plan policies are achievable um, without making development unviable. Thanks, sir. Can I just ask you a couple of questions then on that um, 
Firstly, on the offsetting point, um, is that a cost which is associated with every every house, every developer, or is that something that can only be determined on a case-by-case -case basis because whether or not you need to offset would be based on the, 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 the uh, nature of that proposal and how far, how far you've gone to net zero. Um, so is it something you could have fitted into that viability assessment? Uh, Oh, whether or not could, um, I think it speaks less to the quality of the development, but more where the grid is in terms of its decarbonisation. Now, if you were to, um, and, and I'm coming to the edge of my understanding of, of, of renewable technologies, sir, but if you were to uh, create a very, very highly performing uh, house that was, that, that um, and I know there's a, there's a lot of work going on to, to do that, um, you would still, it, this still runs a risk that you design a, that the best a house can be at the moment uh, off of Kevin McLeod's uh, grand designs, um, but that it still would be drawing carbon because of the way the electricity it uses comes. And I, you could factor that into a viability assessment, I'm sure, sir, but it's just not been at the moment. Thanks. And the point that um, the council have made about inserting this, you know, potential for me to consider uh, the potential line about subject to viability does that satisfy you in any way it it makes me slightly less nervous sir, that we're going to get completely stuck at a, uh, an application stage but it doesn't um solve the point the the viability of just building a really good and, and carbon efficient home um that that helps us in that regard sir but the the how viability has been factored into um, additional costs and bridging the gap between the, the way the country's energy is produced. It doesn't do anything for that, sir, because it it sets us up to fail in the first instance. Everyone would need a viability assessment. Um, and and we're solving a, a wider problem that's, that's not ours to solve. Thank you. Thank you, that's helpful. Sorry, uh, Litchfields. Thank you, sir. Um, the points that we're going to make probably just carry on from um, what was just discussed by Barton Wilmore in relation to viability. Obviously, acknowledge uh, the proposed insertion into the policy, but when we look at the PPG, obviously there's, there's been a, a, a shift in planning policy to move viability testing to plan making rather than a site by site, application by application basis. Um, as pointed out in the PPG, which says the role for viability assessments is primarily at the plan making stage. So I appreciate um, it was it was said across the table that it um, was a very difficult topic to to grapple with, but that shouldn't mean that it can be ignored while still retaining the policy aspirations within um, this policy. Um, the second point, then, just just um, a minor point relating to uh, EV charging points. Um, we heard this morning that they would be deferred back to the building regs, um, the, the quantum. Uh, but if we actually look at the main modification that's proposed, it says the provision of adequate electric vehicle charging points in new developments involve a number of considerations, point five being the number of charging points required to meet demand, both current and likely future demand. So I think there's an inconsistency there, um, and we'd request that point five is deleted from that um, modification. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um And sorry, I'll, st I'll stick to this side of the room for now because I suspect we're going to have a different tone and tenor of conversation. So, Turley's then. So, so just briefly, we put in um, submissions uh, which sought to remove the reference to net zero carbon. And that was in the context of um, this point about how achievable that actually is when you look at the whole process. However, um, to be clear, that was really based on a concern about viability. So we would reinforce and emphasize that, and, and um, we request a, a modification where it begins an expectation, or whatever the new wording is now. It, we're, I think we're all going to benefit from catching up with the, 
what's changed version of this, but it, just to be constructive and expectation that where deliverable and viable new development will. So that's that's how, where we sit. And that means everybody's sharing that ambition, but it's got to be it's got to be viable. And the 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 way I think it works, if it, if I can just take up on Bolton Wilmore's point, is it's recognised that the the houses are not going to be net zero, not for a long time, um, completely. So there's the offsetting. Manchester's got an an ambitious and um, admirable plan for looking at that and doing it on a strategic basis to be welcomed, but that will come at a price. And we don't, net yet, we don't yet know what the price is of buying into that offsetting. Now, that's not a problem at all, provided we have this reference to viability. And to, to make clear, just for the avoidance of doubt, um, Peel has a house building arm. That house building arm is called Northstone. Northstone has been for a number of years investigating very um, low carbon properties and they're funding research um, at the University of Salford into that. They're not alone. Barrett have been using that research facility as well. So there's a lot of very positive work going on in respect of this um, and there's obvious benefits. You know, it's easier to sell a house, particularly right now, if it's got a very... Um, energy efficient approach so everybody's in favor of this i don't think anybody's uh, arguing against it it's just looking at what the financial cost at the bottom line would be okay so you're you're content with the suggestion put forward by the councils about inserting the line subject viability yeah absolutely absolutely we think that's very sensible completely agree and please note we are not suggesting you delete net zero carbon anymore um we're we're, we're happy to be content with that we had suggested low carbon dwellings, and subject to that, we you know, uh, we'd not be the only ones in the room who could sometimes put things better uh, with hindsight, and um, we, we perhaps should have just made that clear. So we, we fully support what the council, what the G GMCA is saying. Okay, thank you. Um, <coughs> that, uh, legacy, thank you. Would you like to come back on that first before I, I set up a whole different just your patience is appreciated. Thank you. I'll just let the council come back on those points first. Thank you. If I may, because as you say, I suspect we have points of a different nature coming from the further down the table on this side of the room. So just very briefly, when I think an insertion, of, as has been very fairly recognised by my learned friend, uh, an insertion of reference to subject of viability at the beginning, you know, the very beginning of item eight, therefore capturing all of the items in item eight, including the net zero carbon from 2028, et cetera, et cetera, unlocks a number of the points which have been made. So, um, so I think that is the key, to be quite frank. That's the point of substance in all of this. Um, I appreciate the point that's been made by Litchfields that there's an expectation, if you like, or in the PPG that viability matters should be assessed through plan making. I fully understand that and it's, it's, some of it is, is very difficult to do and I think the antidote is to, is to have the reference to subject to viability um, so that we don't force things on people that just can't be done viably um, or don't risk forcing things on people that can't viably be done. Um, just then a very few miscellaneous points in a moving away from viability issues. Um, the HBF referred to item six of S2. I mean, I think I would just simply say it's doing no more, no, no less than flagging up these points are points which are part of this overall strategy. If you want to understand exactly what each of them entails, for example, for a planning application, you look elsewhere in the plan. I, I can't make my answer any better than that, <laughs> to be quite frank. That's the position. Um, so if that's, if that's um, seen to be something which is um, unsound, well, doubtless will tell us that, but that's that's what that item is doing. It's not doing anything new, if you like, or by way of imposing anything or trying to impose anything. It's a signpost. Um, I, I reference was made to whether the footnote is now um, redundant, footnote 31, um, in the light of the wider discussion we've had. I mean, I, as I said earlier on, I, th I think this this whole aspect of the chronology of what's expected when, which actually comes back to the table rather than more aptly than the footnote, I mean, needs to be taken away and thought about. And 
I wouldn't be at all surprised if you tell us to take it away and think about it. Um, it needs to be it needs to be made clearer, frankly, and the table needs to be adjusted anyway, as has already been said. On the EV points, I'm grateful to um, to Lichwells for pointing out something that in my word blindness looking at the page I hadn't spotted which is an item in the memorandum that refers to quantitative points as I said earlier on that shouldn't be there so that needs to come out and as for the whole idea of having some reference to adequate EV charging points beyond the quantitative issue where we're relying on building regs um, there are as I understand it as my instructions go there are some very real practical you couldn't make it up points about what people seek to do with these EV points when they're so that's why it was seen to be a good opportunity in this plan to address some of that in, in the supporting text um, as, as you've seen so again that's that's the top and bottom of the position it's to address some very real practical issues that I'm sure none of those around this table would be in any way engaged in but there have been a whole series of practical practical problems shall we say thank you sir thank you very much um okay so we'll move on to this side i'll start um I'll start at the end and come back so um ancestor friends of the earth please thank you um obviously they've covered a lot of ground here so um, i'm going to try and cover as many points as possible uh, in as short a time as possible um on the 2038 target um i guess the question here is um, is that in line with national policy? And I think it's clear from reading the Climate Change Act that the target isn't just about zero carbon by 2050, but at least 100% lower in 2050 than 1990 baseline. That suggests that hitting zero carbon before 2050 is absolutely in line with national policy. And not only that, it's recognised that different parts of the country have different capacities to reduce emissions. And so... It's very clear that in an in a urban area like Greater Manchester, where there's predominantly um, you know, built environment, where there's opportunities for reducing carbon, um, there's a chance for Greater Manchester to, to go faster, whereas other areas potentially have more difficult challenges, especially rural areas around things like transport. So it's absolutely uh, reasonable and in line with national policy to suggest that certain areas go faster than others. Um, so on both those grounds, absolutely, the 2038 target is in line with national policy. Um, so bearing that in mind, then, we need to consider the other uh, items that have been covered. So to meet the 2038 target, um, that isn't just about when we hit zero carbon, but also about the pathway to reach 2038. Um, and you know, looking at Greater Manchester, for example, if we say emissions currently are around 12 million tonnes by 2038, or sorry, by 2028, there'll be 2 million tonnes is, is, is the pathway we need to meet. So if we're going to achieve that, then absolutely we have to um, deliver new developments that are zero carbon by 2028, if not sooner. So the 2028 date is, is critically important to achieve that pathway. Um, if we're looking at building tens of thousands of new homes from 2028 onwards that aren't zero carbon, that's going to be increasing carbon emissions at a time when we need to be reducing them further and faster. So that is totally against the plan uh, that Greater Manchester has and against the national policy to achieve, achieve zero carbon in the time frames that we need to. It's also, I mean, frankly, economically illiterate to build homes in 20, 2028 that need retrofitting and work done within the next 10 years to make them zero carbon by 2038. So um, that feels like it's a nonsensical approach to development. Um, and in terms of the wording, um, the, the proposed change that's come out today around working towards zero carbon, it's a bit like saying smoking 40 a day today. Um, I want to be uh, stopping smoking by 20, 2038, but actually, if I work towards that, I might be 39 a day by 2038. That's working towards it, and that's getting us nowhere near where we need to be. So working towards is far too weak a wording uh, and completely contradicts the policies that we're aiming to achieve in Greater Manchester. And just as a comparison, um, if we can't, if you feel that it's not unacceptable to retain the current wording of being um, zero carbon by 2028, then um, we know the London plan has an expectation on developers to achieve as close to zero carbon as possible right now. So that should be the absolute minimum that we should be achieving, uh, aiming to achieve within the, um, uh, the Places for Everyone strategy. Um, on the question of viability, I'll come back to viability. Uh, I missed out the fossil fuels. So 
there's a question on item four about keeping fossil fuels in the ground. Um, so the current carbon budgets that we've set in Greater Manchester in line with the Tyndall Centre's recommendations um, do not allow for fugitive emissions from fossil fuel extraction. So that will be additional emissions which aren't currently catered for or need further reductions elsewhere, um, such as from housing. Um, so if we were to proceed with uh, fossil fuel extraction, that again contradicts those policies. Um, looking at NPPF, um, again, I'm not an expert in planning, as you may gather, but N NPPF paragraph 209 does suggest that part of minerals policy is to secure long-term conservation of minerals. So it does feel that keeping fossil fuels in the ground does secure their long-term conservation and enables us potentially to use them in the future when we have technologies that don't release further carbon emissions into the atmosphere and don't contradict our policies to reach net zero or zero carbon indeed. Um, equally, um, looking at the minerals plan that was um, developed back in 2013 and things have moved on since then. So again, I'm not sure how these processes work, but it feels very clear to me that we should be developing policy now um, in light of where things are rather than relying on policy that's been developed or, you know, almost 10 years ago now. So um, even if the minerals plan does uh, doesn't have a strong wording on keeping fossils in the ground, things have moved on since then, and we should, so, so we should look to retain that wording. And finally on that, uh, there's a very strong public mandate for, for this policy of keeping fossils in the ground. And indeed, Andy Burnham, the mayor, was elected twice on that uh, policy mandate. So it's very clear, both political and public mandate for that to stay in, in the plan. I just want to finish on viability. Um, so I'm rather bemused by the comments um, across the room about the fact that it's you know, not possible to achieve these targets by 2028 and that uh, we might be able to make it by 2050 if we're lucky. That all just feels rather strange given that we're de 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 delivering zero carbon homes right now. So I'm not quite sure what the problem is from the colleagues across the room other than you know, wanting to maintain the profit margins. And to me, to me it comes down to we can do this now we should be doing it sooner than 2028. We should be doing it immediately because we're in an emergency. But 2028 is, you know, the, the backstop where, you know, we shouldn't go beyond that. And this is about balancing um, the question of viability. Is it about the viability of developers' profit margins or is it the viability of human life on this planet? And that's your choice to decide where the viability sits. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank um, you. Wildlife Trust, I think, is the next, next on the table. So. Uh, thanks, sir. Um, so it's the position of the Wildlife Trust that climate change is one of the greatest threats currently faced by biodiversity. Um, and that's why we, as an organisation, strongly support um, the national transition to net zero and also welcome the GMCA's ambition to become carbon neutral by 2038 in principle. Um, we're not making these comments in the hope that policy wording around the target is watered down or um, removed from the plan. Um, however, as we've raised in our Regulation 19 comments, we do have some concerns about um, whether the proposed development of a significant area of lowland peat across Greater Manchester has yeah, been a consideration. I, before you go there, you remember my first comment that we're not talking about the the effects of other parts of the plan uh, well, obviously when we get to some of the allocations which affect this the the point will no doubt be made so that allocation is inconsistent with policy jps2 yes yeah. but so that's what we're, it's about I, I what's suppose, in this policy is yeah something. i guess the point is that if the target isn't justified or based on proportionate evidence then is the policy justified or based on proportionate evidence that's your point then about evidence i don't want to get in you know so make okay. that point yeah, I mean, if that's if that's it, then I suppose that's the point. Yeah. So, what do you want to see? So, your point being, so the 2038 target isn't based on justified evidence. Is your position? Yes. What would what would make it sound then in your position? What are you what are you after? Well, I just think further consideration of the impacts of the developments proposed in places for everyone, um, in particular, the allocations that are going to be located on lowland peat, but any other development that comes out of it that might result in um, carbon emissions as a result of land use change, essentially. Thank you. Uh, Steady State Manchester. Thank you. 
um, yes, well, we, we, we do fully support the, um, the, the goal of being carbon uh, neutral by 2038. Um, and note that it's consistent with the Paris agree Agreement to which the UK is a signatory. It's the quantity of emissions which are cumulative, which is the critical point here. The 2038 date for the Greater Manchester is based on a series of five-year carbon budgets that are needed as the minimum effort needed to stay within two degrees, um, with a 60% chance of doing that. Delaying their reduction would increase the cumulative impact and exceeds our scientifically derived fair share. Now, carbon neutrality is def defined in the five-year environment plan. For our city region to be carbon neutral by 2038 and meet carbon budgets that comply with international commitments. And the Tyndall report, upon which it is based, um, or which rather underpins the plan, defines carbon neutrality in 2038 as no more than 0.6 megatons of carbon dioxide. That's just 3% of 1990 levels by that target date of 2038. So I would suggest a footnote that actually puts the de the, that, that definition based on those two documents into the plan, so it's clear exactly what we're talking about here. Now, moving on then to the change of wording on Criterion 8, I'm not sure that's needed because an expectation is itself no more than expectation. <laughs> you may expect something, it may not necessarily occur. So the working towards seems to be a redundant kind of change to me. Now, we do object to what would appear to be, though, a weakening of the, the target, and I won't reiterate the points by friends, made by Friends of the Earth. Um, and, of course, it will, delaying, will increase costs, not to developers, but to occupiers who will then have to retrofit. Moving on to um, footnote 31, um, I'm really grateful to Mr McTavish from Curry and Brown for the clarification there um, in terms of the three elements on the, 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 um, that, that he sort of clarified. I would suggest that that um, amended time scale uh, with, with the targets and the, the elements that correspond in, in other words, the operational energy, the unregulated emissions, and the construction or embodied emissions, that is put into the fit footnotes. Of the, the, essentially, what you're talking about here is clarified because I do I think maybe something got maybe lost in translation between the Curry and Brown report um, a, a, and the, the plan itself. Um, and I really welcome that, um, which I hadn't fully understood that the 2028 um, date talks about embodied uh, emissions. I mean, that, that, that is absolutely essential because uh, they're the major part of the problem. Um, going on to offsetting, um, Tyndall specifically advises against it in, in their carbon budget report um, on page seven. Um, now, the, and the carbon and energy implementation Plan Part 2, the Curry and Brown report, um, says that residual emissions need to be in carbon sinks and the emissions offset by 2028. Sorry, 2038. So that all has to happen within the plan. So there's quite a, a, a strong kind of requirement on just what those offsets are. Um, and I think, again, it's disappointing that the plan doesn't make this clear. Um, then finally, on viability, I would question whether the subject to viability assessment amendment um, actually adds anything, because the MPPF covers the role of viability assessments very clearly. Um, now, just on viability, I'd note that four years ago, the additional construction costs for um, the highest standard, the, 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 the net zero standard, were, were no more than 6% above the, the, the standard building costs. And we know that as supply chains are maturing, those costs are, are decreasing. They've continued, they, they decreased 
um, over time for the higher um, carbon efficiency of buildings. And actually, the policy of Greater Manchester to encourage developers very strongly, um, maybe encourage is, is too weak a word, um, will help to ensure that those supply chains do uh, be become more mature and more capable of delivering net zero carbon at um, an equivalent cost to uh, what, 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 what development uh, of lower standard currently costs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and CPRE, finally. Yeah, thank you. Um, a lot of the points have um, been covered by Friends of the Earth and Steady State in that use of words like working towards we see as being a dilution of the way the policy is currently written. Um, it is right in planning policy that decision takers are given the ability to understand the carbon and energy impacts of developments in order to understand whether a development should be refused or approved. So it's important that the policy overall ensures that there's a the connection between those two things. So I don't think you can just rely on building regulations alone. There needs to be... JPS2 is purposely ambitious, um, and it's important in terms of the pathway that has been discussed, that there is real... Uh, change because obviously we're behind where we need to be in terms of uh, our climate change commitments and arguably the MPPF is way behind public opinion on a knowledge so basically the policy needs to enable best available techniques towards the delivery of the target so it might be that specific reference to certain policy should be avoided so that the policy doesn't become out of date because um, the other elsewhere in Greater Manchester, the, there are strategies to do with ensuring that retrofitting and the types of skills and jobs promote growth in the sub region. So, really, it's a win win in terms of developers building properties that have better uh, low carbon credentials for future occupiers. So, so that that's all I have to say because uh, everything else has been captured. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Friends of the Earth, is that a new point? Mm. Yes, if I could just add to um, the comments my colleague made. I would just draw your attention and, and thinking here about how councils or local authorities have gone beyond even the new building standards. And so in London on the 15th of June, they issued a note to accompany the GLA energy assessment guidance in 2022. And basically what that said, it's in the context of the Greater London Net Zero 2030 target. And it has two bits, well I won't read it all out, but um, with regard to major developments, planning applicants will be expected to demonstrate that at each stage of the energy hierarchy, they have maximized opportunities for carbon reduction to achieve as close to zero as possible. An on-site carbon reduction of at least 35% beyond a part L 2021 of the building regs should be achieved. And a similar reduction is required for residential developments. So our key point is it is possible, and we would argue that it is necessary for local authorities to be more ambitious. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, would you like to come back on some of those points? Okay. Yes, yeah, so just, just briefly, um, <laughs> because obviously on this side of the table there's much support for the ambition of the policy and and then understandably sort of criticism of us changing the policy in the way in which we've suggested understandably because obviously those who have spoken on this side of the table would want the policy to be as you know, robust as possible so I mean just a few words in response I mean on on the change working towards which at least three of the speakers referred to and one CPI particularly saw us as a dilution I mean we've just sought to be realistic frankly as to on reflection as to quite what a planning policy can realistically seek to achieve and we think working towards is is a more realistic ambition for a policy of this nature um, there are those who think that the language that we had in the policy before was overly exacting and there are those who 
think the language we had before was um, was bang on. Um, we've gone away and thought about this and explained why we think working towards is the right way of doing this. Um, footnote 31 was referred to again, and I acknowledge that it does indeed need clarification, as we've said earlier on. Um, reference to offsetting in the policy 8, 8 sub A, it was suggested needs clarification. Um, our clarification is in the supporting text 5.16, but as I acknowledged earlier on, when you raised some points about this, sir, obviously you'll tell us in due course whether that's good enough or not. Um, and then finally, in relation to um, viability, um, suggestion made by a steady state that adding viability testing, if you like, doesn't really add anything. Uh, just to be quite straightforward about this, I mean, in the sort of bind, if you like, that um, one finds oneself in in making these plans is that the <coughs> government guidance, as opposed to policy per se, but government guidance, anticipates that ambitions, expectations, policies, etc., in local plans should be viably tested at the local plan making stage with this aim, so that then later on an individual developer putting forward an individual development proposal can't say, well, wait a minute, that causes viability difficulties for me. The, some would say overly simplistic, but the simple logic of the PPG is, well, tested all at the plan, and then you've bound everyone into this. And like many things which sound good as an aspiration, when you actually then examine the practicalities of it, there you know, some difficulties do come up, and this is a policy which, you know, in, would engage those difficulties, not least because some aspects of the viability testing, it's extremely hard, if not, you know, verging on the impossible to, to do at this stage. Hence, um, in response to the various points being made, a number of which we acknowledge as being good points made by those who have objected to the policy, um, hence our recognition that there does need to be a subject to viability clause um, in the proposal. So this is just one, to be frank, where what the PPG would have us do is, is either very hard or verging on the impossible to do, and there's an antidote to that which we've suggested. If anyone's got any better ideas, well, there you are, but that's our position. OK, thank you. Um, HBF, is that a new point? Quickly. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I did say I wanted to comment on viability and then I overlooked it. And um, my point was, which is, is the point that uh, um, Chris Kakowski has just made for the GMCA, uh, which is the requirement of the MPPF paragraph you know, 58, that, that the viability of policies is really tested at the local plan level. Uh, and, and the weight, it says, to be given to a viability assessment is a matter for, for the decision maker. So you could default to viability testing on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, but the weight to which you could give any evidence arising from that is, from, is a matter for the decision maker, the local authority, uh, uh, to decide. Uh, consequently, you know, there is a risk uh, that you could have policies in your local plan uh, which are uh, cumulatively uh, um, uh, cause problems for delivery. Uh, uh, um, for um, housing sites, Wh which leads me on to, to the point about, um, it, you know, it would, it would seem foolish from an environmental point of view to place barriers to the delivery of homes across the Greater Manchester conurbation, which uh, will be performing to much higher levels of environmental performance than many homes in the past including much of the existing uh, build stock, uh, not only delivering higher standards of energy efficiency, but also delivering against other new environmental targets, things like biodiversity net gain. Um, and uh, it would also be socially insensitive to create obstacles to the delivery of those homes when you've got a rising tide of homelessness uh, across Greater Manchester and problems of severe affordability. Uh, when we talk about uh, the climate crisis, I wish some people would talk about the housing crisis uh, at the same time. Uh, and I think we need to be sensitive to that as well. 
in terms of housing delivery in London, and London being uh, flagged as a um, uh, as a, uh, um, a great leader uh, in setting environmental standards, uh, caution. Housing delivery across London is faltering. It's well below uh, its housing targets. In 2019-20, the first year of the London plan, it delivered uh, nearly 41,000 homes when it needs to deliver at least 52,000 homes and its housing objective housing need is 66,000 homes a year. Uh, in 2020-21, it delivered only 34,000 homes and in 2021-22, it delivered just 37,000 homes, well below uh, the requirements. Now, that might not be attributable uh, to the Mayor's environmental targets, but there is an awful lot of policy uh, in the London plan that makes it really, really difficult uh, for applicants, and this is a well-acknowledged fact uh, within the development industry, makes it really difficult to navigate that very complex uh, London uh, plan policy landscape. And that's why I think Greater Manchester is striking the right balance here by adhering to the building regulations, recognising that they are uh, um, um, delivering much higher standards of energy efficiency, while also recognising the need that it must support housing delivery in Greater Manchester if it doesn't want to become uh, the London of the North and make it a place uh, where too few homes are delivered and people are priced out of living in the city. Thank you. Okay, just on your first point you were making about paragraph 58, I wasn't quite sure what, what point you were actually making. Are you saying that you're, uh, the, the councils are deficient, or are you saying that you're well content with the suggested change? Well, you've, you've made a point, yeah. but I don't quite know where it's taking us. I'm content with the change. The problem is that if you rely upon... Uh, clauses that say uh, we'll consider this on a case-by-case -case basis, it doesn't necessarily provide the solution because it's, in, it's down to the decision maker how much weight they give to that application-specific information. And that's why you need surety that the plan is deliverable in most instances and that reliance upon application-specific viability evidence is the exception rather than the rule. Sorry, sir, is that, is that clear? Thank you. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, that makes... And, um, oh, CPRE's sign was up, it went down again. No? Oh, somebody, somebody's sign went up, went down. Oh, cool, uh, the corner of my... Um, any, do you want to come back on anything on that, Mother? Yes, I mean, I've said what I've said on viability, and you know, I'd just be repeating myself. Okay. Um, this brings us to it. Unless there are any other comments about policy JPS2, anything that's not been picked up on that anyone who wishes to raise with me? No? Gavel's coming down on that then. Um, we have reached our natural breaking point, I think, for lunch. Uh, we've got through all two of the seven policies. We may be here some time, but I think it would do us all good to have a break. So, um, Absolutely. I think I will. Have, we, we normally have an hour for break. I think I'll continue with that tradition, um, I think, and then come back at two, and if we end up having to have a slightly later evening. But I'm hoping that after JPS... I'll be honest. I'm hoping after JPS 3, which I think is similarly... Uh, got a lot to go through. I'm hoping we'll have a, a bit of a canter through the others, yes. which I hope are a little bit more just, straightforward, just make, uh, he says. Make sure for Mr Fieldhouse's sake that we're done by seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, OK, so uh, we return at two o'clock. Thank you, everyone.
Okay, it's around two o'clock, so we'll make a start. Uh, thank you, everyone coming back. Um, we've lost lost a couple. Um, we're going to move on to JPS3, um, which is the Heat and Energy Networks uh, policy. Again, going on to what you were saying earlier, Mr. Scott, have you got anything you want to draw to my attention first? Uh, yes, indeed, sir. Um, so for S3, um, which in the published plan is at page 89, um, Heat and Energy Networks, and you will know that we have prior to the hearing sessions suggested that there should be various changes made to the supporting text and indeed to the policy itself so that's all before today so to speak um, so just to bring everyone up to date with um, our second and third thoughts about this um, taking on board and considering points which have been made by various people who have objected to this policy. Let me take this from the top. So um, in the policy uh, at item two, paragraph two, we have um, the heat and energy network opportunity areas and then various things which um, apply to these areas. And at various points in the policy you see reference to viability you see it for example in two item a examine viability um, in 2b we speak about a situation where things are unviable <laughs> just for good measure and then in paragraph three of the policy we talk about viability assessments well heat energy network viability assessments and it's occurred to us, perhaps some would say it's jolly obvious, but it's occurred to us that, um, frankly, the policy needs to be clearer on the role of viability um, in the various um, objectives that we have for uh, heat and energy networks and heat and energy network opportunity areas. And so um, what we consider would be helpful and I would put this on that line of necessary to make the plan sound as opposed to making it a nicer plan, is that at the beginning of item two, so before you come to any of the A, B, Cs, etc., etc., so before the colon, um, there should be um, text inserted to, um, to refer to... Um, issues of practicality and viability. So we, we had text, I'll read it out, but I mean, this is just to give you an idea of what we have in mind. So um, at the outset, within the identified heat and energy network opportunity areas, so after that, after that and before there will be, we would have in mind words to this effect, unless it can be demonstrated there are more effective alternatives for minimising carbon emissions or such connection is impracticable or financially unviable. So there's a reference to um, can you do it better some other way or perhaps most pertinently for those who have taken exception to this policy, issues of practicability and viability. So unless such connection is impracticable or financially unviable. So we would introduce viability at the beginning of this section rather than sort of one might say randomly referring to it in its flip side of unviable at various points in the policy. So bring it all together in one place so it's a catch-all um, and there isn't then room for argument about, well, does viability apply to this bit and not that bit and so on and so forth. So that's the, that's the most significant aspect of, of, of what we have in mind. We then, um, we then would... Um, the consequence of that would be that where in this policy we have references to evaluating viability for example at the end of 2a that would come out because we would have done it in a catch-all across the board way at the beginning of this section of the policy so one wouldn't need to randomly refer to it here and there and not somewhere else in the main body of the or in the sub items of the policy so that's viability um, we 
consider in that regard also that item B, which is the where unviable, um, would sensibly go because we would have covered viability in that more across the board fashion I've referred to. Um, we do though think that um, we do, do though think that an item A1, 2A1, which refers to an existing or planned heat energy network, uh, we do think that if we are, as we suggest we should, getting rid of item B, we should also in item A1 refer to um, or be designed to enable future connection where within 500 metres of such a network. So um, a point which is picked up in item C of the policy, um, which I'm going to come to in a few seconds' time. So basically an overall and across the piece of arbitrary uh, proviso and then slight adjustments in slight adjustments in the body of the text, which to be honest we needn't worry ourselves too much about. Item B in, in section two we, we suggest would go, and item C in section B has caused a great deal of confusion, the presumption in favour, the difficulty with referring to presumptions in favour, and particularly if one quotes, puts them in speech marks, is that one immediately thinks, well, well some people immediately think, what's that got to do with the framework's presumption in favour? It, it's, it, it, we don't need it, so we'd take C out as well if we make that small adjustment to item A1, which would refer to that, or be designed to enable future connection where within 500 metres of such a network. So we just rolled it into one of the earlier items and we get rid of the presumption in favour because it, it, it's caused a lot of discussion and debate and confusion and, you know... Um, wouldn't surprise you to know I had some questions about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. No, 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 it doesn't surprise me at all. Um, and and I think putting it in the quotation marks as if it's, you know, comes from some other document or whatever is has added to the had added to the questions, if you like. So so then I'm almost there, you'll be relieved to hear, and then I'll just come back to come back to just making sure we understand all of this. Um, and then in item three of the policy. Um, where in the first line of item three there's a reference to decentralised heat energy network viability assessments, we would remove the word viability from that because it's confusing there, um, frankly, um, because what's actually meant to be referred to in item three um, are decentralised heat energy network assessments, not viability assessments. Um, this is a broader point about assessments of decentralised heat and energy networks not um, and you know not viability per se we'd introduce viability in that earlier at that earlier point in the policy so to recap an overarching viability and practicability um, proviso keep deletion of Consequently, deletion of references to viable and unviable and viability assessments because they'd be OTOs if you introduce earlier on the overarching viability and practicability proviso. Getting rid of 2B, 2C. Um, and that's that in relation to the headline points vis-a-vis -vis the policy. The key thing there is practicability and viability. That's Out of all of those points, that's the key Take out, take away item, um, and then there's a there's a there's a finer point in relation to Figure five point one, where when we get to it, as I suspect we will, somewhere along the line in the discussions, are sitting immediately to my left is the person who would be able to explain what underpins all of this. But in Figure five point one, on page ninety one of Places for Everyone, the published plan. Um, you'll see that it basically has two colours, reddish and an orange colour red heat network opportunity areas and orange or whatever it is proposed allocations 2021 which itself is perhaps not the clearest language um, we um, we think it would be far clearer to in, in order to understand um, the opportunities that are referred to there to just have one single color red and that single color red would cover the red and the orange which are shown on figure 5.1 so in other words, heat and energy network opportunities would be not just the areas which are shown in red at the moment, but also the strategic allocations that are made in this plan. 
and our, there's an explanation for that in a few moments' time. But remembering that all of this is um, remembering that all of this is subject to um, an overarching proviso of viability and practicability. And I okay. think there are separate, and I can, I think there are quite separate, distinct issues there. So when we get to the figure, and you might want me to, us to do this now, should I just? Well, as I think. You know, um, turn to my left and ask for an explanation of that, or, or not, up to you, sir. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, because I think it'd be helpful with the discussion yep. if we explain it now, because so that seems on the face of it's quite a big change. Yes, um, so if you look at criterion one of the policy, um, that explains how the heat and energy networks have been developed, and criterion 1D refers to significant future development. Um, so that's where that point about the strategic locations is picked up. I think on reflection of the responses that have come through, that has caused a bit of confusion. So that's why we're proposing a change that, to be clear that the heat and energy networks include that criteria, and that's why we're suggesting it's one colour on the figure 5.1. So it's meant to simply, thank you, so it's meant to simply pick up the fact that within the policy itself, you know, since its publication at 1D, um, these opportunity areas have included significant future development proposed at the strategic development location. So that's, it's meant to pick up that. Whether it's doing it satisfactorily or not, we can discuss, but that's the intention. So, so, the, so your position is then, as far as you're concerned, 1D has always meant yep. the allocations. Yes, oh yes, yeah, yeah. proposed significant future development is is proposed, well that the only place it can, okay. is proposed, could apply to is in this document, places for everyone, that's strategic development locations, which are the big chunky sites um, that we've allocated in the plan. So we would say it's always been there. <coughs> okay. Now whether, you know, whether the figure needs to be changed to make that clear, but, you know, that's the intention behind it. Okay, thanks. Um, Okay, right, what we'll do then is I think I'll go through my points as they were made, as I'll try and reflect as much as I can on the changes that have been suggested, but there are any suggestions for me to, to think about. Um, and I, as, as always, I'll go through my questions first and then open it up at the end. Um, so the policy starts by stating the provision of decentralised energy infrastructure is critical to the delivery of objectives for low carbon growth. Um, as the norm with a lot of these policies, it then sets out the criteria, um, which, which are the measures that will help achieve these aims. So criterion one is about identifying the supporting opportunities, or identifying and supporting the opportunities. Um, criterion two is about setting out what developers are expected to do. And criterion three is about explaining the evidential requirements, as I've understood it. That's um, basically. So we'll yes, go through these things absolutely. in turn. And I think this one of the things that I think was throwing me when I read the policy and criterion one originally is that there is a map on figure 5.1, as you say, which shows the heat and energy network opportunities. I'm just going to start calling them opportunities, yeah, shorthand. Um, but the policy seemed to imply through the phrase, these will be identified where, et cetera, um, that this was something that still needed to be done. So obviously we asked the question, what's, what's, what's 5.1 showing then if there's still something that needs to be done? Um, it wasn't clear to me how or when that needed to be done. Um, through your written statements, I think, or answer to our question, you've suggested modifications, which I think seek to cover that point, which is the first is that you've suggested that rather than saying the, that these will be identified, that would change to these have been identified, which I think fits into what you've just said, and other changes to supporting text and policies map, and i.e. You're, you're proposing to identify these areas on the, on the policies map, um, and so I think it's to show, give some clarity that figure 5.1 is intended to be used under criterion two and three. Is that criteria two and three? Is that? That's that's my understanding. So that's right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But also that councils can identify other or different opportunity areas through local plans. Is that true? Is that still the position? Yes, is the answer. But my sorry, my my sort of immediate response that would be we, we couldn't stop them from doing so anyway so okay. yeah okay. well I think well it's interesting isn't it because even with the changes proposed to the supporting text and, and I've noticed that, that that change talks about the mod and this is the modification to paragraph 5.20 it Got says that 
the local planning authorities will refine what is on figure 5.1 when more data is available. So which implies to me that, um, or will be, for, will be, the will therefore is a, as I, as I always think of it, is the, the PFE is requiring local plans to do something. Um, it's not an option, it's a will, will do that. So if you're wanting something to happen, and in this case, defining new other different areas, then that is that something that should be in the policy as well. Mm. I'm just pausing to think about that one, so bear with me for one moment. So the sort of edict, if you like, to local plans that they should they should refine these areas as they get more local evidence. I think I'm sitting on the fence on that one, so to be honest. I mean, you know, yes, if, if in due course, when you... I mean, there are going to be a whole bunch of these points throughout places for everyone that you'll be grappling with in your report. So if you think that where we're seeking to give a guiding hand to local plans, that should best be said in, this, in the main body of the policy rather than in supporting text. I suppose, I suppose the first so point, it. always there's going to be two sides of that. One is, mm. is that what you are saying? Is it a case of you're expecting them to do this? And if it's just a sort of, you can if you want, then that's a different point well, to, no, we expect you to do that, and therefore that is that Sure. Policy. Well, I think when one looks at the when one looks at the suggested, I mean, this is all pre the hearing sessions, the, the text that we put forward for 520 in the mods that we issue before these sessions um, will be further refined by the districts when more local evidence becomes available is, is one of those statements of the blessed obvious, as I call them, in the sense that if a local authority, a local plan making authority, you know, has places for everyone, which shows on a figure the opportunity areas as, as they are at the time of places for everyone's adoption. Um, will be at the, at the time of the places for everyone adoption and then further evidence becomes available to show that the area isn't aptly shown on the places for everyone figure then it obviously would be a task for a future local plan to catch up with that further evidence so so the mandate I suppose is just to do your job really um, to be quite honest <coughs> okay um all right, okay, I'll leave it at that um, there are, there are, I mean, a whole host of these sorts of statements where some, you know, some would say, well, do you need to state that anyway because won't they be doing it in any event? And they certainly should. And this plan is just in the supporting text, if you like, seeking to... Mm. Yeah, I think sometimes it is just un to understand what, it, what you are I, no, getting I, at. I, I, I really do, un I really do um, un appreciate that point. That's for sure and I suppose there might be a, a case for... Again, the develop, de you know, development and decision makers mm. knowing what is it clear and ambiguous what they're being asked to do. Because I suppose, in theory, if a local plan mm. um, author would have said, I mean, well, we're not, we're not going to look at that, you know, we're not going to produce any evidence about that or anything else, mm. then the policy doesn't require them to. Um, whereas if That's something right. absolutely was definite, then it might be something that would be more akin to policy. Well, so. I think this is given, given this is refining, you know says when more local evidence becomes available so that is I suppose necessarily assuming that there will be such more additional local evidence I mean in my mind it, to my mind it's probably more if as and when is, is, is the gist of it really so you know if, if a future plan maker has more evidence which leads the future plan maker to think well the the lines on the plan literally on the figure aren't right any longer then you would expect them to do something about it so I think the when is probably is probably the maybe the cause of the issue that you've raised. Um, should I mean it may may be better as further refined by the district. Should more local evidence become available, or if more local evidence becomes available, or in the event that more I'm on a roll here. In the event that more local evidence becomes available, that's the concept as I understand it. Okay. Okay. Well, leave that there for now. Um, in terms of the red on figure 5.1, the red, the red oh. bits, which is the heat, which are identified as the heat network opportunity areas, again, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that they're taken from the GM spatial energy strategy from 2016, is that I'll look correct? to my left on this one. Uh, yes, that's correct. So that was the starting point uh, for developing the 
areas in figure 5.1, and um, that was on page 167 of the GM Spatial Energy Plan, which set out the methodology at the time as part of that research. And then the PFE um, looked to, to replicate that methodology and also include, as we've mentioned, just the strategic allocations, our proposed strategic allocations. Sorry, just, just to be clear that you're saying you replicated the methodology. So you did a different, you did a new assessment or you just took the figures, the areas from that 2016 plan? Yes, so the 2016 plan included uh, proposed and existing heat networks. Um, so that took that data forward as part of the map that's in figure 5.1. Right. And also included the um, heat demand data as well, which has been picked up on some of the policy, the written representations and as well as the strategic allocations. But no new work was no. done to identify it. Yeah. So notwithstanding the suggestion that the, the allocations are also opportunity areas, does the 2016 data constitute relevant and up-to-date evidence as set out in Power 31 of the framework? Relevant and up-to-date 2016? Well, we'd say yes in the sense that there isn't any, any additional evidence since to sort of cast doubt on, on that. Is there anything that's likely to have changed from your from your knowledge of these things that would have would question put any of this information into question? Uh, not significantly, no. I think I think some of the responses alluded to the fact that the heat demand data has been decommissioned. I think, on reflection, our position is that that's unlikely to have significantly changed because it's based on heat demand data from urban areas. So actually, although it's been decommissioned, there's no new evidence to suggest that would be out of date. Was there any reason, particular reason why you decided not to do an updated assessment of the opportunity areas as part of PFE? I think the position would be it was based on the most up-to-date evidence at the time. I mean, as I just said, I think in position to the heat demand data, um, it's unlikely to have significantly changed. So I don't think we would warrant a whole-scale review of the methodology at the time. Okay, um, and just going back to the point we were just talking about, actually, does the fact that this data is 2016 and, you know, that six years old already, make it imperative, if you like, that local plans do? You know, we're going about the point whether it's an option for local plans to do this or not. Does actually the date of this data mean, mean that it actually it is something that local plans will have to do to make sure that it is based on up-to-date relevant data? Um, I think we would just leave it, to be frank, we would just leave it to these future local plans to, you know, at the time when they come forward, they themselves would need to have their own up-to-date evidence base, and so they're going to have to review this necessarily, I think, to see whether there's something that needs to be added to what by then would be an even older evidence base. Okay. Um, I, I think my only hesitation at the moment is because I've taken your point about the, you know, seemingly mandatory terms in that supporting text, and you know, if there is to be a mandate, where where should it be, and so on and so forth. And I'm, my hesitation at the moment is, I don't think that we are in a position to dictate to future local plans that we know enough now that they're going to have to do this. That's the short point. So that's why I think the more contingent, in the event that there's further evidence, is better captures where we are. Whether we're in the right place or not, it's another matter. But that's where that's where we are. Okay, thank you. Um, now, this point is interesting because I'm not sure that, that, and people might correct me if I'm wrong here, but the the, the the correlation, if you like, between the allocations and the and the e -top opportunity networks, the fact that they are both falling into that category is necessarily picked up because we had, some comments were put to us about the fact that um, you know you've got the opportunity areas um, are not necessarily all in close proximity to the uh, allocations. And so there's a suggestion that the policy somehow might not work in practice or might not be the most sensible policy because of this, this disconnect. So uh, it suggests to me that perhaps the, the, the fact that everything on figure 5.1 was supposed to be classed as an opportunity is probably lost in translation. No, fine. And that's, in a way, that's why we've said we would want to change the figure. But the policy itself, I mean, I would say, what it's worth, the policy itself begins with 
in item one with referring to all sorts of things, including the allocations or the strategic development locations, i.e. the allocations. Um, so I'd say it was clear enough, if you like, that what was set out in the policy applies across the board. Um, but I then take the point, or we've then taken the point, and when you look at the figure, you then ask yourself the question, well, wait a minute, how does the figure fit with that understanding? So we've made the figure fit the policy rather than the policy fit the figure, if that makes any sense. Um, that's what we want to do, to make the figure fit the policy, because obviously the figure is meant to perform that role of telling you or helping you to understand the areas to which this policy applies. But I do just, you know, repeat the point and again that for those who might be concerned about that, I mean I'd say it was clear from one D anyway, but for those that you know the allocations are in these areas to be for these things to happen. But please bear in mind that we've now rationalised references to viability and introduced them right at the beginning of item two. As far as we're concerned, that's necessary to make the plan sound. So so those who have allocations who you know, perhaps for perfectly understandable reasons, we're unclear, as you've said, as to the implications of this policy for the allocations. You know, let's, let me just take that on the chin, if you like, fine. So the policy wasn't clear enough because people have said we don't really understand whether these, this applies or doesn't apply to the allocations, fine. OK, so let's acknowledge that um, as a concern. But in relation to that, our sort of fix in relation to it, our antidote in relation to it, is to say, well, here are the various things that we aspire to in these areas, including the strategic allocations, but they're all subject to practicability and viability. So if you're to have these ambitions at all, and we think it's perfectly appropriate to have these ambitions, to have these ambitions, but to be straightforward and say that's subject to practicability and viability, I have to say, seems to me to be a perfectly sensible outcome. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's all I've got to say about Criterion 1 for now and Figure 5.1. Um, I think. So we'll move on to 2. Mm. Um, so, yeah, easiest way. Easiest to work through each element of 2A, again, trying to be mindful of what sure. you've been talking about. But Absolutely, so. 2A requires any development of 10 dwellings or more or 1,000 square metres for any other form of development <coughs> to assess the viability, as what he says at the moment, of connecting to an existing mm. or planned network and or installing site-wide or communal heat energy solution. Mm. Notwithstanding what you, I suppose the point is it's still about viability. It's still an assessment of viability, just where it comes in the policy. But those thresholds, you're not talking about changing those thresholds. So I just uh, wanted to ch just double checking. No, no, we're not changing the thresholds in so, A. No. Um, so again, just I suppose basic principles. Where, how were the thresholds identified, and are they reasonable? Um, I look to my left as to where the thresholds themselves actually come from. Um, I'll just pass that one down the table. I, th I think, just to be clear, I think the, the policy is probably modelled on similar policies in other local plans, London being one example where they do apply it to the definition of, of major development. So that's where that comes from, uh, particularly on that point. So there's been no, again, no assessment of different options under that. You just decided, you know, took the view that that was a reasonable position. Okay. So in terms of, and again, that's the point that's been made to me, in terms of housing in particular, um, anything above 10 dwellings is, could, could constitute quite a lot of schemes, albeit within, within these areas. I mean, the policy, this policy only applies to the areas within the, within the blobs, but there could still be quite a lot of development. So is that not considered some, you know, if, if every scheme has to come to you with some kind of viability assessment or, so is, that, is that considered a reasonable burden? Uh, Quite well, small. in 2A as it was, as it is, forgive me, in the published plan, should evaluate the viability of, I can understand mm. the point, in the way, in, and acknowledge it, in the way in which we've suggested it would be best to write this so that one has at the outset, here are the things that we want in these areas, 
these are our ambitions, but we recognise that we're not trying to force you to do this if it's impracticable to do it or it's not viable to do it. So subject to viability, subject to practicability. Um, that would be at the outset of item two. And so we wouldn't be saying to someone who's promoting 10 dwellings, you have to assess viability. The position would be, if you say, are saying to us, well, we can't, we're in one of these areas, but we can't connect to an existing planned heat energy network because it's not practical to do so or because it's not viable to do so, then yes, you would need to explain that in your supporting material. So we're leaving it to those who are making the applications to, to make their case, if you like, if they're in that position. The expectation being, and the aspiration being, that not everyone would be in that position, so there will be those who can do it, um, obviously. Um, so that's, but I, but I take the point that 2A, as published, if you like, would say to um, you know everyone who puts 10 or more dwellings forward, you're to evalu evaluate viability. Well, there might be some who don't want to evaluate viability. Um, don't need to. Yeah. Exactly. <coughs> yeah. 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 Coming back to a point, and again, you might, <laughs> might be a bit circular, but... No, no, don't um, worry, sir. That's fine. Because we, what you just spoke again, the point I made this morning about paragraphs 34 and 58 of the framework, again, we're in a position where those two paragraphs together, if you like, expect viability to be addressed through the mm. MPPF yeah. um, in, as drafted. Um, you'd be expecting viability to be assessed each time. I mean, I suppose as you're suggesting, you still might have a position where someone is coming to you and saying, we can't do it. So it would be mm. subject to a viability assessment of some kind. Yes, um, and a practicability assessment. And practicability, which, yeah. is, which is different, I take that. But um, yeah. again, so I suppose the point would be, is this something that should have been, the costs of this should have been assessed through well, I think I'm right in saying the costs of this haven't been assessed through the whole plan viability assessment. The question should be, I guess, similar to the under policy two, should they have been? I think we're back to the, the point made earlier on, to be quite frank, as the difficulties of doing this, I don't know, about plan-wide. I mean, across, if you added all the red and the orange together, it would be a significant area. So the practicalities of, of trying to viability assess from, you know, 10 dwellings or more or over 1,000 square metres commercial or other floor space, which is back to those, those basic issues, to be quite frank. I mean, I, you know, I take the aspirations or even expectations of the framework and the, and the PPG on, on board, but, you know, there is a limit to what can actually be done. Okay. Um, might you remind me how you, you're intending to change criterion 2A? Um, so certainly. Absolutely, um, sir. Because... The way I, and again, this is the way it's written at the moment, mm. and I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking now of uh, effectiveness, clarity, and ambiguity. Mm. The policy says, as it as it stands, um, a requirement that new residential developments in this threshold mm. should evaluate the viability of connecting. Yes, doesn't say anything about actually I connecting. Know. Well, so they, it read to me a little bit like a condition without a tailpiece. Absolutely. Or implementation no, limb or whatever. Is that is that a, is that something that's a fair uh, it is. observation and might need addressing? It is, a, it is a fair observation, and it's it's addressed by two things. Well, it's addressed primarily by um, by moving the having an overall proviso for viability and practicability at the uh, at beginning of item two. Having said it there, the, it would then read so we have an item two within the identified heat and energy network opportunity areas. Subject to practicability, subject to viability, those, you know, one obviously would put the language more elegantly than that, but that's the proviso, that's the gist of the proviso. There will be, and then we actually spell out the requirement, a requirement that, rather than evaluating the viability in, you know, naval gazing, that you connect to an existing or planned heat energy network. So there's the, so this is now a proper requirement rather than some form of inchoate requirement or requirement that didn't make best sense. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the difficult, not a criticism, but the difficult, no, I think this in front of me um, before before now, so it makes it a bit more difficult to... Uh, no, no, absolutely, and I want to ask you about that later on, perhaps when we get to the end of this session about moving forward. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, <laughs> I, I make a lot of notes, but sometimes it's difficult to keep up. Absolutely. Um, okay. So... So all I've got to say about A, 
Two um, B, you've suggested you are suggest it would be removed. Yes. Um, um, yes. Yeah, so again, assuming obviously we've got to decide whether that's uh, required or not. Of course. If it's been shown to be unviable under two A, uh, uh, sorry, yes, two A, and then the policy, the two B requires. Um, development to incorporate appropriate capability to enable future connection. So there mm. would still be some cost to say. Some other thing was if you if you've already assumed it's not viable to do this, but you've still got to do some costly yes. prudent, potentially abortive work. Is that irrespective of what if it's say would that be a reasonable assess, assessment request anyway, I suppose. <laughs> I'm trying to find a, an expression other than dog's breakfast. Um, <laughs> the um, the, um, so we have our proviso at the beginning in our rethoughts about this. We have our proviso at the beginning of this viability. And as I said earlier on, and I appreciate and I, I'll, seek, I'll explicitly seek some guidance about how to move forward on subsequent days of the hearings later on, but and I appreciate that today this is working in a way where I explain something and everyone's trying to catch up, and I acknowledge that. So mm -hmm. apologies, but I, I, but I do acknowledge the point. So you'll recall that there's no need why, there's no, no necessary reason why you would have jotted it down, but what I'd said earlier on was that for 2A1, if anyone has still got the will to follow any of this, um, we have connect to, the enthusiasts over there, connect to an existing or planned heat and energy network. And then I said we were going to take up the key words from item B into the, into. Mm -hmm. A little one, or be designed to enable future connection where within 500 metres of such a network. So we've taken the key element from. Um, actually, it comes from. Um, it comes from. Well, it's an amalgam of B and C. We've taken it up into spelling it out as something we specifically would, it, would want to happen, <coughs> but all subject to that provides of practicability and viability. Yeah, sorry, I. I forgotten that um, no 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 absolutely I, I completely understand why you've forgotten it so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so again so yes okay but the point still stands so if, if it's not practical or viable to connect in the well, first instance then you the, the the next port of call is to design it such that it could be yes yeah. but it, but if that's not practical or viable then you, you don't, don't do that don't, either don't do that so, either. That's, okay. that's, that's, so they're all all roads lead back to is it practical, is it viable? And if it's both of those things, then you're to do it. And if it's not one or other of those things, or both of them, then you're not to do it. Or we're not expecting you to do it. Okay. Is, I mean, it's restructuring it to try and make some, some points as clear as we can make them, so. I understand, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, no, I think I understand that. So 2C, uh, which is 2C? Um, 2C oh, is it's the presumption famous favor. presumption. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, you've suggested <laughs> removing it. Yes. But taking I, up the key point about, you know, the pot potential connection into an earlier aspect. I will obviously allow anyone who wishes to make any point about it, but I've got nothing to say about that other than I'm content at the moment with that yes. answer. Uh, I don't, I've got a lot of questions about that I don't think I need to ask. Um, but if anybody wishes to raise it, they can. Yes, um, my main one was anyone who wants to defend it, then then they, yeah. they can do so. But um, we we've taken it out because we acknowledge uh, the confusion that using language which is similar to well, same as in certain respects, language which is used differently in the framework is um, it just causes confusion. So doubtless, nine out of your ten questions were related to that point. I should think. Uh, indeed, they were. So. My shoulders are very broad today, sir, so, so keep going. Fully examined and including proposals unless proven not to be viable. So we've got that yeah. phrase again, which may or may not be, which that's, may be. That's a very, now that is a very, so I hadn't picked that one up actually, or we hadn't. So mm. in our clean up of this policy, then as everything subject to, as all of two is subject to viability, we wouldn't need to say it again here. Yeah. So I hadn't, we had I hadn't we hadn't team whatever you know we hadn't spotted that one. The main point on that though mm. is that um, how does it, again 
it might just help me and clarify it. How does the use of weight heat, waste heat locally fit into the concept of the heat and energy network opportunity areas and connecting to these networks? Is, is that the same thing or is it different things? Now you're moving way outside mm. my area of even being able to talk around the subject, but uh, who can help us on that? Go on, here we go. I guess um, not a complete position, but I would suggest that um, the utilisation of, of waste heat forms part of the, the whole concept of decentralised heat networks. So if this heat network is planned or there's kind of local uses, which would be a user of that heat, it would form part of that policy approach. And I think referring to, to MPPF paragraph 155C, that talks about co-locating heat customers and suppliers. So I think that would be in line with that position. Again, it seems a sensible aspiration, doesn't it, to use waste heat locally? But this would still only apply within the blobs. And is it meant to apply to industrial development of any size or type? It doesn't. There's no. There's no. Not, not there's no written. distinction in the policy. Yeah, exactly. Not as written. No. So, I don't think we've got any way of discrimination. I mean, presumably, no. again, because the, the, the points that somebody made about people making about this element is that either the type of industrial use proposed might not be suitable for this type of thing, or the scale, so that would go back to your practical... It would practical, come back to the practical. overarching yeah. practicability and viability. Yeah. Okay. Okay, it's ticked a lot of those off. Um, 2E, yes, 2E sets out expectations about publicly owned buildings and assets. Now, I'm sorry, I think you're going to have to talk me through this one and explain what's being proposed here because I've read it many, many times and I'm not entirely sure. Is this to do with new development of publicly owned assets within opportunity areas? Is this about committing the public sector from existing development to look at new networks that are being proposed? On large developments, which you know, it's, it's, where does it kick in? Uh, I've got my own understanding of it, but I, I, I don't want to sort of do an off the cuff one on this. Can you help? Uh, yeah, we're just referring to the exact reference, but it has come up directly out of the recommendation from the GM Spatial Energy Plan. There's a policy approach, but we can get the exact reference shortly. Can we come back to that one, sir, when we found the reference? Or Yes, yeah. I mean, again, is this going to be one of those that, it, you know, I'll preempt it by saying, is this going to be one of those where it's, uh, this is what we are doing, uh, it's not a requirement of anybody to do anything necessarily, it's just indicating to, the, yeah. to everybody this is an action we're going to take? Yes, and I think this is, again, I mean, it's a common theme, isn't it, where if you look back to the very, very beginning of, of the policy, you know, help to achieve this, following measures help to achieve this, so... When you get that in a policy like this, you find, we well, certainly do in this document anyway, that the policies in question are a mix of, you know, this is what we would want developers to do when bringing forward planning applications, this is what we want local planning authorities to do when bringing forward their local plans, and this is neither of the above, and it's what we as public bodies would do. Mm. There's a wider question about that, which, you know, I keep... Well, we, we asked, I mean, again, I go them, back you know. to the original day one and we asked this question about yeah. is it appropriate for a plan of this nature to basically have those kind of I none agree. of the above no, statements I, in it. And, um, I agree. I agree. And we're just back, you know, we keep coming to that point, understandably, because so many of our policies do, well, so many of these sorts of policies do that. And so that question is, when I think if we just take as read the questions being posed and I've explained that this. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but yeah. If, if the answer is it's neither of the or it's, it's neither a local plan or DM issue, Absolutely. we can take away and decide. Exactly. It's always making sure I know what it is being proposed because that, that form of words to me is hmm. uh, ambiguous. Yes, and so therefore, once you know and then you make the primary decision in due course or the primary recommendation, which is should places for everyone do this signalling of what yeah. we're right. doing as opposed to what we're expecting developers to do and what we're expecting plan makers to do, should this plan do all of this signalling, you know, you'll tell us what you think about that. If you decide, well, it's sound or it's not 
unsound for it to do that, that signalling, then the second question that arises is, is it, is it clear enough that that's what this bit of this policy is all about and some bit of some other policy is all about? And the very fact that you've asked the question obviously tells me that it's not clear enough. So it would need to be made clearer. Um, that is, if you don't report to us in due course that, you know, the plan's doing enough, plenty enough, telling developers what they should do and telling planning authorities what they should do and make local plans. It doesn't need to keep saying, and while we're at it, this is what we're going to do, you know. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll await with interest <laughs> what you say on that. So I've got, a, I've got a feeling I know what's coming. But anyway, go on. I resume. Um, I'll come back then if there's anything you want to add to that when you've got the reference. So 2F sets out an expectation that any site-wide mm. networks will be designed so as to enable the extension mm. expansion to adjoining buildings or assets appropriate. Um, again, anything, uh, again, I've justified my consistent with national policy to expect developers to provide networks to accommodate connection from outside the site. Any suggestion you're Enable asking them to go beyond expansion. what they would need to do? Seems an entirely sensible aspiration to have, subject to practicability and viability. Um, I mean, somewhere along the line, one's got to have some ambition in these policies. So. <laughs> So, yeah, as long as the proviso is there, as far as I'm concerned, it's absolutely fine, but with the proviso. Okay. Just to, again, this might be a, a, a odd point, perhaps, but the expectation for, for, for any of this, actually, but particularly that last point, is only for development that's within the identified heat and energy opportunity areas, because obviously that's what the policy talks that's about. Policy but is there is it possible that such networks might be delivered outside of these areas, you know, for the kindness of developers' hearts or whatever, they think that's a really good idea, even though it's not in one of those areas and, and Well that's something that this is something to cater to, for, so to get involved you know, in. I think it's probably as we've seen from the very fact that we ourselves are saying it needs some clarification, it's it's already, you know, taken a fair bit on itself and okay. needs to be clarified. In relation to what it's trying to do, let's let's not try and do other stuff as well. Um, okay. You know. Just before I want to move on, have you got anything else you want to put about the uh, public? Just even if it's a reference, I've, uh, the GM's energy plans before me. I think isn't it? Is it? the document that you're looking Topic. up is it is it in the examination library? Do we know? The actual yes. document currently isn't, but it's oh, referred to in the topic paper, topic paper yes, with the yeah, reference. That's yeah. to, yeah. And the yeah. reference is in the topic paper, is it? The one the, that we were looking for. We've not found it currently. It's in the GM Spatial Energy Plan, but we'll have to follow up with that. Right, That's okay. We'll keep, okay. <laughs> Someone will we'll keep, keep turning searching. the pages. I hope it's worth the wait. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> so we'll move on to Criterion 3, yes. which is a set of... Uh, well, well, what you would expect to see out of a, mm. as written viability assessment, as you suggested, it's not a viability assessment, no. it's an assessment. Exactly. Um, are these criteria effectively validation requirements? And therefore, do they have any place in the policy? Policy. Uh, by validation requirements, in, you mean that in order for an application to be validated, it would need to have an assessment which did all these things? Yeah, it seems... And, and whether or not having yeah. this very quite prescriptive list of what an sure. assessment should include it makes it difficult to account for individual circumstances, changes in circumstances, proportionality, flexibility, all those, all those good things. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I think we, as I understand it, we're seeking to give what we've certainly seen as being help, a helpful indication as to, you know, what the subjects, as topics, if you like, that it isn't viability assessments, it's network assessments should cover. Um, but I, you know, frankly, I mean, if you consider that there's, there isn't, it's, in order to make the plan sound, it would be necessary to take out this sort of guidance in the policy, then so be it. I mean, what counts is what we would want to happen in these areas, subject to practicability and viability. That's what counts. And saying to somebody, when you're writing your assessment, you know, you should do these seven things. Well, it's in a different order of it of a different order of significance, to be quite honest, you know. Okay, One might you. even move it to supporting text. Yeah, well, so the question was, would it be better in supporting yeah. text? I, I suspect question it would mark. be. I suspect it would be. Mm. Okay, thank you. That covers most of my questions. I think all of my questions. Um, I'll open it up then. And any, I mean, I'm happy to go through any aspect of that 
policy or any of the suggested modifications have been put to us today? Nobody? Everybody? Oh. I'm ever so slightly shocked, so. But we'll start with Barton Wilmore. So it's a, it's a similar point that I won't reiterate in full as I made for um, policy S2. I think the, the difficulty we've got with this is there's no problem with having the aspirations in the, for, for Greater Manchester to have these aspirations. But for, to turn an aspiration into a development plan policy, it has to be tested. And by the council's own evidence at 644 of matter, their matter six statement, they haven't tested it. And, and that, that should be enough uh, to, to demonstrate that it's, it's not soundly based. We don't have a difficult, and, and in, a, in essence, sorry, part 1D is turning that aspiration, unevidenced aspiration, into an allocation requirement. And, and, if, and if that was an allocation requirement in uh, our new Carrington allocation, for instance, we have a, a big problem with it, so that which we, we take up with you at Matter 23, um, because it's not been included in viability assessment. So we treat that as, as any other um, allocation requirement. The parts two and three of the policy then add requirements of an applicant to, to, to demonstrate themselves that something isn't viable when the council when the GMCA has got no evidence to suggest it is viable or up-to-date evidence that it is viable to put it in the plan in the first place what we don't have a problem with so is if this policy points solely to the to the to the concept that um, these opportunity areas are good ideas in their aspiration and that local plans should investigate and provide evidence as to whether or not they're viable um, and deliverable. And then those local plans might test them. We have no problem with that, sir. But as it stands at the moment, the, the, and, and forgive the, the shortening of this, that we haven't done our homework, so we're going to get applicants to do it for us on an individual basis, is not really what, how, the, how the testing for soundness of a policy should work, sir, in our view. Sorry, and um, the point that the council have made about it, you know, one of the too quite difficult, too difficult to, to assess this as part of um, any kind of whole plan viability assessment. When you, I suppose, you know, paraphrasing what we said about, you've got it's only covering certain parts of city, uh, so, so parts of plan area, uh, you know, presumably different costs, different uh, different prevalence or existence of networks of existing networks or what might be coming forward, does it, does it make it a bit too difficult to do? It, so, yeah, and I, I think probably I'd rephrase my, not done my homework, because it's, it, it, it perhaps is too difficult to do, and this is the wrong scale at which to do it. Um, so I don't dispute that. But if it is too difficult to do at this stage or too complex, then it can't go in the, it's not evidence and it can't go in the plan at this, at this scale of policy making. So I think if it is something that would be far more appropriate to do at a borough level, then that's what the GMSF should instruct the boroughs to do, is to do their own, their own homework on it. But until there's something that underpins the idea that an applicant's got half a chance of doing this, it shouldn't be in there as a requirement to, um, to deliver. OK, thank you. Um, Turley's. Thank you, sir. Um, it's a couple of points I'd, I'd like to make, if, if I may. Uh, one of them is, is certainly um, following on agreeing with a comment just made by Barton Wilmore. Um, but just to elaborate on that a wee bit further, if, if I may, in, in that, um, yes, uh, we do have concerns that um, certainly with respect to um, point one, of the policy in that there is almost a blanket expectation therefore that all allocations are automatically deemed suitable for this now from our perspective and from my, my client's perspective heat energy networks are actually a very a very good thing people have, have done a number of, of such networks on schemes and they intend to do more and um, they are a great uh, mechanism technology to decarbonize the energy network and they can have some real benefits but that only suitable in certain types of locations and in terms of just taking the point whereby um, the council felt that it wasn't possible to assess the viability of these things 
Um, I, I might just challenge that a little bit, if, if I may, sir, because uh, it was mentioned as well that the evidence, there's nothing changed since 2016, which might justify an update to that evidence base as to which of these areas might be suitable, the opportunity areas. Well, the first thing I would say to that is what has happened and what is continuing to happen is evolutions in the building regulations, which means that the dwellings we are building need much less heat. Um, and therefore, the viability, uh, technical, not, I'm not talking about commercial for a second, but the technical viability of heat networks, particularly on low schemes, and again, I make a point about the threshold for 10 dwellings, it's, I don't think we need to do any commercial viability work to figure out that it's not viable on such a small scheme. Technically, I think that argument could be proven quite easily by just simply looking at the heat demand and what dwellings are going to need in terms of heat from 2025. Where heat networks are viable, absolutely, high density, uh, city centre, large allocations, um, that's where I think they would be, I can certainly see the, the, the reasons for, for considering viability, but at the moment it seems the onus is on every single applicant or with an allocation to prove that it's not viable when I think there is some work that could be done at a local authority level first to screen out the sites that, that, uh, that might be deemed viable. And I think we suggested, sir, therefore, that in, in the reps we, we put in that another criteria be inserted in number one um, as E, which is that the first thing is local authorities identify heat network areas that are commercially and technically viable and make a significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. There would at least be then a screening process to take out those sites that aren't viable um, technically, but then uh, place that then on those sites that in fact might have sufficient heat demand and that might be a possible way of so is that through the local plan you'd say it's yes the local plan process. yes so the local the local plan process would then do an updated evidence base to say okay we've got x major allocations in our particular area and those therefore might be deemed more suitable than simply every single allocation and what in practical terms do you think that would work for allocations in this plan so legitimate for a local plan to go back and say actually JPA whatever should be a, a heat, and up, heat and energy opportunity area would that go down well with developers once a local plan retrospectively decided that that was the not case? Not retrospectively sir but I think it, it would be a possibly a case where um, at least um, there is a filtering process to enable um, those raft of smaller allocations to naturally not have to consider the heat network uh, opportunity areas. Okay, it wouldn't apply to, sorry, you're talking about the smaller allocation in this plan? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, okay. In order to do your, your theory, I'm thinking out loud here, that you would have to sort of establish, if you like, the principle, I guess, at this, at this, in this plan, so yeah, that in principle these are opportunity areas, and then do some kind of further exercise rather than the other way around, because if you said they're not suitable, they're not opportunity areas, and then try to impose that requirement on them through a local plan, that wouldn't work, would it? That makes sense. I You'd have to start from the premise they are until proven not, would that? Um, well, actually, so I think there is technical evidence uh, to say that um, if it is only 10 dwellings, it's not viable. You could almost start from the process of saying there's a number of schemes that heat network opportunities aren't viable. That, appreciate there was a reference made to London as well in the London plan. London city centre, extremely dense. Um, that's why heat network areas are possibly more suitable in, in, in that area than it is here. So I think there is there could be some evidence to, to, uh, to demonstrate that there's more not viable than so. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you want to come back on any of those points? If you, can you just look? Uh, yes, sir. I just want one moment to check okay. one reference. Forgive me for one moment. Yes, I just, just going back to an earlier point, sorry, just in relation to 1D, do you recall the reference to the strategic allocations? Um, just also to draw attention to paragraph 5.22 of the supporting text, which also refers to the strategic development site. So that's just a, 
by the way point. Um, sorry, the fundamental point I've picked up from the two gentlemen who have spoken, um, Mark Wilmer and Turley, is really this issue about whether this plan knows enough to set out these, on the face of it, perfectly sensible aspirations, um, subject to practicability and viability, or should the issue be passed to subsequent local plans? Well, we think with the changes that we've proposed, this, the aspirations in this policy are perfectly sensible ones for this plan to set out. Um, the alternative would, would indeed be to set these out as a template for future local plans to investigate. We don't advocate that approach, but they, those seem to be the alternatives. We're, we stand by the policy with the various suggested changes that I've put forward. Um, but as I say, if, if, if when you go away and think about all of this, if you think the policy is, doesn't pass muster in that regard, then the, then the sort of next step would be for to give consideration to the policy being a guide for, for future local plans. Uh, we don't think we're in that situation, frankly, but as I say, if you're against us, so to speak, on what we're seeking to do here, then let's at least have, let's at least have some guidance for future local plans. And have you anything to add about the um, the points made about viability, which is similar points this this morning? I, I have nothing to add, no, sir. Um, I mean, I think you just, with the understanding in mind as to where this is meant to apply, so um, to the opportunity areas, which as far as we're con concerned include the strategic allocations, um, to connect to, um, to put this as simplest, to take the simplest example, to connect to an existing to an existing heat energy network, you'd think to yourself, well, why on earth, why on earth wouldn't you set that as an aspiration, as an ambition in this plan? Well, you might not want to do it if it's not viable nor practicable, fine. So that's where we've introduced the proviso, or where we suggest a proviso is introduced. But as a series of aspirations, I mean, does one really have to beat oneself up too much about the idea of saying that we want you to connect to an existing or a planned heat energy network? I mean, really? I mean, what year are we in? Okay. Sorry, that's what I would say. Okay, thank you. Any other points on JPS3? No? Okay. Move on then to JPS4, which is resilience. <laughs> so, again, I'll ask the council if you've got any... You seem to suggest you may have something to say about this one earlier. So, yes, good to that's right, sir. It's so much after this, but this is the last one where I've got I've got a few things to get off my chest, if you like. After this, it's, it's um, one tiny bit of twiddling to policy five and nothing on six and seven. So just so you know, before people get themselves too excited or otherwise. So number four, resilience. Um, we've been through all of this. Uh, all the we, the team, if you like, places for everyone. Team have been through all of this, and we've asked ourselves the question. Do we really need to do all of this when um, when virtually every point is covered somewhere else in the plan? And we honestly don't think that there's a need for us to have this policy when, subject to three caveats, which I'm going to come to, um, there isn't a need to have this policy because it is, it is duplicating, duplicating what one finds explained more precisely elsewhere in the plan. Uh, the three caveats are uh, three things that don't neatly fit into that. So we're trying to find a way of saying, fine, we recognise there's duplication on this occasion. We really do think it isn't necessary to have the duplication. It isn't particularly helpful, to be honest. Um, but we did just then go with a fine tooth comb through the policy to ask ourselves, well, is that a correct thing to say about each and every one of these 13 points and there are three of them where we think that sensibly we would move three items to other parts of the plan. The three items are the first one to ensure that developments make appropriate provision for response and evacuation in the case of an emergency or disaster. I mean who on earth wouldn't want to do that anyway um, and we would suggest that the, the correct home for that would be policy JPP1 that, that be added to P1 um, if one is 
on a mission to basically get rid of this resilience policy because it's duplicated elsewhere, that would need to be picked up. Number three, locating critical infrastructure and vulnerable uses away from locations that are high risk of acute shocks. Again, one would have thought, surely, you know, that's a perfectly sensible thing to say in a plan like this. Um, and we would find a better home for it in policy JP D1, D1, um, to add it to that. And then finally, number 13, carefully controlling the location of hazardous installations and new development that could be adversely affected by them. Again, a statement that one would like to think is beyond quarrelling about um, would be in, but it isn't elsewhere in the plan, would be um, sensibly stated in the same policy I've just mentioned, D1. So 10 of them are pure duplication. Three of them um, statements of things that, frankly, I would be shocked if <laughs> these things weren't done, um, do need to be picked up somewhere else. And we've suggested number one in policy P1, numbers three and 13 in policy D1. Have I got the references right? Good. Um, so that's what we suggest. Uh, so that's our sort of, that's our root and branch approach to this. Okay, and that would presumably include the supporting text and everything? The it whole, would, whole yes, absolutely, yes. yes that's right. Okay. Um, so it renders a lot of my questions, I think, moot. So I think I'm just going to open that up, see if anyone's got any concerns about what's been proposed. Friends, carry to Moss. Not a concern. I think it's a sensible approach. Um, I'd just like to see some of this reflected, um, some of the policy aspects rather than the, the key measures um, as, uh, reflected, perhaps in JPS1 and JPS2, JPS2 doesn't mention the climate emergency or, or resilience anywhere, so um, I, I'm just thinking that maybe we, the idea of re resilience um, also needs to be reflected. I wouldn't like to see it lost. Okay, thank you. Um, but, but generally content with the not not concerned that anything would necessarily be lost, subject to these caveats and subject to those three items being put somewhere else. Yeah. Thank you, um, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, sir. Yeah, just a point of information. In the big document PFE, page ninety-two, policy JPS four. Um, I beg your pardon, it's page, four, page 42 of the document, Objective 10, Bullet 2, improve access to healthy food options for all communities. How would you propose to take that forward if um, JPS4 is being more or less shunted somewhere else? Sorry, thank you. I'll ask the council that. Any other comments? Uh, no, so a couple of points there for the council to, to address. Uh, well, in relation to the Friends of Carrington Moss, I mean, we... Well, you'll give us some guidance, sir, either in the note at the end of these sessions or in due course when you write your report, but... Um, I know that we've done the exercise, because I've seen it, of tracking through, tracing through each of these 13 items to see where else they're picked up in the plan. So we have a, a tracker, if you like. So if there is any confusion, if you like, as to where the 10 of the 13 items are picked up, we can easily provide that, because it already exists as a team document, if you like. Um, as for food growing. I'm told that there's something in policy G2 about that. I haven't checked the reference myself. Um, but I don't think S4 had anything about food in it anyway, did it? I don't think so. Um, G2. I don't know if it's G2. <laughs> Greener places. Page 147. Uh, JP G2. Page 149. No, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, yeah. G2. Food growing. Food growing, that's it. Okay. 
I haven't turned my mind to G2 yet, so, but it's in, there's a reference in G2 to it. So. I mean, I'll, I think I'll leave that there on that point. Obviously, yeah. when we... Oh, sorry, CPRE. Um. Yeah, I think um, reiterating what Friends of Carrington Moss said, so long as those um, policy are elsewhere and we understand where they've gone, so having a tracker available for us to understand the main modifications, but one of the... Um, in 5.24, it talks about Greater Manchester aims to be one of the most resilient places in the world. And I know there's been a lot of work at the local data partnership and different organisations like Greater Manchester, um, Low Carbon Hub, and I suppose a lot of work relating to climate change resilience and it is an important part of this spatial plan. So, so long as it doesn't get lost, so long as it is in there, that's the key thing. Thank you. Thank you. Anything to say on that? Particular no, no, sir. I mean, as I've yeah. said, if, if in your action point note or whenever, whatever, however you want to correctly describe it in due course, if you'd find a, a tracker, as I've called it, helpful, then please say and we'll provide it. Just give okay. me one moment, please, sir. Yeah. That's fine, sir. So we're, we, yeah. Okay. It yeah, um, would be useful for there to be a tracker, but I'll, I'll leave you to tell us we'll, whether you, we'll you agree. We'll cogitate on that, but also, obviously, when we get to the policies you just talked about, um, obviously, um, speaking of colleagues, but I'm, I think I'm doing D, so I remember that, we'll, we'll pick up um, yeah. the implications of what you just said for those policies when we get to them, I think, and so yes. the, the final action on this might be after we've contemplated those things. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Right then, um, we'll move on then to um, JPS Five Flood Risk and Water Environment. Princess, I'm just drowning in. Oh, no pun intended. No pun intended. Um, sorry. Um, hold on one second, sir, please. But the same principle, well, when, you, when you're ready, we'll start off with your any suggested changes you've got. Um, same from there. I need a moment or two, so I'm really sorry to hold you up. Say, I won't pretend I've found my piece of paper. I've stolen someone else's piece of paper. Well, there probably isn't theft because I intend to return it after the, after the event, so I have no intention to permanently deprive them of it. Um, so, in policy S5, um, you'll recall that we had um, suggested, we have suggested some changes to S5 anyway uh, prior to these sessions. So, in the modifications, we We had suggested, so this is prior to the hearing sessions, we'd suggested that in item one of S5, rather than the in line with um, the Northwest River Basin Management Plan, we would have with reference to. Um, and the only, so that, that's there, that, that thought is there. Um, but, and we've also, sorry, previously suggested and still suggest that item seven comes out of the policy because that's really entirely for someone completely different and isn't even sort of signaling what we ourselves might be doing in the future so um with all of that in mind the further thought we've had really is that um it seem it seems to us on reflection that a number of the items in policy s5 um in fact, all of those that relate to protecting the quantity and quality of water bodies, as opposed to the managing flood risk aspect. So if you look at the first two lines of the policy, 
So all of those that relate to quantity and quality of water bodies, rather than the managing flood risk aspects, all relate to or have reference to the North West River Basin Management Plan. So a small change to make more sense of this would be to have um, reference to um, reference to an integrated catchment based approach will be taken to protect the quantity and quality of water bodies with reference to the Northwest River Basin Management Plan and managing flood risk by, and then we have the items, there were eight, there are now seven, um, and we wouldn't any longer need the reference to the Northwest River Basin Management Plan in item number one because we would have popped it into the opening words of the policy. So this is a it's a tidying up, make better sense of the of the policy. Um, this might be teetering somewhere between soundness and a nicer plan, to be honest. But it's just trying to it's just trying to um, make that point clear. Uh, thank you. And the other change you've suggested is to, and this was in I think this was pre today, mm. uh, but it was pre today. It's in your schedule mm. as um, to modify the first paragraph. So it says through development management, an integrated catchment-based approach will be taken. Is that still? Um, pardon me? Yes, I know, but that's, that's... We, as I understand our position, our position is that we would revert to the published plan. This would be across the board, if you like, rather than simply through development management. Um, on reflection, we thought to ourselves that these as these aspects can't simply and solely be pinned, if you like, on development management. Um, so we would revert to the original, as it was <coughs> published, an integrated catchment-based approach, etc., etc., etc. Okay, that's okay. So your suggested modification, I I'm, if you like, to take that's no longer. Yeah, no longer the case. Yeah, yeah. So we've taken away and and moved something. We've moved one thing. We've moved the Northwest River Basin Management Plan into looks like its proper home, to be quite frank, rather than just picking out one of these several items as a place to specifically mention it. So why not mention it across the board where it's relevant? And we've reverted to the as published plan um, because, on reflection, these things are not only about what would expect people to do or look at doing when they bring forward planning applications? That's interesting because my one of my part of the, my first question was how does um, criterion one in particular, where you're talking about stuff being in line with yes. or with reference to the Northwest yeah. River Basin Management Plan, actually uh, operate through a DM approach? Because um, mm. I didn't know. So you're saying that's it's not the case. This is another. Um, is this a partly signalling, partly? It's uh, yes. It's it's all. It's one of those again. So yes, yes, it is. I mean, you can see very obviously that some are very, very obviously development management, aren't they? So if you have a sub sustainable drainage system, forgive me, <coughs> you're meant to do various things with it. Yes, I mean, I think um, criterion one actually is partly uh, the other way of looking at criterion mm. one in my mind is that it might be signal, but it also seems to be an outcome. So it's 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 the mm. is what will have happened after we've implemented this plan, we will have returned rivers to a more natural state is that is that fair so it's you could read it in that way it's not again it's not a require it's not you're not expecting anybody to do anything to get to that stage other than what they might other than what's in the rest of the policy but all of that amounts to returning rivers to a natural yeah. state including stuff the council will be doing stuff mm. environment agents will be doing no doubt and natural mm. england and all that. Yeah. Is that is that okay so so it's a signaling rather than a yes i think is the answer to that yes yes signaling rather than a doing <laughs> it's not the best or, it's the end, or it's where we want to get to as a result yeah. of doing the things and the policy it's a, it's a no it's a good if i might say sorry forgive me it's a good point and i think i'm right in saying that the similar sort of point is made in jpg3 um you might not want to it's just a just an observation really um JPG three somewhere. You know, criterion seven: return rivers to a more natural state where practicable, including through deep culverting and renationalisation. So it seems that some more practical 
elements of that in that policy. In that policy, yeah. yes. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, Which you might very well find when the development comes forward if they've got a culverted water course that they, you know, as one does in, this has been going on for decades now, hasn't it, deculverting, so. Quite. Yeah. Okay, so I didn't have any specific questions about criteria two to six. I'm not saying if anybody has, obviously more than welcome to make those points. Um, at the end, um, we, uh, we'll jump to criterion seven, which was securing further investment in wastewater treatment to reduce the frequency of intermittent discharge and storm sewage. Um, as part of your response to our questions, you've suggested deleting that, as you've already mentioned. Um, and to, to Indeed, sir. If nobody heard what you said, because it um, doesn't, it's not in the scope of the plan. It's not signalling. It's, it's, it's purely it's, for the utility companies. I think um, it really has strayed a bit too far. That's right, sir. So yes. Yep. Obviously, people. I have no particular points about that. But obviously, if anyone wants to defend it, as you say, then they can. Um, criterion eight. Oh um, no. Sorry, beg, beg your pardon. Oh. When you turn the page, <laughs> um, I just wanted to make sure, actually, through deletion of seven. Again, I'm, I'm very always very conscious of chucking the baby out of the bathwater and there's no unintended consequence of these sort of suggested deletions that there's nothing in there that might yeah you, know, you might have, that might be in turn to keep like if there's some kind of mitigation of impacts or needs resulting from development the developers would be expected to provide that investment you're content that you're not losing out on anything by no i mean know. absolutely we are content yes because the because if, if because with it you know as plan makers, we, we had understood what we were seeking to signal there, if you like, in item number seven, and um, it's it's just a step too far for the plan. Okay, thank you. So criterion eight um, refers to conserving water and maximising water efficiency in new development. Yeah. Uh, we've had a we had a few questions. Well, we had questions about this in relation to the optional standards. Um, national guidance states that where there is a clear local need. Local planning authorities can set out local plan policies requiring new dwellings to meet the tighter building regs, optional requirements of 110 litres per person per day. Uh, Criterion 8 doesn't set any target or make it clear, in my view, what is to be expected in terms of the optional standards. Yeah. Although I think you've put in some suggested modification that, um, again, to put this will be to paragraph 5.38, which states that all new homes have to meet the mandatory national standards set out by building regulations of 125 litres per person per day. And where there is a clear local need, the government's housing optional standards, um, et cetera, set out that local authorities may also consider tighter water efficiency requirements, and this will be determined through district local plan. So effectively, mm. the policy is, the, the policy says conserving water and maximising water efficiency, but actually, if you read the, what you suggest, the policy is mm. meet the 125 litres per day as a, as a mm. minimum, and for local plans mm. to set optional standards if evidence. That, that, is, that That's the, is that the policy, really? And not <laughs> what you've put in the Criterion 8? <laughs> it is the policy as read with the explanation or the supporting text, the clarification which one finds in, this, in, the, support, in the additions to mm. the supporting text. Because I, again, which begs the, support, the, the supporting text obviously yeah. would... would from our questions, obviously, there was no that support text mm. wasn't there. I think it's fair to say the support text does provide some clarification. Mm. But in terms of the policy, mm. I wonder whether, and it's an open question really, whether saying maximising water efficiency for the clear and clear and mm. you know, unambiguous nature of this for decision makers is that clearly there are already two numbers, if you like, for maximising. There's mm. 125 or there's 110, depending on where you are and what you're doing, and, and whether that is lacks a degree of clarity. Sure, now I understand the point. Um, so this is where the sort of multifaceted, you know, roles of the fact that places where everyone is doing all sorts of things, one of which is setting development management policies for now, if you like, and one of which is saying to local authorities, when you make your local plans, we want you to think about X, whatever X might be. On this occasion, it's water efficiency. And so... Um, and here, so one has item eight in the policy, one thinks to oneself, well, what's that mean? Here I am as a developer, what on earth am I supposed to do? And there I would say it's entirely just from a, for supporting text to explain what item eight means, because that's, in a way, one of the roles of supporting text is to clarify, to explain 
what it is that the policy means when it refers to a particular turn of phrase. So here, someone would read this with the supporting text that we've suggested and they would know that as things stand, they are to comply with the building regs. Um, but because this is a multifaceted aspect of this policy, we're saying to local plans, we expect you in uh, making your local plans to consider whether there is a basis for the more exacting water efficiency requirements, which you are allowed to uh, go to um, if you have a basis for doing so. So that's, 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 the, that's the cause of the issue, if you like, because this thing is not, this bit is not just saying to developers, here you are with your planning application. It's also saying to local planning authorities with a blank computer screen about to write their plan. This is what we want you to mm. do. You know. Indeed. So, again, going back to a point we made some time ago about sure. something else, is, is because Absolutely. my understanding, again, of the yeah. optional standards, they're optional. You know, no council is obliged to do it if you don't want to or, if, or indeed mm. you haven't got the evidence to support it. Mm. So, again, is this plan saying to local plans, and you might say you can't do that, but um, is this plan saying to local plans, if you have the evidence, you will do it. You know, we expect you to do it, um, i.e. adopt 110. Or is it saying, um, I, I, well, is it saying nothing? You know, if you want, you know, so again, basically leaving it entirely up to the council mm. to decide what they want to do. I think, there is, I think that is two different outcomes of the policy. A, I agree. A, as I say, a mandate to say, I do agree. this I agree. or not. Now, this one is, is uh, as I read the, the supporting text that we've put forward, you know, before the hearing sessions, the new supporting text added to 5.38. I mean, this is one of these um, where we're doing no more than asking local authorities, plan makers, to think about this issue as opposed to telling them that they, they must. So it's a flagging up the point for consideration rather than, you know, we're expecting you to do this, as I read the supporting text. May also consider the title of water efficiency requirements, etc., etc., will be which will be determined through district local plan. So, what is the will be determined? Well, the thing that will be determined is whether they do also want to consider the title of water efficiency okay. standards. Um, just out of curiosity, mm. really, and I, I just said there's no, but, but there are some of the optional standards that you decided to to mm. address through the uh, this mm. plan. Mm. I'm sort of curious as to why water efficiency wasn't one of them. Good question, to which I haven't got the foggiest idea of the answer is, and I don't know whether anyone to, to my left has. I think there are all sorts of things that we've taken up on ourselves to do, and there's a limit to what we can do, but is there anything particularly about why it is that, we've, why it is that we haven't done these tighter water efficiency requirements at this stage? It's, it's, uh, and one of the reasons I say this is because, say, it's an optional thing, but mm. you, I, in, I think it was your response to us, or maybe somebody else, mm. that there is a... There is a commitment from GMC, mm. I believe, with Environment Agency and United Utilities to, to commit mm. to 110. So it just sort of yeah, so why not didn't now, quite rather follow through. Than saying perhaps mm. later on. Um, you, you need to introduce yourself. I think this might be the first time you've sat in this. You've int introduced yourself first. Good afternoon, sir. It's Alex Madaya from GMCA. Um, Welcome. Thank you. I think it's, in terms of why we didn't consider it, I think it's some of the timings of the um, the strategies that were made. Um, for example, the memor Memorandum of Understanding was agreed on the 24th of September 2021. Um, and so it was a sort of a timing issue, I think, as well, and the evidence that was available. Um, I know some of the um, evidence that has been submitted to the to the uh, on the hearing of the, of the participant hearing statement relates to 2022 as well, um, so I think it's having that full, full depth of evidence to, to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you. That was a bit helpful. Okay. Okay. I have no other comments. I don't think about that policy. Any comments on this policy? Any any points we've been talking about? Any additional points not covered? Um, HBF? Uh, thank you very much, sir. Um, just in that last point on on item eight, um, <clears throat> I, I, think, I think it probably, the, the, the GMCA's expectations 
about water efficiency probably do need to be in that policy. Uh, but I think they need to say um, uh, local plan authorities may consider adopting uh, the optional standard for water efficiency to conserve water and maximise water efficiency in new development. I think that's probably the way to approach it. Um, I, I think that is a matter for for the for the nine local authorities to consider because it hasn't been something that the GMCA has been want, has wanted to run with uh, through the Places for Everyone plan. Uh, the the only other issue I wanted to raise was about greenfield runoff rates um, in item four, um, which which kind of encourages development to uh, not exceed greenfield runoff uh, runoff rates or alternative rates specified in district local plans. Um, I, I, we've argued, I, I've argued, that um, that I, I don't think they should be, GMCA should be specifying greenfield runoff, runoff rates, because I think that would be very challenging to achieve given the amount of the housing supply that's going to come from uh, uh, brownfield sites, and um, because I think many small developers' uh, schemes of uh, um, 10 or fewer dwellings, especially uh, where you are developing some quite tight places, uh, reuse perhaps of existing buildings, redevelopment of existing uh, um, buildings. I think it would be quite a challenge to achieve greenfield runoff rates uh, um, in all circumstances, which is how the policy could be interpreted. So we would rather see. Um, uh, the reference to greenfield runoff rates omitted. That is something that uh, local authorities, though, might specify uh, on particular sites, particular allocations as they produce their local plans. And it probably wouldn't be, it wouldn't be unreasonable to expect that on greenfield sites. But I think it could be a particular challenge for brownfield development. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, doesn't appear to be anything else. So, do you want to come back on that one point? Just look to my left to see whether there's a particular response that um, far away. Thank you. Um, I think in the criterion four, it does say unless demonstrably inappropriate. So I think um, that does give, if, if, if that is the case, um, there is that, that caveat in the policy for Greenfield runoff run rates. Okay, and I was just, thank you. I was looking at those words myself, and I, I suppose it's the law in me coming out as he, as, he, as he does sort of once a week for a few seconds, um, whether the unless demonstrably inappropriate is in the right place, um, frankly. So if, if, if the intention is, as I rather thought it might be, that um, the idea is that you ought to not exceed greenfield runoff rates unless demonstrably inappropriate, then we need to, we'd need to put that language somewhere else in the criterion. So now that I understand that was the intention, I think those words would need to be somewhere else in that item to make the point crystal clear. Um, because it's a fair enough point that's been made, if you like, and so we, yeah. Yeah. Because I must admit, at, the f at first reading, you, one might think the, the unless demonstrably inappropriate is, is referring to the previous clause as opposed to the subsequent clause. So we just need to okay. put it in a different place so it's clear. I'll bear that in mind. Um, did, did you want to say anything? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, right, it's taken us to half past three, so we've done well. Um, we're going to then have a little break until 10 to four, and then we'll come back and deal with the um, last two policies. So thank you very much. See you at 10 to four.
Okay, it's 10 to, so we'll carry on. Thank you, everyone. Um, moving on to JPS6, which is about clean air. Um, is there anything you wanted to say about this one? No, no? so there isn't, and uh, you know we're at an end of the further suggested changes. So for number six, it is as the published plan and the changes that we had suggested before the hearing sessions, which are you know have all been published. So no, nothing, nothing new on this one. Okay, uh, all right. So I'll carry on then. And as I said right at the start, I try and keep my uh, approach to the the order in which um, we ask the questions, which unhelpfully in this regard starts with criterion six, but um, that seemed to be quite the large nub of this policy about the clean air plan and and so on. So um, I think it's not a bad place to start. Um, criterion six of the policy refers to, as it as published refers to implementing the charging clean air zone within the plan area and. Um, as directed by government and associated measures, uh, the GMCA response to our, one of our preliminary questions, PQ79, proposed a number of modifications to the policy and reason justification, including deleting the reference to the clean air zone in criterion six and replacing it with reference to the clean air plan. And then obviously consequential changes to um, supporting text or, re or reason justification to reflect that. Um, so by way of a long preamble, our, quest, so our question relates to whether or not the current clean air plan resulting from this change approach could have any effect on the spatial strategy or scale of development proposed. So would it have any prejudicial impacts on what you're proposing in part of your strategy? And your council and the council response is that it wouldn't because modelling demonstrates that compliance will be achieved by 2026 at the latest. So it's compliance with the clean air required regulations and requirements and um, yeah. So... First question then, so when you, you say that you're happy or content that the um, changes to the clean air plan, changes or, or that's been going on in the background, if you like, won't have any effect on this plan and compliance will be achieved by 2026. Did all the revised clean air plan and or modelling take account of the development proposed in the PFE? Is it cognizant of this development, take, the scale of development taking place and location of development taking place? Yeah, it, it um, includes um, NTEM growth which is, is um, the, the majority of, of the development. That majority the, or all? Well, it, it doesn't have the allocation on uh, on top, but it is, is the, the existing land supply. So when you say clean air compliance, so, sorry, so, so the premise of this would be, obviously you've been told you've got to, the government have changed its position on uh, charging, as I understand it, you've, you've gone away and had to do something different. Um, so our concern was that whether or not doing something different would have any impact at all on the on the strategy or anything you're proposing. The answer to that was no, because you can still achieve compliance by 2026. But now, just to just confirm, you're now suggesting that, that all that work that talks about compliance by 2026 doesn't include the pl what's in this plan. Um, well, it, it in includes uh, the, a certain amount of the growth, that, and it's a sort of industry standard industry okay. forecasting. Um, but it, uh, the compliance by by 2026, and most of the growth won't have come forward at, at that point. So we, we still need to make meet that compliance. I suppose my, my point is how how can you be certain? I suppose that what you're the changes to what you're proposing aren't going to influence the plan. So somewhere along the line, you know, someone's going to come forward with these applications or part of the strategy, and you're going to see they can't. You know, can't happen because of the clean air issues or air quality issues. Um, sorry, Mia Crowell, the TFGM. The, the modelling approach uses NTEM, so that is a, a sort of standard approach to forecasting what growth will be across the whole of an area. So it's the same approach we've used in the, the transport modelling work. So effectively, that is a, a forecast for, for growth across GM. Now, in the transport work, we've then artificially added on top the allocation sites. But in reality, um, everything would be sort of constrained to this NTEM national trip end model forecast. So it it's comes back to that, the idea that our 
transport modelling is a bit more worst case because we, we kind of artificially added on top. So would you add a greater Manchester, well, remembering this is greater Manchester scale and this is nine of the ten authorities, so if we just think to ourselves what that individual is geographically, would you anticipate that where this plan makes particular strategic allocations to deal with its housing needs, its employment needs, um, that those would in any event have been captured by the nationally set growth factors for Greater Manchester in any event? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought. I think the first answer that you gave that was given was straightforwardly correct in the sense that it hasn't separately sort of gone to measure the allocations, but then the reading into that, that therefore the allocations are left out of account in relation to clean air is is the wrong assumption to make because the national trip end in Thames, national yeah, transport, trip end. national trip end modelling, what's the N10. S? Oh, it's N, there's no S, N Tim, yeah, I did know this once. Um, it, it has such a growth factor built into it that one would anticipate that the growth that's required to meet your housing needs, et cetera, et cetera, is, is in there anyway. So the, in terms of locational aspects, though, is there any diff, um, how does the locational aspects of the um, allocations come into that? Uh, so we fed in the locational aspects that were known at, in 2019. So that would have been the GMSF spatial pattern. Obviously, the pattern has changed a little bit since then, but actually it's probably come, become less um, impactful. Than that. Sorry, and this is in the, the modelling you've done since the change in approach? It plugged in the 2019? It would have been the same, yes. Yeah, so they've just used the same modelling? They've just used the same modelling, yeah. Just perhaps as briefly as possible, because um, the the phrase. Sorry, I just get the get the wording for how you want to change. Um, this so criterion six would become implementing the clean air plan and associated measures. Just again, <laughs> not sure whether this is a this is a, a signalling. Uh, or a development plan or both. I think the way it's worded, it could be any. This is one of those where it might not be immediately clear what it is because it does talk about implementing associated measures and they may, of course, be development related. So is there anything in the clean air plan that's coming through which would, if you like, uh, be related to planning policy or planning requirements that are going to be imposed on developers? developers? Or are they all out with the local plan? Um, I think the, there's uh, the planning requirements of, of new development that's set out in C7, policy PC7. So that would be a, a, a complementary okay. measure that would help achieve the, the air quality. Right. So, so again, this would be, if you like, so I'm gonna, we're going to have a little glossary of terms. A signposting to um, policy C7 then? Yes. Um, there are a number of other associated measures as well which are out with the, the plan system. So things like um, the, the current programme to, for bus reform and changing all our bus buses to electric buses, things like that. So there's a, there's a, a large number of other measures. It's not just... Okay. But when, when we come to C7, we can, we can assess what that means. And again, look back to this policy and see it all ties in together, hopefully. And if I was a developer or a decision maker looking at Criterion 6 as modified, I would Im implicitly know <laughs> that what I'm being asked to do would be in, in terms of this plan, looking at C7 uh, and, and nothing else. Well, I'm obviously conscious of it. There's nothing sort of someone's going to come, you know, an application's going to come in and you're going to say, well, Here's an, here's an associated measure that's in the clean air plan, which is not talked about anywhere but the clean air plan. You know, and that become, and becomes de facto planning policy. That doesn't seem to be the intention. So I think this comes back, it, it's, it's, I mean, I think we're going to 
come across this point many more times, aren't we? We've come across it several times already. So there's just a sort of overarching question, really, which your your report to us on, as to whether there needs to be clearer language in these policies to make it clear this, you know, this bit of this policy is development management, for example. This bit of this policy is local plans, for example. And some other bit of the policy is are other th are things that otherwise would be done by the by the nine authorities. You know, something clearer to make it, or something to make it crystal clear. Um, what is being directed towards? So this one here is in relation to development management. Would would on that basis would benefit from a cross reference to policy C seven. So in relation to development management, C policy C seven. You know, for example doing this completely off the top of my head, but that's that's the sort of approach. Okay. I mean, I mean the main thing was that it's, it's again it's nothing it's not going to suddenly uh, it's surprise somebody to. with it's the clean air plan is a de facto local plan document. It, it's not intended to, so and but I take the point about whether you know a, a reader who hadn't been sitting here listening to these assurances would know that, you know. <laughs> it's, Okay, that's enough on Criterion 6, I think. Um, going back to our other policies, which were a general overarching view as to whether or not um, S6 was justified, consistent and consistent with national policy and effective, uh, we picked out criterias, Criterion 2, 3, 4 and 5 for things we'd like to particularly um, ask about. Um, and again, it doesn't preclude anybody raising anything about any of the other criteria if they wish to. Um, but Criterion 2 uh, talked about talks as, as published about an expectation that development should be in accordance with the guidance published by the IAQM and or Environmental Protection UK um, in general terms. I don't, have you suggested a change to this? I don't think... Uh, Not to number two, sir, no. No. So again, we come back to the often discussed at local plan examinations whether it's appropriate for development to be in line with um, or in accordance with in this case documents which are not part of the development plan yeah I mean I think there's as I understand this item number two but if I get this wrong then someone correct me <laughs> to my left but as I understand that this this is this is meant to be giving guidance as to how we would expect a planning application to to do its homework, if you like. So it would do its homework. It would do its work on this subject by following the guidance in published by the published by the institute and the as referred to here, using the most recent guidance and so on and so forth. Whether that needs to be stated in a policy is is a moot point that we discussed earlier on in relation to one of the other policies, didn't we? As to whether what do you call it, validation requirements, I think was your point from earlier on. So that's that's my understanding as to what this is meant to be doing, as opposed to saying, oh, we're now going to use IAQM guidance, Institute okay. of Air Quality Management, as if it's a local plan. It does so say I determining think. planning applications. I know, I know it does, yeah. But if that, so you're saying that's not the intent, then? It's not. As I understand it, this is signalling that these... This guidance is guidance that we would anticipate planning application. You know, the report that deals with air quality should follow the guidance in. Um, so you'll find if you look at the guidance, I mean, I, you know, one does this every now and again in one's day job, but, you know, if you look at the guidance as advice about how you should go about explaining air quality impacts in your work to support a planning application, for example. So it's one of those, whether it needs to be in the policy or tell us in due course, but I take your point about the opening words, and yeah, I think the opening on reflection, the opening words could be clearer to convey what we're trying to achieve, if what we're trying to achieve is something that we should do in this policy in the first place, which you'll, you'll tell us about in due course. <coughs> okay, thank you. Under Criterion 3, yeah. there are two limbs, as I read it. Um, first, is that any development which might have an adverse impact should submit relevant <coughs> air pollution data. Yep. And the second limb, that if permitted, mm. should make appropriate provision for monitoring. Mm. I think, firstly, I suppose it actually might apply to Criterion 2 as well. 
is, although not what you've just said, but criterion two as well, about does the policy say anything about mitigation to address impacts? So essentially what you've got there is you've got two criteria mm. which are about providing information mm. and particularly where it might be <laughs> adverse impacts, but it doesn't say anything about mitigating those adverse impacts or indeed refusing plan permission. So the implication, I think it has been read that way. Yes. And obviously yes. I always think yes. if someone's read it that way, then um, the, the implication is that you can, as long as you can monitor it, you can have any yes. kind of adverse impacts. Yes, I mean there is there is a limit to if if someone reads something in one in a particular way, therefore something needs to change in the policy because there are some readings which are unreasonable. But but I think on this particular point, well, it's, if that had been the case, I wouldn't have asked the question. It's a fair enough point. It's a fair enough point um, in that it talks about um, the data that we want and monitoring of air pollution, but it doesn't. Does it do it somewhere else? I'm trying to work out. I'm trying to remember whether there's any other policy <coughs> that talks about. You know, minimising air quality impacts or whatever it might be. So, um, no, it's a fair point as you've made it. So, yeah, it seems to miss out the one bit that really counts, um, which is doing something in, to ensure that air quality is not exacerbated. You know, is not made worse or unduly made worse or whatever it might be. Yeah. Okay. Something for me to. No, it's a good point. Take a good okay. Okay. Good point. Um, the only other point about that um, is um, if approved mm. to make appropriate provision from future monitoring of air pollution, I suppose the point there is to what end, because, again, it's a sort of endless yes. requirement for developers to monitor the, the impact of their development to, to, to what outcome, what are you expecting to do? I mean, is it going to say to developers, well, if in five years' time something deteriorates and we can, we can somehow draw a straight line between that development and that impact we're going to make you do something how, how is that going to work so um the information would be sort of held and used to inform things like air quality management areas and whether or not we need to have a more focused look at those areas i don't know whether they would have a specific imp implication back for the developer no well obviously in, in the absence of any form of condition that on a planning permission that refer to monitoring and some action that would need to be taken if a certain position was reached you know in, in in the monitoring in the absence of any case specific condition then you know this policy re reference here wouldn't couldn't sort of introduce some well it's not stated i mean if there was to be some something that we were expecting developers to do then you you know sh should this monitoring show something bad then you would expect it to be in this policy but the policy isn't written in that way I, I was, as I read it, I thought well, this uh, reads to me as if it's a gathering information to put it to the greater public good, if you like, to have that information for wider purposes, as opposed to, I don't know, a stick to beat a particular developer with. And that could, in theory, be forever. Well, there comes a Yes. Yes, it could in theory be forever. I don't imagine it's meant to be forever. Um, but then if it's not forever, should it be five years? You know, should we state any of these things in here or should we not just leave this to planning applications? <coughs> but no, fair enough. No, f fair enough. OK. I'll take that on board. Um, criterion four, which talks about restricting and carefully regulating developments that would generate significant point Source pollution, you've suggested removing, I believe, removing the uh, phrase carefully regulating yes, on, on right. the basis that it's ultra or something. Is that what we said? I know. There's a bit of Latin in one of our hearing statements. <laughs> Good heavens, sort of mighty, what's going on there? Um, yes. Well, I, mean, I don't know about it being ultra virus. Well, it sounds it just, well, it's certainly not something that you would, do, you would be doing, is it? So. No. Well, I mean, the. the, 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 the um, the way of dealing with significant point source pollution, for example, from you know a particular type of industrial activity, is to restrict it in the first place. So that's 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 what this policy item is all about, which is the words restricting, um, carefully regulating. Seem to be a bit OTO is gratuitous. Hmm. You know what's it meant to be doing? Um, good question. So we've taken the words out. Nothing to say about that. Mm. 
Um, nothing else on that criterion for now. Uh, mm. Criterion five. Number five. Which I think. Yeah, so no, not uh, back to EV charging points. Unfortunately, we are back to EV charging points. So the question was. See above. Is, yeah. is um, significantly expanding the network of electric mm. vehicle charging points in regard to the changes of building yes. regs and SP2. Well, so. There's one. Or two, sorry to interrupt you. Please no, carry on. No, so I no, think no, the point fault. was how, how does this sit into the discussion yeah. we've already had today about JPS2, building regs, and so on? That is, yes, very good question. And I, I must admit, I, my first blush response to this was, wait a minute, this is just surely meant to be exactly as we discussed earlier on, to which the answer is no, not, it's not quite as simple as that, because this is one of these um, policies which is a comprehensive range of measures, you know, across the piece. And in this particular point about electric vehicle charging points, my understanding is it's not meant to be adding anything for individual development applications for houses, for example, compared to our discussion earlier on. So it's not meant to be adding anything to what we previously discussed for new homes, for example, but um, a way of significantly expanding the network of electric vehicle charging points is that we do actually have applications for rapid charging hubs, which are nothing to do with people building homes. Um, for example, you get quite a few old garages, which are petrol stations, which have been converted to rapid charging hubs and um, much of the work that's required to do such a thing requires planning permission. Um, so there's a way of significantly expanding the network of electric vehicle charging points that's got nothing to do with someone building a house with a parking space or whatever it might be. So that's what this is meant to cover. Um, so it's one of those broader things which isn't just trouble with these examinations for understandable reasons is we keep talking about how homes all the time for perfectly understandable reasons sometimes we talk about commercial development <coughs> but we never forget we never you know we have to remind ourselves that there's other stuff going on in greater manchester apart from building homes and businesses yeah well yes quite so i get i suppose to yes this is sort of the to facilitating mind. if you get applications yes. coming you're supporting that kind Absolutely, of approach yeah. and facilitating it where you can yeah, I, mean, I suppose yeah, I'll, like, I'll have to think like. about whether or not mm. would it, well unless it's, unless it's in there somewhere in the quite lengthy <laughs> supporting text mm. um, that just makes that clear to people so there's no chance of anyone misunderstanding it but I suppose the other point is mm. if I was being I was been trying to be helpful I suppose um, I guess the it talks about significantly mm. expanding the network well mm. taking your point anyway that's that's fine but even, but actually building regulations would still be significantly expanding would, anyway yeah, so yeah, yeah. um it would i suppose it's just uh we keep coming around to this point about what is it, what is it doing so um okay yeah. i've got that's fine i understand that point there is a broader utility to the point than just new homes or yes or indeed businesses okay okay um that covers my questions on uh, JPS six. Um, uh, I'll open it up now to the to the room. Uh, starting with Manchester Friends of the Earth. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, and people will be pleased to, to know I'm not going to rehearse the arguments for or against the charging clean air zone. Um, but I will start off by pointing that government hasn't yet changed its mind on a charging clean air zone. We are waiting to see whether they accept the revised clean air plan from Great Manchester. Thank, um, thank you for <laughs> correcting me. <laughs> well, we wait with bated breath. Anyway, um, I have found it hard to keep up with the modified modifications, so apologies if I right. raise a point that's already been dealt with. Um, so looking at para 5.44, where it talk, on page 97, where it talks about the WHO guidance, that was the old guidance um, from 2005, and in September 2021, the World Health Organization drastically reduced its suggested guidance on PM 2.5s and PM um, and NO2. So it would be good if that could be reflected in the text if it isn't already, because um, basically it will make getting to that guidance as specified under the Breathe Life City Region pledge much tougher and it hasn't been modelled for the current clean air plan, to my understanding. <laughs> On page 98, uh, I think you've dealt with this, uh, 5.48, but I'm assuming that text has also been gone because it refers to a charging clean air zone or at least been modified, but I haven't seen that, so I'm just flagging it. Um, 
you already raised my concern on point three, which was very much kind of like, well, you can almost do whatever you like as long as you just monitor it. Um, this point is very much weaker than the Great London Policy SI1, for example, that requires all major developments to be air quality neutral. It requires for all developments to avoid making a further deterioration in existing air quality levels and avoid creating any, any new areas that exceed air quality limits. And we would really recommend that that text or that you know, the element of that be added. Um, and also some discussion about cumulative impacts. What happens a lot with planning applications is it's just seen in itself and there's no, there's no assessment of what do they all do if we add them all together. Um, so we just assess each application on its own and don't do the cumulative impact assessment. Uh, I think you've dealt with um, criterion six, that's been changed. Um, and on criteria nine, um, I understand the concern regarding schools and young children early years because that's one of the really bad developments or impacts of, of, of toxic air. But why does it not refer to all vulnerable populations or communities? You know, yes, by all, you know, we really, really want to protect young people early years, but what about everyone that's impacted? And here I'm thinking, what about hospitals that deal with respiratory patients? You know, they're, they're very much at risk. So I, I applaud the, the, the focus on young children in schools, but what about everyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Renzi Caritamos? Yeah, just building on a couple of those points, um, you mentioned that the new clean air plan will have no effect on the spatial strategy or the, the scale of development proposed. I'm quite surprised about that, given the challenging targets that are proposed in the Government's Environment Act. And we know the plan is with them for approval. I'm quite surprised at the idea that this won't come back with more challenging um, suggestions, proposals. Um, and just going to um, the lady from Transport for Greater Manchester mentioning the uh, allocations, the Transport Strategic Modelling Technical Note, which is document 090104, <coughs> confirms that by 2040, the P for E allocations increase average delays by 6%, causing additional congestion and pollution, um, and that the allocations generate longer distance car trips than average Greater Manchester trips due to their location, which obviously will cause higher um, pollution uh, and um, CO2 emissions as well, actually. Uh, just going back to our discussion earlier. Um, just uh, one little point to, to just mention there. We will pick up on noise pollution, I expect, um, in the discussion about, um, I think it's C4, which is streets. Uh, but there's no um, policy for light pollution. Um, and as we know, uh, particularly HGVs create... Uh, a lot of additional air noise and light pollution, especially when they run through the night um, in concentrated areas. Uh, and criterion seven of the policy mentions facilitation of more sustainable distribution of goods within the urban area. The air pollution caused by HGVs is much wider than just the urban areas uh, and will be exacerbated by the proposed allocations. Um, so, uh, just making that point, and this policy um, doesn't propose at the moment significant and swift modal change for freight traffic, and I know there is the policy again in which, which C it is, but one of the Cs is it C6. Um, but what this, um, what the GM transport strategy does mention is that there will be an additional 600,000 trips on the GM transport network every day by 2035. So I do think that's going to bring significant levels of additional air pollution. And the, um, just two more points, sorry, the integrated assessment confirmed that no weighting was put on the different objectives, the different 
SEA objectives. So in terms of the health impact of growth, particularly in relation to those huge increases in air noise and light pollution, at the moment there's insufficient data to understand how um, GM has assessed whether the huge level of growth set out in the plan will result in a higher number of deaths, including child deaths, from air pollution particularly. Um, and, you know, obviously we don't believe any avoidable death is acceptable. And one final point, Criterion 10 um, talks about promoting actions to help remove pollutants from the air. It's my understanding that mosses absorb and naturally filter pollutants from the air very effectively. Uh, so those natural solutions um, are very important. And sorry, one thing I'd almost forgotten, but it's something we've mentioned before, um, the KPIs that relate to this. We're going to come back to it on uh, and, and throughout the policies that we've discussed today. Um, I think the KPIs are very... Um, there's not that many of them, so uh, we can come back to that. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Some of that did, did um, slightly get into areas of the underlying strategy um, and impacts rather than the wording of the policy, but um, okay, uh, it's, all, it's all fairly relevant stuff. So um, any other comments around the table about this one before I pass it back to the GMCA? Thank you. Uh, so I think the points, where are we? Um, right, so Friends of the Earth, Manchester Friends of the Earth, uh, paragraph 5.44. Uh, yeah, we're just, I, I don't doubt what's been said. Um, we're just double check, but obviously if the, if the paragraph, and I assume it does need to be updated to refer to the most recent World Health Organization uh, reference, and that, that would obviously need to be done. Um, the difficulty with these things is that you know everything changes over time as you're making these plans. So yes, we have to make sure the paragraph is up to date. Uh, five point forty-eight. The question, the assumption was that five point forty-eight has been modified to um, refer to the clean air plan or rather than the clean air zone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes, in the modifications we published before the hearing sessions, we have proposed to change 5.48 so it fits with what we want to do to the policy itself as you'll know sir moving on to uh, S6.3 the gentleman from Manchester Friends of the Earth was sort of um, re-emphasising that yes the policy item does need to say something about um, point three does need to say something about actually um, ensuring that developments don't cause you know undue impacts on air quality whatever phraseology one might use and so you know we, we acknowledge that point friends of Carrington Moss expressed concern or doubt or skepticism as to whether the clean air plan really wouldn't have any effect of, of significance if you like on the strategy and the plan we've had our explanation and response to that and if I asked for it to be repeated I would just ask for it to be repeated so You've had our explanation in relation to that. Um, noise, obviously we're talking about air here rather than noise, so we'll come to noise doubtless on some other day. Item 7, it said of the policy, this is a new point, item 7 of the policy uh, which refers to facilitating the more sustainable distribution of goods within the urban area. It was said by friends of the Carrington Moss, well, facilitating the more sustainable distribution of goods isn't just a matter for within the urban area. I mean, I, looking at the wider wording of, of item seven it seems to be particularly singling out urban things urban consolidation centers and urban distribution centers i'll just look to my left to see whether we're intentionally focusing on only the urban areas there or, or you know what's the underlying logic or would it be better said as facilitating the more sustainable distribution of goods you know not picking out the words within the urban area i mean i don't know what do you think uh, yeah that's a possibility um i mean i think the the focus of the policy is just on the sort of efficiencies that you get in sustainable distribution in mm. urban areas as opposed to rural areas, but there's no reason why you couldn't have mini distribution centres in villages. I don't know how, how mm. viable they would be to no. operate, but... Well, we'll leave uh, that one to you, sir, as to whether, as to whether 
in order to make the plan sound, one should remove the words within the urban era. I don't think we are on, on, on a point of soundness, to be frank, but, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see what you, you tell us about that. Health impacts not properly dealt with in the integrated assessment. We've discussed the integrated assessment, not going to go back to that. Criterion number 10 and the importance of MOSS. We know what that's all about, and we'll be looking at allocations later on in the in the hearing sessions. KPRs need to be tightened. KPIs need to be tightened up. I've already acknowledged the point that we need to have a session on the monitoring of the plan, and that we need, we, as you know, we've we've we have said that we will uh, put work in to um, to have more precise monitoring um, criteria in in the relevant chapter. Okay, thank you. And we, we need to come back on when we're going to discuss all that. But um, is friends of the earth a new point? They're not new points, but uh, points well, that weren't dealt with. Okay. Yes, sir. So I raised the question about point nine, criteria nine, why I only focused on schools okay, in the early yes. years. Good, good point. And, and also I raised the point about cumulative impacts under point three, which wasn't thank you. dealt with. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, cumulative impacts, I, I think we... Um, in relation to cumulative impacts, if every time these policies talked about planning applications, for example, it, it you know had to write in and cumulative impacts. I mean, obviously, as you'll know, sir, in, in any case involve, involving an environmental impact assessment, there's an obligation to look at cumulative impacts. So I don't think it needs to be written into the policy. Uh, my apologies about item nine. I've written it on my sheet of paper. It's entirely my fault. Sorry, I won't make excuses, but um, you know. It's been, it seems like it's been a long day, so I do apologise to you. Item 9, I should have asked for a response to, and that's entirely my fault that I didn't. So item 9, which talks particularly about schools and early year sites, the Speaker for Manchester Friends of the Earth supported that, but, but also uh, wondered why we hadn't gone wider to, to incorporate in item 9 other sensitive locations such as hospitals dealing with respiratory diseases, etc. So any comment on that? Is there any particular reason why we've singled out schools and early year sites um, or would there be any particular problem if the inspector thought it was necessary to make the plan sound to broaden this to include other? I think it'd be fine to broaden it and use schools in early years as an example. Yeah. They're meant as examples, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. And, um, yes, I apologise for not picking that point up. Um... Okay, no other points on six? Thank you. We'll move on to seven then. Uh, resource efficiency. Uh, yep, nothing to say about this one, sir, by way of additional, any additional further thoughts, changes. So number seven is, is, is a combination of um, the plan as published with the changes that we published before the hearing sessions um, in response to the preliminary questions and so on and so forth. Okay, so so seven seeks um, to create a circular economy and a zero waste economy, um, and that will play a key role in meeting Greater Manchester's ambition to become a leading green re green city region by 2038. And as is the norm, it then sets out the measures that it considers necessary to achieve that aim. Um, one thing um, I think we asked about was, you know, there's a reference in um, the supporting text to the waste plan and also the minerals plan, but the waste, you know, these, these two plans are referred to. Um, maybe, I'm not sure we quite got the answer, but you made it clear in your statement that the waste planning will continue to be undertaken by the waste plan 2012, and presumably the minerals will be by the minerals plan 2012 um, or 2013. Um, so my basic point is, does this policy duplicate or interfere or prejudice any aspect of the waste plan? Is there any con inconsistency between the plans that you're aware of? I think not with the changes that we've proposed, but um, is that right? Yeah. Not, okay. with the chain, not with the not taking on board the changes that we've proposed. So that's, take, that's deleting criterion two? Yeah. Okay, and that actually is picked up, I think, in somewhere else, isn't it, in the plan? Anyway, that's the point, isn't it? It's um, picked mm. up under yeah. P1. Yeah. Okay. Um, but also getting the strategy's name right in the first item is another. Yes, that's, yeah, well, well, 
not a bad start. Pro probably an AM, but we'll uh, accept that. Um, the my reading is probably is that the PFE is only meant to deal with the waste implications of non-waste related development. Is that is that the way of looking at it? Perhaps that, so. When you're talking about anything to do with, it, it's not necessarily waste proposals. It's just the byproducts of, of if you like the things which are covered by this plan that might have waste. So that's when you're talking about things like, um, well, actually two was where the example came in, I suppose, but um, I suppose inc incorporating things to reduce and recycle waste and minimize water use and all those sort of things, they're, they're just general, uh, it's not purely to do with if you were talking about incinerators or mm -hmm. tips or anything like that. No, although any I development. Sure, though item three obviously does talk about protecting existing infrastructure mm. which manages waste, so that does step outside saying to someone where are you going to put your recycling facilities or whatever, yes, so, yeah. Is that a problem? Not as far as I'm concerned, no, sir. <laughs> Not at 4.31 it isn't. Okay. <laughs> um, guess criterion one is again i'm going to say again sorry to repeat myself but this is an example that this is again seems to be a statement of intent of the councils or gmca are going to do it's another signaling role is that fair is nothing again nothing that you're expecting anyone to do no i think that's a fair point sir and uh, and I, I i wouldn't criticize you for one moment for raising these points as they come up in so many policies and and yeah, I mean, I just repeat what I've said earlier on. Yeah, so I think we just, as long as, as no, point, they say we can take the point and point we, do, we need to decide what to do with them, but I just, we need to, I need to make sure for my own peace of mind, what, it, what yeah, I'm not missing something, so. Yeah, you need to, it's a thankless task, but yes, you or we or somehow between us, we need to pick all of these up. And then obviously we await, as I say, mm. that, that fork in the road is, are you going to say to us in due course, you don't need to do, in order to make the plan sound, you shouldn't be doing any of this signaling, take it all out. Or, no, you don't need to go that far, but we do think you need to clarify which bits of which policies are development management plan making and, and signalling. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I favour the latter myself, but obviously you would, you'll tell us in due course. So, oh, uh, so yes, criterion two, is being proposed to be deleted because it's picked up elsewhere. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've already, we've already mentioned, I'm, I'm going through my uh, criterion three, refers to protection of existing mm. is that And my question was, does that form part of the role of this plan to do that? Question mark, which you've answered. Well, yes, in the sense that we, we wish as part of the, what are the opening, things that will help to achieve this include recognising the role of existing infrastructure in managing our waste and protecting them, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure we've got enough waste management capacity. So that's a role or a, a point that this plan has taken to itself in order to achieve this wider okay. strategic ambition that's set out. So it's not out of scope? It's not. No, it's, it seems to be consciously in scope, if you like, yeah. And criteria for, um, I suppose... Again, it's what is in this criterion that isn't addressed to other policies, but again, picking up the point that sometimes it's obviously been suggesting if it's duplicated, mm. you might take it out, and then mm. other cases where it doesn't really I know. matter. I know. Is that one for me to, for us to think about? Yes. Because I do think that form of words may well be picked up elsewhere. Mm. I can't quite remember where at the moment, but I've seen it somewhere else. It's surprising if it's not somewhere else. Yes, I think it's a, there's a presumption in favour of it being somewhere else in the plan, so yes. Okay. So, nothing, okay. And uh, I think you've suggested a correction to a footnote um, somewhere Ooh, on the line, footnote. which I... Oh, yes. Can't, rem can't even, can't put my oh, it says, finger on it's it. Delete, it's in 59, delete, delete GM waste, wasted PD. <laughs> I thought it said. I thought it said delete get wasted for a moment, but uh, <laughs> and it's to insert reference to some other link that takes you to some. I suspect that's document. going to be an additional mod rather than a main mod. Exactly. Yes. So sorry, that was. Uh, um, I've got nothing else on that one. I think it's nothing else from us. Then. Questionable. Thank you so much. There's some, <laughs> it's a funny one because she says signalling bit, 
one you're deleting for duplication and two other bits which are either duplicated or I know. outside the scope I know, of the plan. Sir. So something for me to take away. I've run about. out of things to say, sir. Thank you. <laughs> uh, steady state, Manchester. Then. Any comments on this policy? Uh, yes, I must admit I, I read um, Criterion 3 rather differently from the interpretation that Mr. Katkowski um, just gave us. Um, and really, uh, as a sort of broader... Um, broader uh, understanding of the role of existing infrastructure, meaning, for example, buildings. So if you don't knock down buildings that are perfectly good, um, then you're reducing the amount of waste. You know? And in terms of the aspiration for circular economy, that would seem to be a non-problematic thing to include. So I'm really just asking for clarification. Um, does it have that wider definition, this, this criterion, um, which would be eminently sensible, uh, to, to add to the rest of what is a, you know, a sound policy basis. Thank you. Um, any other comment? Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Friends of Carrot Moss. Just a very quick one. At the beginning of this section, there's a paragraph on minerals, 5.52. Um, and just a quick question. Would it be worth having a policy for minerals, given that it keeps coming back in uh, various other policies? So just a... Just a question there. I suppose the general point there is what's the, what is the point of that paragraph when it doesn't seem that resource efficiency policy refers to it in any way, um, unless I'm missing something. Um, so it sort of sticks on its own. Um, we did have a discussion oh, yes, we had a whole someday last week about minerals. Yes, um, whenever it and was. we have to come back on that. It was the last uh, session of a week, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, yes, yes, I think. It was only, only Thursday, was that? Only Friday? Friday. Uh, Tuesday. Was it Tuesday? It was the first session of the either week, way. not the last session of the week. Are we just nodding at all of Yeah, either way. Either way, we've talked about minerals, so we have to, um, we've got to obviously think about so, yeah, I need that. My, I need my medication. I suppose um, there's a point, but what, yeah. what's, what's that there for? Um, as well it's as there, the it's, right, it's nothing to do with waste because there's a separate heading waste that's in the published plan mm. at the top of page 101 which introduces resource efficiency so minerals is really just finding a place in this plan to say this plan isn't isn't revamping the minerals plan so again it's one of those statements of the obvious in the sense that you turn these pages and you find that this plan isn't redoing the minerals plan so we needed to find a home for it and we found this home for it but I don't think it's a soundness point, to be honest, mm, but okay. there you are. Um, that's that one. And the gentleman asked for clarification about, because he'd read S7, item 3, as having this wider uh, reading, that is to say, to recognise the role of existing buildings. And in, if you knock existing buildings down, that can be wasteful, etc., etc. You know, we, we all know the debate that's going on at the moment about this. My understanding is... And if I get this wrong, I'll be corrected to my left. But my understanding is that item three is not meant to convey that wider reading. It's not meant to convey that wider reading. Whether it should or not, obviously, is another matter, but it's not intended to. Okay, thank you. I guess we're going to hear whether it should or not now. Uh, no, I... Oh, uh, is the point. If it doesn't include it, is that included elsewhere in the plan? Have I missed that somewhere? That wider... Um, the question of not knocking down buildings that, that really, you know, are, are serving a perfectly uh, good purpose and uh, to knock them down would generate um, emissions, waste, etc. We have already seen references to um, reusing existing buildings and other we've even seen them today, I think, earlier on today, didn't we? In S1, in policy S1. Uh, Preference, do you remember the controversial preference to given to PD up previous development and and vacant buildings to meet development needs? So, and in where? S2. S2, criterion one, promoting the retrofitting of existing buildings, etc. Um, so, we've touched on the subject in other policies. I suspect there are other references as well, but no, there isn't a separate policy that deals head on with the point that's been made. No. Okay, thank you. That, that's helpful. I'll, I'll check, check what, what else is written elsewhere. Thank you. Did we pick everything? Was it? Was there some another point? No. 
Okay, I have no other comments. Any other comments on set of seven? There's a couple of people who have sat patiently all day and not uh, spoken. So I want to give them the opportunity to do so before we uh, depart. I don't want to sit there and think, oh, I really wish I'd said what I needed to say. A couple on both sides of the room, no? You had every opportunity, okay. All right, okay, I'm gonna bring uh, this session on um, this to an end. I believe you, GMC wanted to raise something with us more Well, generally. I did just want to ask for some guidance because t I mean, today is the, the worst by a considerable margin example of, of, of us saying to you, we've had some second and third thoughts and it just so happens to be one of those days where we had a run of policies where we'd had second and third thoughts. Um, after today, I'm, I'm assured that, you know, any other changes are not of the same sort of order of magnitude as the ones we've been running through today. But I did want to just seek some guidance. Obviously, can we just start with this week because we've got tomorrow and Thursday. I don't think we're sitting on Friday from memory, are we? Or, anyway, we've got tomorrow and not Thursday. Yet. <laughs> not yet. No, well, there you are. Um, so um, we can, if it would help, and I suspect it would, we can publish a schedule of our second and third thoughts such as they are on the policies that we're going to be discussing tomorrow and the policies we're going to be discussing on Thursday, we can do, we can publish that. I don't know what I mean by that. Send it to your program officer um, to do what she decides is the right thing to do with it later on this evening. So before we leave here, um, I just need to double check the schedule to make sure it makes sense. So once I've double checked the schedule, it can be it can be sent to your program officer. In other words, later on this evening. So when people switch their machine, or when she switches her machine on tomorrow morning, it would be there. If you'd find that helpful. Or I can do what I did today. It's up to you. That's the first point. But let's stop there and get your guidance on that, perhaps. Yeah, this I, week. I, th I think for this week, um, if, if if Thursdays can come earlier than uh, that you're suggesting, yeah. tomorrow's will come. So i.e. if we get Thursdays published by... No, no, it's, this evening was for both tomorrow and uh, Thursday. Both tomorrow and Thursday. Yeah. Then that that's that's fine. I mean, it's just what... What, where we are at the yeah. at the moment, so yeah. uh, it will be. Uh, I mean, what we'll probably do is ask the program officer to publish it on the website. Sure. So, even if people haven't got a paper copy in front of them, then at least they're able to refer to, to mm. what you're referring to in uh, in a in a visual yeah. sense. So, and it won't be as far reaching as what we've been doing today, as I understand. I just need to double check. Okay, thank you. Um, that's that. And then for future weeks, because mm. that's just to get us through this week, for future weeks, I'm imagining that to the extent, and I've got no idea at all, literally, whether there will be other days like this, um, but um, let's hope the fewer the better, but there you are. Um, I'm assuming that you would want, say, say, for the next sitting week, we've got a week when we're not sitting next week, mm. and then after that we're back. So if there are any for the week before Christmas week, whatever it is, week four, is it, of these sessions? Um, I'm assuming you would want them published somewhere along the line the week before the week when we'd be discussing them. If if that's possible, I mean, we realise sometimes that the, it, it might be a bit challenging, but, you know, yeah. we, we did discuss this last week, I think, and, and requested where possible to have, sure. have them published. Um, yes, the week before, if possible, uh, and if not, then ideally no later than midday. On the Monday. On the on the Monday, or the if if really desperate, on the day before the midday, on the day before a session. I see. If something comes up at the last minute, so at least then we can we can ask the program officers to, to get them published, so that again people yeah. have them in front of them to be able to okay. to, to to take well as you're going through them then then sure. then we can follow that. Well. Um, I you know, so if you can stick to that as much as possible, then yep. then that would be good for well, all I'm of going, us. Sorry, I'm really sorry, ma'am. It's, it's right. entirely my I realise fault. It's, I'm so sorry. It's been a long day. My apologies. Um, well, I'm going to set an aspiration that we will publish them no later than the Friday of the week before, but as our long stop, it would be midday of the Monday, but for the whole week, not, not in drips and drabs. That's my aspiration anyway. But there are behind the scenes, I see a Toblerone's gone up, but behind the scenes... There is a hell of a lot of work that's in, involved in all of this, so it's yeah. very easy to sort of say you should do this, that, and the other, and something else. But that's, yeah. we're doing our best. Okay, thanks. Uh, and I, I just want to make clear that these are our suggestions that you are making yes. uh, at this stage, Absolutely. and not what what uh, we as as Absolutely. inspectors have requested. So, with that in mind, these 
suggested modification from you shouldn't go into uh, the proposed main modification schedule un unless we agree that's necessary sure. or, and that comes out either through action points we've we discussed or or through any discussions or any that's instructions helpful. that we give you so I just no, wanted indeed, to make that clear that's no, so a very that helpful point very helpful point ma'am clear on that uh, yeah. Turley, sorry, you wanted to say something? Yeah, can I just make three really quick points? I hope it's not inappropriate to just do, do so now. The first is in relation to um, the amendments. Uh, today has been a demonstration of the authorities taking a flexible approach. And, and from our point of view, that's very, very welcome. It creates a lot of work. It really does. And I don't think we underestimate, any of us underestimate how much work is being done on the other side of the room. Um, I've been in my learner friend's position running in multi-authority local plans. I haven't had nine clients, uh, so <laughs> I take my hat off to that. Um, but there's been a lot today that's been extremely constructive, and I don't know whether members of the public or third parties can see that, but the reference, for example, to viability, absolutely fundamental to this plan landing correctly and delivering. And I know reference was made to a threshold from London, but let's remember um, prices in London are up to £3,000 a square foot. In Oldham, um, they're below £200 a square foot. There, there are huge differences. And my only point to make is that type of flexibility, which may not have always um, been appreciated in the plan making process, is really welcome. And it's been a difficult day for the authority. We can see that. But um, we're very supportive of those changes, if I may say so. Thank you. Yeah, as long as uh, as others around the table obviously get get chance to look at this and, and it gets fully explained dur during the process. Because you may, again, what you may not have time to do in, in this list or whatever you provide us with, uh, a chance to set out clearly why you're making those suggestions and you may need further discussion. Oh, yeah. oh I th yes, abs forgive me. <coughs> Absolutely, ma'am. No, no, the top and bottom what we're going to be able to do in the timescales, pardon me, that I've set as an aspiration and that you've advised us about, is set out any further thought changes. We're not going to be able to set out a great spiel about why we're doing this. That will have to come when I do my little piece at the beginning of each session where relevant. But it's just so that people can see you know, where we want to change, where we think it would be a good idea to change the policies. And may help cut down the time a little bit that exactly. you need to spend on doing that, because exactly. at least people will be able to, exactly. to see that. OK, thank you. OK, so, OK, so thank you, everyone, for that. Um, we'll now adjourn till 9.30 tomorrow morning, where we're talking about all matters employment land. So thank you very much. <laughs>